A Gala Dress by Mary E. Wilkins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Bush, May 2009. A Gala Dress by Mary E. Wilkins. I don't care anything about going to that Fourth of July picnic, Lisbeth. I wouldn't say anything more about it if I was you, Emily. I'd get ready and go. I don't really feel able to go, Lisbeth. I'd like to know why you ain't able. It seems to me as if the firecrackers and the tootin' on those horns would drive me crazy. And Matilda Jennings says they're going to have a cannon down there and fire it off every half hour. I don't feel as if I could stand it. You know my nerves ain't very strong, Lisbeth. Elizabeth Babcock uplifted her long, delicate nose with its transparent nostrils and sniffed. Apparently her sister's perverseness had an unacceptable odor to her. I wouldn't talk so if I was you, Emily. Of course you're going. It's your turn to, and you know it. I went to meetin' last Sabbath. You just put on that dress and go. Emily eyed her sister. She tried not to look pleased. I know you went to meetin' last, said she, hesitatingly. But a Fourth of July picnic is a little more of a, a rarity. She fairly jumped. Her sister confronted her with such a sudden vigor. Rarity. Well, I hope a Fourth of July picnic ain't quite such a treat to me that I'd rather go to it than meetin'. I should think you'd be ashamed of yourself, speaking so, Emily Babcock. Emily, a moment before, delicately alert and nervous like her sister, shrank limply in her limp black muslin. I didn't think how it sounded, Lisbeth. Well, I should say you'd better think. It don't sound very becoming for a woman of your age and profession what you do. Now you'd better go and get out that dress, and rip the velvet off, and sew the lace on. There won't be any too much time. They'll start early in the morning. I'll stir up a cake for you to carry when I get tea. Don't you suppose I could get along without a cake? Emily ventured tremulously. Well, I shouldn't think you'd want to go and be beholden to other folks for your eatin'. I shouldn't. I shouldn't want anything to eat. I guess if you go, you're going like other folks. I ain't going to have Matilda Jennings peekin' and pryin' and tellin' things, if I know it. You'd better get out that dress. Well, said Emily, with a long sigh of remorseful satisfaction. She arose, showing a height that would have approached the majestic had it not been so wavering. The sisters were about the same height, but Elizabeth usually impressed people as being the taller. She carried herself with so much decision that she seemed to keep every inch of her stature firm and taut, old woman although she was. "'Let's see that dress a minute,' she said when Emily returned. She wiped her spectacles, set them firmly, and began examining the hem of the dress, holding it close to her eyes. "'You're getting of it all tagged out.' she declared presently. I thought you was. I thought I see some ravelins hanging the other day when I had it on. It's just because you don't stand up straight. It ain't any longer for you than it is for me, if you didn't go all bent over so. There ain't any need of it. Emily oscillated warily over her sister in the dress. I ain't very strong in my back, and you know I've got a weakness in my stomach that— "'Henders me from standing up as straight as you do,' she rejoined, rallying herself for a feeble defense. "'You can stand up just as well as I can if you're a mind to.' "'I'll rip that velvet off now if you'll let me have the dress, Lisbeth.' Elizabeth passed over the dress, handing it gingerly. "'Mind you don't cut it ripping of it off,' said she. Emily sat down, and the dress lay in shiny black billows over her lap. The dress was black silk, and had been in its day very soft and heavy. Even now there was considerable wear left in it. The waist and overskirt were trimmed with black velvet ribbon. Emily ripped off the velvet, then she sewed on some old-fashioned straight-edged black lace,
full of little embroidered sprigs. The sisters sat in their parlor at the right of the front door. The room was very warm, for there were two west windows, and a hot afternoon sun was beating upon them. Out in front of the house was a piazza, with a cool, uneven brick floor, and a thick lilac growth across the western end. The sisters might have sat there and been comfortable, but they would not. "'Set right out in the face and eyes of all the neighbors," they would have exclaimed with dismay had the idea been suggested. There was, about these old women and all their belongings, a certain gentle and deprecatory reticence. One felt it immediately upon entering their house, or, indeed, upon coming in sight of it. There were never any heads at the windows. The blinds were usually closed. Once in a while a passer-by might see an old woman, well shielded by shawl and scooping sunbonnet, start up like a timid spirit in the yard, and softly disappear through a crack in the front door. Out in the front yard Emily had a little bed of flowers, of balsams and nasturtiums and portulacas. She tended them with furtive glances toward the road. Elizabeth came out in the early morning to sweep the brick floor of the piazza, and the front door was left ajar for a hurried flitting should any one appear. This excessive shyness and secrecy had almost the aspect of guilt, but no more guileless and upright persons could have been imagined than these two old women. They had over their parlor windows full, soft-falling old muslin curtains, and they looped them back to leave bare the smallest possible space of glass. The parlor chairs retreated close to the walls, the polish of the parlor table lit up a dim corner. There were very few ornaments in sight. The walls were full of closets and little cupboards, and in them all superfluities were tucked away to protect them from dust and prying eyes. Never a door in the house stood open. Every bureau drawer was squarely shut. A whole family of skeletons might have been well hidden in these guarded recesses, but skeletons there were none, except, perhaps, a little innocent bone or two of old womanly pride and sensitiveness. The Babcock sisters guarded nothing more jealously than the privacy of their meals. The neighbors considered that there was a decided reason for this. The Babcock girls have so little to eat that they're ashamed to let folks see it, people said. It was certain that the old women regarded intrusion at their meals as an insult, but it was doubtful if they would not have done so had their table been set out with all the luxuries of the season instead of scanty bread and butter and no sauce. No sauce for tea was regarded as very poor living by the village women. Tonight the Babcocks had tea very soon after the lace was sewed on the dress. They always had tea early. They were in the midst of it when the front door opened, and a voice was heard calling out in the hall. The sisters cast a dismayed and indignant look at each other. They both arose, but the door flew open, and their little square tea-table, with its green and white china pot of weak tea, its plate of bread and little glass dish of butter, its two china cups and thin silver teaspoons, were displayed to view. "'My!' cried the visitor, with a little backward shuffle. "'I do hope you'll excuse me. I didn't know you were eating supper. I wouldn't have come in for the world if I'd known. I'll go right out.' It warn't anything particular, anyhow. All the time her sharp and comprehensive gaze was on the tea-table. She counted the slices of bread and measured the butter as she talked. The sisters stepped forward with dignity. "'Come into the other room,' said Elizabeth, and the visitor, still protesting with her backward eyes upon the tea-table, gave way before her but her eyes lighted upon something in the parlor more eagerly than they had upon that frugal and exclusive table. The sisters glanced at each other in dismay. The black silk dress lay over a chair. The caller, who was their neighbor Matilda Jennings, edged toward it as she talked. "'I thought I'd just run over and see if you weren't going to the picnic tomorrow,' she was saying. Then she clutched the dress and diverged. "'Oh, you've been fixin' your dress,' she said to Emily, with innocent insinuation. Insinuation did not sit well upon Matilda Jennings. None of her bodily lines were adapted to it, and the pretense was quite evident. She was short and stout, 
with a hard, sallow rotundity of cheek. Her small black eyes were bright-pointed under fleshy brows. "'Yes, I have,' replied Emily, with a scared glance at Elizabeth. "'Yes,' said Elizabeth, stepping firmly into the subject, and confronting Matilda with prim and resolute blue eyes. "'She has been fixin' of it. The lace was ripped off, and she had to mend it. "'It's pretty lace, ain't it? I had some of the same kind on a mantilla once when I was a girl. This makes me think of it. The sprigs in mine was set a little closer. Let me see, Lisbeth. Your black silk dress is trimmed with velvet, ain't it? Elizabeth surveyed her calmly. Yes, I've always worn black velvet on it, said she. Emily sighed faintly. She had feared that Elizabeth could not answer desirably and be truthful. "'Let me see,' continued Matilda. "'How was that velvet put on your waist?' "'It was put on peaked.' "'In one peak or two. One. "'Now I wonder if it would be too much trouble for you just to let me see it a minute. "'I have been thinking of fixing over my old alpaca a little, "'and I've got a piece of black velvet ribbon I've steamed over, and it looks pretty good. "'I thought maybe I could put it on like yours.' Matilda Jennings, in her chocolate calico, stood as relentlessly as any executioner before the Babcock sisters. They, slim and delicate and pale in their flabby black muslins, leaned toward each other. Then Elizabeth straightened herself. "'Sometime when it's convenient, I'd just as soon show it as not,' said she. "'Well, I'd be much obliged to you if you would,' returned Matilda. Her manner was a trifle overawed, but there was a sharper gleam in her eyes. Pretty soon she went home and ate her solitary and substantial supper of bread and butter, cold potatoes, and pork and beans. Matilda Jennings was as poor as the Babcocks. She had never, like them, known better days. She had never possessed any fine old muslins nor black silks in her life, but she had always eaten more. The Babcocks had always delicately and unobtrusively felt themselves above her, there had been in their lives a faint savor of gentility and aristocracy. Their father had been college-educated and a doctor. Matilda's antecedents had been humble, even in this humble community. She had come of wood-sawyers and garden-laborers. In their youth, when they had gone to school and played together, they had always realized their height above Matilda, and even old age and poverty and a certain friendliness could not do away with it. The Babcocks owned their house, and a tiny sum in the bank, upon the interest of which they lived. Nobody knew how much it was. Nobody ever would know while they lived. They might have had more if they would have sold or mortgaged their house, but they would have died first. They starved daintily and patiently on their little income. They mended their old muslins and tippets, and wore one dress between them for best, taking turns in going out. It seemed inconsistent, but the girls were very fond of society, and their reserve did not interfere with their pleasure in the simple village outings. They were more at ease abroad than at home, perhaps because there were not present so many doors which could be opened into their secrecy, but they had an arbitrary conviction that their claims to respect and consideration would be forever forfeited should they appear on state occasions in anything but black silk. To their notions of etiquette, black silk was as sacred a necessity as feathers at the English court. They could not go abroad and feel any self-respect in those flimsy muslins and rusty woolens, which were very flimsy and rusty. The old persons in the village could hardly remember when the Babcocks had a new dress. The dainty care with which they had made those tender old fabrics endure so long was wonderful. They held up their skirts primly when they walked. They kept their pointed elbows clear of chairs and tables. The black silk in particular was taken off the minute its wearer entered her own house. It was shaken softly, folded, and laid away in a linen sheet. Emily was dressed in it on the 4th of July morning when Matilda Jennings called for her. Matilda came in her voluminous old alpaca with her tin lunch pail on her arm. She looked at Emily in the black silk, and her countenance changed. "'My, you ain't going to wear that black silk trailing round in the woods, are you?' said she. 
"'I guess she won't trail around much,' spoke up Elizabeth. "'She's got to go looking decent.' Matilda's poor old alpaca had many a threadbare streak and mended slit in its rusty folds. The elbows were patched. It was hardly respectable, but she gave the skirt a defiant switch and jerked the patched elbows. "'Well, I always believe in going dressed suitable for the occasion,' said she sturdily, as if that was her especial picnic costume out of a large wardrobe. However, her bravado was not deeply seated. All day long she maneuvered to keep her patches and darns out of sight. She arranged the skirt nervously every time she changed her position, and held her elbows close to her sides, and she made many little flings at Emily's black silk. The festivities were nearly over. The dinner had been eaten. Matilda had devoured with relish her brown bread and cheese and cold pork, and Emily had nibbled daintily at her sweet cake, and glanced with inward loathing at her neighbor's grosser fare. The speeches by the local celebrities were delivered. The cannon had been fired every half hour. The sun was getting low in the west, and a golden mist was rising among the ferny undergrowth in the grove. "'It's getting damp. I can see it rising,' said Emily, who was rheumatic. "'I guess we'd better walk round a little and then go home.' "'Well,' said Matilda, "'I'd just as soon—' "'You'd better hold up your dress.' The two old women adjusted themselves stiffly upon their feet, and began ranging the grove, stepping warily over the slippery pine needles. The woods were full of merry calls. The green distances fluttered with light draperies. Every little while came the sharp bang of a firecracker, the crash of cannon, or the melancholy hoot of a fish-horn. Now and then a blue gunpowder smoke curled up with a golden steam from the dewy ground. Emily was nearsighted. She moved on with innocently peering eyes. Her long neck craned forward. Matilda had been taking the lead, but she suddenly stepped aside. Emily walked on unsuspectingly, holding up her precious black silk. There was a quick puff of smoke, a leap of flame, a volley of vicious little reports— and poor Emily Babcock danced as a martyr as her fiery trail might have done. Her gentle dignity completely deserted her. "'Oh, oh, oh!' she shrieked. Matilda Jennings pushed forward. By that time Emily was standing, pale and quivering, on a little heap of ashes. "'You stepped into a nest of firecrackers,' said Matilda. "'A boy just run. I saw him. What made you stand there in em? Why didn't you get out?' "'I couldn't,' gasped Emily. She could hardly speak. "'Well, I guess it ain't done much harm. Them boys ought to be prosecuted. You don't feel as if you were burned anywhere, do you, Emily?' "'No, I guess not. Seems to me your dress. Just let me look at your dress, Emily. My, ain't that a wicked shame. Just look at all them holes right in the flouncing where it'll show.' It was too true. The flounce that garnished the bottom of the black silk was scorched in a number of places. Emily looked at it and felt faint. "'I must go right home,' she moaned. "'Oh, dear!' "'Maybe you can darn it if you're real particular about it,' said Emily, with an uneasy air. Emily said nothing. She went home. Her dress switched the dust off the wayside weeds, but she paid no attention to it. She walked so fast that Matilda could hardly keep up with her. When she reached her own gate, she swung it swiftly to before Matilda's face. Then she fled into the house. Elizabeth came to the parlor door with a letter in her hand. She cried out when she saw her sister's face. "'What is the matter, Emily, for pity's sakes?' "'You can't never go out again, Elizabeth. You can't. You can't.' "'Why can't I go out? I'd like to know.' "'What do you mean, Emily Babcock?' "'You can't. You never can again. "'I stepped into some firecrackers, "'and I burned some great holes right in the flouncing. "'You can't never wear it without folks knowing. "'Matilda Jennings will tell. "'Oh, Lisbeth, what will you do?' "'Do?' said Elizabeth. "'Well, I hope I ain't so set on going out at my time of life "'as all that comes to. "'Let's see it. "'Hm. I can mend that.' "'No, you can't. Matilda would see it if you did. Oh, dear, oh, dear!' 
Emily dropped into a corner and put her slim hands over her face. "'Do stop acting so,' said her sister. "'I've just had a letter, and Aunt Lisbeth is dead.' After a little, Emily looked up. "'When did she die?' she asked in a despairing voice. "'Last week.' "'Did they ask us to the funeral?' "'Of course they did. It was last Friday at two o'clock in the afternoon. "'They knew the letter couldn't get to us till after the funeral, but of course they asked us. "'What did they say the matter was?' "'Old age, I guess, as much as anything. Aunt Lisbeth was a good deal over eighty. "'Emily sat reflectively. She seemed to be listening while her sister related more at length the contents of the letter. Suddenly she interrupted. "'Lisbeth!' Well, I was thinking, Lisbeth, you know those crape veils we wore when Mother died? Well, what of em? I don't see why you couldn't make a flounce of those veils and put on this dress when you wore it. Then she would know. I'd like to know what I'd wear a crape flounce for. Why, mourning for Aunt Lisbeth. "'Emily Babcock, what sense would there be in my wearing mourning when you didn't?' "'You were named after her, and it's a very different thing. "'You can just tell folks that you were named for your aunt that just died, "'and you felt as if you ought to wear a little crepe on your best dress. "'It'll be an awful job to put on a different flounce every time we wear it.' "'I'll do it. I'm perfectly willing to do it. "'Oh, Lisbeth, I shall die if you ever go out again and wear that dress.' "'For pity's sakes, don't, Emily. "'I'll get out those veils after supper and look at them.' "'The next Sunday Elizabeth wore the black silk "'garnished with a crepe of flounce to church. "'Matilda Jennings walked home with her "'and eyed the new trimming sharply. "'Got a new flounce, ain't you?' she said finally. "'I had word last week that my Aunt Lisbeth Taylor was dead, "'and I thought it weren't anything more unfittin' "'than I should put on a little crepe. "'replied Elizabeth with dignity. "'Has Emily put on mourning, too?' "'Emily ain't any call to. "'She weren't named after her as I was, "'and she never saw her but once when she was a little girl. "'It ain't more'n ten years since I saw her. "'She lived out west. "'I didn't feel as if Emily had any call to wear crape.' "'Matilda said no more, "'but there was unquelled suspicion in her eye "'as they parted at the Babcock Gate.' The next week, a trunk full of Aunt Elizabeth Taylor's clothes arrived from the West. Her daughter had sent them. There was in the trunk a goodly store of old woman's finery, two black silks among the other gowns. Aunt Elizabeth had been a dressy old lady, although she died in her eighties. It was a great surprise to the sisters. They had never dreamed of such a thing. They palpitated with awe and delight as they took out the treasures. Emily clutched Elizabeth a thin hand closing round the thin arm. Lisbeth, What is it? We won't say anything about this to anybody. We'll just go together to meetin' next Sabbath and wear these black silks and let Matilda Jennings see. Elizabeth looked at Emily. A gleam came into her dim blue eyes. She tightened her thin lips. Well, we will, she said. The following Sunday the sisters wore the black silks to church. During the week they appeared together at a sewing meeting, then at church again. The wonder and curiosity were certainly not confined to Matilda Jennings. The eccentricity which the Babcock sisters displayed in not going into society together had long been a favorite topic in the town. There had been a great deal of speculation over it. Now that they had appeared together three consecutive times, there was much talk. On the Monday following the second Sunday, Matilda Jennings went down to the Babcock house. Her cape bonnet was on one sided, but it was firmly tied. She opened the door softly when her old muscles were straining forward to jerk the latch. She sat gently down in the proffered chair, and displayed quite openly a worn place over the knees in her calico gown. "'We had a pleasant Sabbath yesterday, didn't we?' said she. "'Real pleasant,' assented the sisters. "'I thought we had a good discourse.' The Babcocks assented again. "'I heard a good many say they thought it was a good discourse,' 
repeated Matilda, like an emphatic chorus. Then she suddenly leaned forward, and her face, in the depths of her awry bonnet, twisted into a benevolent smile. "'I was real glad to see you out together,' she whispered with meaning emphasis. The sisters smiled stiffly. Matilda paused for a moment. She drew herself back, as if to gather strength for a thrust. She stopped smiling. "'I was glad to see you out together, for I thought it was too bad the way folks was talking,' she said. Elizabeth looked at her. "'How were they talking?' "'Well, I don't know as there's any harm in my telling you. I've been thinking maybe I ought for some time. It's been round considerable lately that you and Emily didn't get along well, and that was the reason you didn't go out more together. I told him I had no idea twas so, though, of course. I couldn't really tell. I was real glad to see you out together, cause there's never any knowing how folks do get along, and I was real glad to see you'd settled it if there had been any trouble. There ain't been any trouble. Well, I'm glad if there ain't been any, and if there has, I'm glad to see it settled, and I know other folks will be too. Elizabeth stood up. If you want to know the reason why we haven't been out together, I'll tell you, said she. You've been trying to find out things every way you could, and now I'll tell you. You've drove me to it. We had just one decent dress between us, and Emily and me took turns wearing it. And Emily used to wear lace on it, and I used to rip off the lace and sew on black velvet when I wore it, so folks shouldn't know it was the same dress. Emily and me never had a word in our lives, and it's a wicked lie for folks to say we have. Emily was softly weeping in her handkerchief. There was not a tear in Elizabeth's eyes. There were bright spots on her cheeks, and her slim height overhung Matilda Jennings imposingly. "'My Aunt Elizabeth, that I was named for, died two or three weeks ago,' she continued, "'and they sent us a trunk full of her clothes, and there was two decent dresses among them. "'And that's the reason why Emily and me have been out together since. "'Now, Matilda Jennings, you have found out the whole story, and I hope you're satisfied.' Now that the detective instinct and the craving inquisitiveness which were so strong in this woman were satisfied, she should have been more jubilant than she was. She had suspected what nobody else in town had suspected. She had verified her suspicion, and discovered what the secrecy and pride of the sisters had concealed from the whole village. Still she looked uneasy and subdued. "'I shan't tell anybody,' said she." "'You can tell nobody your mind to.' "'I shan't tell nobody.' Matilda Jennings arose. She had passed the parlor door when she faced about. "'I suppose I kinder begretched you that black silk,' said she, "'or I shouldn't have cared so much about finding out. I never had a black silk myself, nor any of my folks that I ever heard of. I ain't got nothing decent to wear anyway.' There was a moment's silence. "'We shan't lay up anything.' said Elizabeth then, and Emily sobbed responsively. Matilda passed on, and opened the outer door. Elizabeth whispered to her sister, and Emily nodded eagerly. "'You tell her,' said she. "'Matilda,' called Elizabeth. Matilda looked back. "'I was just going to say that if you wouldn't resent it, it got burned to some, but we mended it nice, that you was perfectly welcome to that black silk.' "'Emily and me don't really need it, and we'd be glad to have you have it.' There were tears in Matilda Jennings' black eyes, but she held them unwinkingly. "'Thank ye,' she said in a gruff voice, and stepped along over the piazza down the steps. She reached Emily's flower garden. The peppery sweetness of the nasturtiums came up in her face. It was quite early in the day, and the portulacas were still out in a splendid field of crimson and yellow.' Matilda turned about, her broad foot just cleared a yellow portulaca, which had straggled into the path, but she did not notice it. The homely old figure pushed past the flowers and into the house again. She stood before Elizabeth and Emily. "'Look here,' said she, with a fine light struggling out of her coarse old face. "'I want to tell you, I see them firecrackers a-sizzling before Emily stepped in em. End of A Gala Dress by Mary E. Wilkins
The Locket by Kate Chopin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Locket by Kate Chopin. Part 1. One night in autumn, a few men were gathered about a fire on the slope of a hill. They belonged to a small detachment of Confederate forces and were awaiting orders to march. Their gray uniforms were worn beyond the point of shabbiness. One of the men was heating something in a tin cup over the embers. Two were lying at full length a little distance away, while a fourth was trying to decipher a letter and had drawn close to the light. He had unfastened his collar and a good bit of his flannel shirt front. "'What's that you got around your neck, Ned?' asked one of the men, lying in the obscurity. Ned, or Edmund, mechanically fastened another button on his shirt, and did not reply. He went on reading his letter. "'Is it your sweetheart's picture?' "'Tain't no gal's picture,' offered the man at the fire. He had removed his tin cup, and was engaged in stirring its grimy contents with a small stick. "'That's a charm.' some kind of hoodoo business that one of the priests gave him to keep him out of trouble i know them catholics that's how come frenchy got promoted and never got a scratch since he's been in the ranks hey french ain't i right edmund looked up absently from his letter what is it he asked ain't that a charm you got round your neck it must be nick returned edmund with a smile I don't know how I could have gone through this year and a half without it. The letter had made Edmund heartsick and homesick. He stretched himself on his back and looked straight up at the blinking stars. But he was not thinking of them, nor of anything, but a certain spring day, when the bees were humming in the clematis, when a girl was saying good-bye to him. He could see her as she unclasped from her neck the locket which she fastened about his own. It was an old-fashioned golden locket, bearing miniatures of her father and mother, with their names and the date of their marriage. It was her most precious earthly possession. Edmund could feel again the folds of the girl's soft white gown, and see the droop of the angel sleeves as she circled her fair arms about his neck. Her sweet face, appealing, pathetic, tormented by the pain of parting, appeared before him as vividly as life. He turned over, burying his face in his arm, and there he lay, still and motionless. The profound and treacherous night, with its silence and semblance of peace, settled upon the camp. He dreamed that the fair Octavie brought him a letter. He had no chair to offer her, and was pained and embarrassed at the condition of his garments. He was ashamed of the poor food which comprised the dinner at which he begged her to join them. He dreamt of a serpent coiling around his throat, and when he strove to grasp it the slimy thing glided away from his clutch. Then his dream was clamor. "'Get your duds, you, Frenchy!' Nick was bellowing in his face. There was what appeared to be a scramble and a rush rather than any regulated movement. The hillside was alive with clatter and motion, with sudden upspringing lights among the pines. In the east the dawn was unfolding out of the darkness. Its glimmer was yet dim in the plain below. "'What's it all about?' wondered a big black bird, perched in the top of the tallest tree. He was an old solitary and a wise one, yet he was not wise enough to guess what it was all about." So all day long he kept blinking and wondering. The noise reached far out over the plain and across the hills, and awoke the little babes that were sleeping in their cradles. The smoke curled up towards the sun and shattered the plain, so that the stupid birds thought it was going to rain. But the wise one knew better. "'They are children playing a game,' thought he. "'I shall know more about it if I watch long enough.' At the approach of night they had all vanished away with their din and smoke. Then the old bird plumed his feathers. 
At last he had understood. With a flap of his great black wings, he shot downward, circling toward the plain. A man was picking his way across the plain. He was dressed in the garb of a clergyman. His mission was to administer the consolations of religion to any of the prostrate figures in whom there might yet linger a spark of life. A negro accompanied him, bearing a bucket of water and a flask of wine. There were no wounded here. They had been borne away. But the retreat had been hurried, and the vultures, and the good Samaritans, would have to look to the dead. There was a soldier, a mere boy, lying with his face to the sky. His hands were clutching the sword, on either side, and his fingernails were stuffed with earth and bits of grass that he had gathered in his despairing grasp upon life. His musket was gone, he was hatless, and his face and clothing were begrimed. Around his neck hung a gold chain and locket. The priest, bending over him, unclasped the chain and removed it from the dead soldier's neck. He had grown used to the terrors of war, and could face them unflinchingly. But its pathos, some way, always brought the tears to his old, dim eyes. The Angelus was ringing half a mile away. The priest and the negro knelt and murmured together the evening benediction and a prayer for the dead. Part Two The peace and beauty of a spring day had descended upon the earth like a benediction. Along the leafy road, which skirted a narrow, torturous stream in central Louisiana, rumbled an old-fashioned cabriolet much the worse for hard and rough usage over country roads and lanes. The fat, black horses went in a slow, measured trot, notwithstanding constant urging on the part of the fat, black coachman. Within the vehicle were seated the fair Octavi, and her old friend and neighbor, Judge Pillier, who had come to take her for a morning drive. Octavi wore a plain black dress, severe in its simplicity, a narrow belt held it at the waist, and the sleeves were gathered into close-fitting wristbands. She had discarded her hoop-skirt, and appeared not unlike a nun. Beneath the folds of her bodice nestled the old locket. She never displayed it now. It had returned to her, sanctified in her eyes, made precious, as material things sometimes are, by being forever identified with a significant moment of one's existence. A hundred times she had read over the letter with which the locket had come back to her. No later than that morning she had again pored over it. As she sat beside the window, smoothing the letter out upon her knee, heavy and spiced odors stole in to her with the songs of birds and the humming of insects in the air. She was so young and the world was so beautiful that there came over her a sense of unreality as she read again and again the priest's letter. He told of that autumn day, drawing to its close, with the gold and the red fading out of the west, and the night gathering its shadows to cover the faces of the dead. Oh, she could not believe that one of those dead was her own. With visage uplifted to the gray sky in an agony of supplication, a spasm of resistance and rebellion seized and swept over her. Why was the spring here with its flowers and its seductive breath, if he was dead? Why was she here? What further had she to do with life and the living? Octavi had experienced many such moments of despair, but a blessed resignation had never failed to follow, and it fell then upon her like a mantle and enveloped her. I shall grow old and quiet and sad like poor Aunt Tavy she murmured to herself, as she folded the letter and replaced it in the secretary. Already she gave herself a little demure air like her Aunt Tavy. She walked with a slow glide in unconscious imitation of Mademoiselle Tavy, whom some youthful affliction had robbed of earthly compensation while leaving her in possession of youth's illusions. As she sat in the old cabriolet, Beside the father of her dead lover, 
again there came to Octavia the terrible sense of loss which had assailed her so often before. The soul of her youth clamored for its rights, for a share in the world's glory and exultation. She leaned back and drew her veil a little closer about her face. It was an old black veil of her Aunt Tavy's. A whiff of dust from the road had blown in, and she wiped her cheeks and her eyes with her soft white handkerchief, a homemade handkerchief, fabricated from one of her old fine muslin petticoats. "'Will you do me the favor, Octavie?' requested the judge in the courteous tone, which he never abandoned. "'To remove that veil which you wear. It seems out of harmony some way with the beauty and promise of the day.' The young girl obediently yielded to her old companion's wish, and, unpinning the cumbersome, sombre drapery from her bonnet, folded it neatly and laid it upon the seat in front of her. "'Ah, that is better, far better,' he said in a tone expressing unbounded relief. "'Never put it on again, dear.' Octavie felt a little hurt as if he wished to debar her from share and parcel in the burden of affliction which had been placed upon all of them. Again she drew forth the old muslin handkerchief. They had left the big road and turned into a level plain, which had formerly been an old meadow. There were clumps of thorn-trees here and there, gorgeous in their spring radiance. Some cattle were grazing, off in the distance, in spots where the grass was tall and luscious. At the far end of the meadow was the towering lilac hedge, skirting the lane that led to Judge Pillier's house, and the scent of its heavy blossoms met them like a soft and tender embrace of welcome. As they neared the house, the old gentleman placed an arm around the girl's shoulders, and turning her face up to him, he said, "'Do you not think that on a day like this miracles might happen? When the whole earth is vibrant with life, does it not seem to you, Octavie, that heaven might once relent and give us back our dead? He spoke very low, advisedly and impressively. In his voice was an old quaver which was not habitual, and there was agitation in every line of his visage. She gazed at him with eyes that were full of supplication, and a certain terror of joy. They had been driving through the lane with the towering hedge on one side and the open meadow on the other. The horses had somewhat quickened their lazy pace. As they turned into the avenue leading to the house, a whole choir of feathered songsters fluted a sudden torrent of melodious greeting from their leafy hiding-places. Octavie felt as if she had passed into a stage of existence which was like a dream, more poignant and real than life. There was the old grey house with its sloping eaves. Amid the blur of green, and dimly, she saw familiar faces and heard voices as if they came from far across the fields, and Edmund was holding her. Her dead Edmund, her living Edmund. And she felt the beating of his heart against her, and the agonizing rapture of his kisses striving to awake her. It was as if the spirit of life, and the awakening spring, had given back the soul to her youth, and bade her rejoice. It was many hours later that Octavie drew the locket from her bosom, and looked at Edmund with a questioning appeal in her glance. "'It was the night before an engagement,' he said, in the hurry of the encounter, and the retreat next day. I never missed it till the fight was over. I thought, of course, I had lost it in the heat of the struggle but it was stolen. Stolen! she shuddered, and thought of the dead soldier with his face uplifted to the sky in an agony of supplication. Edmund said nothing, but he thought of his messmate, the one who had lain far back in the shadow, the one who had said nothing. End of The Locket Recording by Katie Riley, November 2009. Three unpublished poems by Louisa May Alcott. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Antoinette Griffin. A B A. Lines written by Louisa M. Alcott to her father. Like Bunyan's pilgrim with his pack, forth went the dreaming youth to seek, to find, and make his own wisdom, virtue, and truth. Life was his book, and patiently he studied each hard page. By turns, reformer, outcast priest, philosopher, and sage, Christ was his master, and he made his life a gospel sweet. Plato and Pythagoras in him found a disciple meet. The noblest and best his friends, faithful and fond, though few, eager to listen, learn and pay, the love and honor due. Power and place, silver and gold, he neither asked nor sought, only to serve his fellow men with heart and word and thought. A pilgrim still, but in his pack, no sins to frighten or oppress, but wisdom, morals, piety, to teach, to warn and bless. The world passed by, nor cared to take the treasure he could give. Apart he sat, content to wait and beautifully live, unsaddened by long, lonely years of want neglect and wrong his soul to him a kingdom was steadfast serene and strong magnanimous and pure his life tranquil its happy end patience and peace his handmaids were death an immortal friend for him no monuments need rise no laurels make his pall the memory of the good and wise outshines outlives them all end of recording end of three unpublished poems by louisa may alcott recording by antoinette griffin orlando florida stories with com. when the bio overflows by alice dunbar this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. When the Bio Overflows by Alice Dunbar for the American Women's Literature Collection. When the sun goes down behind the great oaks along the Bio Tisch near Franklin, it throws red needles of light into the dark woods and leaves a great glow on the still bio. Ma'am Moton paused at her gate and cast a contemplative look at the red sky. It will rain tomorrow, show. I must get in my things. Ma'am Moton's remark must have been addressed to herself or to the lean dog, for no one else was visible. She moved briskly about the yard, taking things from the line, when Luzette's voice called cheerily ah ma'am motin can i help Lozette was petite and plump and black-haired Lozette's eyes danced and her lips were red and tempting ma'am motin's face relaxed as the small brown hands relieved hers of the burden sylve has he come yet asked the red mouth menon ma chere said ma'am motin sadly i can tell you for why he no come home soon dis day ah me i feel like something goin to happen he's so strange even as she spoke a quick nervous step was heard crunching up the brick walk sylve paused an instant without the kitchen door his face turned to the setting sun he was tall and slim and agile a true cajun bonjour Lucette, he laughed eh mamma ah uh, my son you are very late service crowned but said nothing it was a silent supper that followed Lozette was sad mam motin sighed now and then Sylvie was constrained maman he said at length i am going away mam motin 
dropped her fork and stared at him with unseeing eyes then as she comprehended his remark she put her hand out to him with a pitiful gesture Sylves, cried Louisette, springing to her feet maman don't don't he said weakly then gathering strength from the silence he burst forth yes i'm going away to work i'm tired of this just dig dig work in the field nothing to see but de cloud de tree de bayou i don't like new orleans it too near here there no money dear i go up for mardi gras and the same people the same street i'm going to chicago Silves screamed both women at once chicago that vast far-off city that seemed in another world chicago a name to conjure with for wickedness why yes continued Silves. lots of boys i know there Ari and joseph lascaux and arthur they write me what money they make in cigar i can make a living too i can make fine cigar see how i do in new orleans in the winter Oh, c'est vrai, wailed Louisette. Then you'll forget me. Non, non, mon cher, he answered tenderly. I will come back when the bayou overflows again, and maman and Louisette will have fine present. Mam Motan had bowed her head on her hands and was rocking to and fro in an agony of dry-eyed misery. Sauves went to her side and knelt. Maman, he said softly maman you must not cry all de boys go away and i will come back rich and you won't have for to work no more but maman motin was inconsolable it was even as Sylves had said in the summer time the boys of the bayou teche would work in the field or in the town of franklin hack driving and doing odd jobs when winter came there was a general exodus to new orleans a hundred miles away where work was to be had as cigar makers there is money plenty of it in cigar making if one can get in the right place of late however there had been a general slackness of the trade last winter oftentimes Sylves had walked the streets out of work many were the creole boys who had gone to chicago to earn a living for the cigar making trade flourishes there wonderfully friends of Sylves had gone and written home glowing accounts of the money to be had almost for the asking when one's blood leaps for new scenes new adventures and one needs money what is the use of frittering away time alternately between the bayoteche and new orleans Sylvis had brooded all summer and now that september had come he was determined to go Lizette, the orphan the girl lover whom everyone and franklin knew would some day be maman motin's daughter-in-law wept and pleaded in vain Sylves kissed her with quivering lips ma chere he would say think i will bring you one fine diamond ring next spring when the bayou overflows again Lozette would fain be content with this promise as for mam motin she seemed to have grown ages older her Sylves was going from her Sylves, whose trips to New Orleans had been a yearly source of heartbreak, was going far away for months to that mistily wicked city, a thousand miles away. October came, and Sylves had gone. Mam Motin had kept up bravely until the last, when, with one final cry, she extended her arms to the pitiless train, bearing him northward. Then she and Lozette went home drearily, the one leaning upon the other ah that was a great day when the first letter came from chicago Lucette came running in breathlessly from the post office and together they read it again and again chicago was such a wonderful city said Sylves. why it was always like new orleans at mardi gras with the people he had seen joseph lascaux and he had a place to work promised him he was well but he wanted oh so much to see maman and Lucette but then he could wait was ever such a wonderful letter Lizette sat for an hour afterwards building gorgeous air castles while mam motin fingered the paper and murmured prayers to the virgin for Sylves. when the bio overflowed again that would be in april then Lizette caught herself looking critically at her slender brown fingers and blushed furiously 
though Mam Motin could not see her in the gathering twilight. Next week there was another letter, even more wonderful than the first. Sylvester had found work. He was making cigars, and was earning two dollars a day. Such wages! Mam Motin and Lozette began to plan pretty things for the brown cottage on the Teche. That was a pleasant winter, after all. True, there was no Sylvester, but then he was always in New Orleans for a few months anyway. There were his letters, full of wondrous tales of the great queer city, where cars went by ropes underground, and where there was no Mardi Gras, and the people did not mind Lent. Now and then there would be a present, a keepsake for Lozette, and some money for Maman. They would plan improvements for the cottage, and Lozette began to do sewing and dainty crochet, which she would hide with a blush if anyone hinted at a trousseau. It was March now, and springtime. The bio began to sweep down between its banks less sluggishly than before. It was rising, and soon would spread over its tiny levees. The doors could be left open now, though the trees were not yet green, but then down here the trees do not swell and bud slowly and tease you for weeks with promises of greenness. Dear no, they simply look mysterious, and their twigs shake against each other and tell secrets of the leaves that will soon be born. Then one morning you awake, and lo, it is a green world. The boughs have suddenly clothed themselves all in a wondrous garment, and you feel the blood run riot in your veins out of pure sympathy. One day in March it was warm and sweet. Underfoot were violets and wee white star flowers peering through the baby grass. The sky was blue, with flecks of white clouds reflecting themselves in the brown bio. Lucette tripped up the red brick walk with the Chicago letter in her hand, and paused a minute at the door to look upon the leaping waters, her eyes dancing. I know the bio must be ready to overflow, went the letter in the carefully phrased French that the brothers taught at the parochial school, and I am glad, for I want to see the dear maman and my Lucette. I am not so well, and Monsieur le docteur says it is well for me to go to the south again. Monsieur le docteur, Sylvie, not well? The thought struck a chill to the hearts of Mam Motin and Loisette, but not for long. Of course, Sylvester was not well. He needed some of Maman's dessins. Then he was homesick. It was to be expected. At last the great day came. Sylvester would be home. The brown waters of the bayou had spread until they were seemingly trying to rival the Mississippi in width. The little house was scrubbed and cleaned until it shone again. Lisette had looked her dainty little dress over and over to be sure that there was not a flaw to be found wherein Sylvus could compare her unfavorably to the stylish Chicago girls. The train rumbled in on the platform, and two pair of eyes opened wide for the first glimpse of Sylvus. The porter, all officiousness and brass buttons, bustled up to Mam Motin. This is Mrs. Motin? he inquired deferentially. Mam Motin nodded, her heart singing. Where is Sylvester? He is here, madame. There appeared Joseph Lasco, then some men bearing something. Lozette put her hands up to her eyes to hide the sight, but Mam Motin was rigid. It was too cold for him. Joseph was saying to almost deaf ears, and he took the consumption. He thought he could get well when he come home. He talked all the way down about the bio, and about you and Loisette. Just three hours ago he had a bad hemorrhage, and he died from weakness. Just three hours ago he said he wanted to get home and give Lucette her diamond ring when the bio overflowed. End of when the bio overflows by Alice Dunbar Ardessa by Willa Cather This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times
Ardessa by Willa Cather for the American Women's Literature Collection. The grand-mannered old man who sat at a desk in the reception room of the outcry offices to receive visitors and, incidentally, to keep the time-book of the employees, looked up as Miss Devine entered at ten minutes past ten and condescendingly wished him good morning. He bowed profoundly as she minced past his desk, and with an indifferent air took her course down the corridor that led to the editorial offices. Mechanically, he opened the flat black book at his elbow and placed his finger on D, running his eye along the line of figures after the name Divine. It's banker's hour she keeps, indeed, he muttered. What was the use of entering so capricious a record? Nevertheless, with his usual preliminary flourish, he wrote ten ten under this, the fourth day of May. The employee who kept banker's hours rustled on down the corridor to her private room, hung up her lavender jacket and her trim spring hat, and readjusted her side combs by the mirror inside her closet door. Glancing at her desk, she rang for an office boy and reproved him because he had not dusted more carefully and because there were lumps in her paste. When he disappeared with the paste jar, she sat down to decide which of her employer's letters he should see and which he should not. Ardessa was not young, and she was certainly not handsome. The coquettish angle at which she carried her head was a mannerism surviving from a time when it was more becoming. She shuddered at the cold candor of the new businesswoman, and was insinuatingly feminine. Ardessa's employer, like young Lochinvar, had come out of the West, and he had done a great many contradictory things before he became proprietor and editor of The Outcry. Before he decided to go to New York and make the East take notice of him, O'Malley had acquired a punctual, reliable silver mine in South Dakota. This silent friend in the background made his journalistic su success comparatively easy. He had figured out, when he was a rich nobody in Nevada, that the quickest way to cut into the known world was through the printing press. He arrived in New York, bought a highly respectable publication, and turned it into a red-hot magazine of protest, which he called The Outcry. He knew what the West wanted, and it proved to be what everybody secretly wanted. In six years he had done the thing that had hitherto seemed impossible. Build up a national weekly, out on the newsstands the same day in New York and San Francisco, a magazine the, pe the people howled for, a moving picture film of their real tastes and interests. O'Malley bought the outcry to make a stir, not to make a career, but he had got built into the thing more than he ever intended. It had made him a public man and put him into politics. He found the publicity game diverting, and it held him longer than any other game had ever done. He had built up about him an organization of which he was somewhat afraid, and with which he was vastly bored. On his staff there were five famous men, and he had made every one of them. At first it amused him to manufacture celebrities. He found he could take an average reporter from the daily press, give him a line to follow, a trust to fight, a vice to expose. This was all in that good time when people were eager to read about their own wickedness. And in two years the reporter would be recognized as an authority. Other people, Napoleon, Disraeli, Sarah Bernhardt, had discovered that advertising would go a long way, but Marcus O'Malley discovered that in America it would go all the way, as far as he wished to pay its passage. Any human countenance, plastered in three-sheet posters from sea to sea, would be revered by the American people. The strangest thing was that the owners of these grave countenances, staring at their own faces on newsstands and billboards, fell to venerating themselves, and even he, O'Malley, was more or less constrained by these reputations that he had created out of cheap paper and cheap ink. 
Constraint was the last thing O'Malley liked. The most engaging and unusual thing about the man was that he couldn't be fooled by the success of his own methods, and no amount of recognition could make a stuffed shirt of him. No matter how much he was advertised as a great medicine man in the councils of the nation, he knew that he was a born gambler and a soldier of fortune. He left his dignified office to take care of itself for a good many months of the year, while he played about on the outskirts of social order. He liked being a great man from the East in rough and tumble western cities, where he had once been merely an unconsidered spender. O'Malley's long absences constituted one of the supreme advantages of Ardessa Devine's position. When he was at his post, her duties were not heavy, but when he was giving balls in Goldfield, Nevada, she lived an ideal life. She came to the office every day, indeed, to forward such of O'Malley's letters as she thought best, to attend to his club notices and tradesmen's bills, and to taste the sense of her high connections. The great men of the staff were all about her, as contemplative as Buddhas in their private offices, each meditating upon the particular trust or form of vice confided to his care. Thus surrounded, Ardessa had a pleasant sense of being at the heart of things. It was like a mental massage, exercised without exertion. She read and she embroidered. Her room was pleasant, and she liked to be seen at ladylike tasks and to feel herself a graceful contrast to the crude girls in the advertising and circulation departments across the hall. The younger stenographers, who had to get through with the enormous office correspondence, and who rushed about from one editor to another with wire baskets full of letters, made faces as they passed Ardessa's door, and saw her cool and cloistered, daintily plying her needle. But no matter how hard the other stenographers were driven, no one, not even one of the five oracles of the staff, dared dictate so much as a letter to Ardessa. Like a sultan's bride, she was inviolate in her lord's absence. She had to be kept for him. Naturally, the other young women employed in the outcry offices disliked Miss Devine. They were all competent girls, trained in the exacting methods of modern business, and they had to make good every day in the week, had to get through with a great deal of work or lose their position. O'Malley's private secretary was a mystery to them. Her exemptions and privileges, her patronizing remarks, formed an exhaustless subject of conversation at the lunch hour. Ardessa had, indeed, as they knew she must have, a kind of purchase on her employer. When O'Malley first came to New York to break into publicity, he engaged Miss Devine upon the recommendation of the editor whose ailing publication he bought and christened. That editor was a conservative, scholarly gentleman of the old school, who was retiring because he felt out of place in the world of brighter, breezier magazines that had been flowering since the new century came in. He believed that in this vehement world young O'Malley would make himself heard, and that Miss Devine's training in an editorial office would be of use to him. When O'Malley first sat down at a desk to be an editor, all the cards that were brought in looked pretty much alike to him. Ardessa was at his elbow. She had long been steeped in literary distinctions and in the social distinctions, which used to count for much more than they do now. She knew all the great men, all the nephews and clients of great men. She knew which must be seen, which must be made welcome, and which could safely be sent away. She could give O'Malley, on the instant, the former rating in magazine offices of nearly every name that was brought in to him. She could give him an idea of the man's connections, of the price his work commanded, and the insinuate whether he ought to be met with the old punctiliousness or with the new joviality. She was useful in explaining to her employer the significance of various invitations and the standing of clubs and associations. At first she was virtually the social mentor of the bullet-headed young westerner who wanted to break into everything. 
the solitary person about the office of the humming new magazine who knew anything about the editorial traditions of the eighties and nineties which antiquated as they now were gave an editor as o'malley said a background despite her indolence ardessa was useful to o'malley as a social reminder she was the card catalogue of his ever-changing personal relations o'malley went in for everything and got tired of everything that was why he made a good editor after he was through with people ardessa was very skilful in covering his retreat she read and answered the letters of admirers who had begun to bore him when great authors who had been dined and feted the month before were suddenly left to cool their heels in the reception room thrown upon the suave hospitality of the grand old man at the desk it was ardessa who went out and made soothing and plausible explanations as to why the editor could not see them she was the break that checked the too eager neophyte the emollient that eased the severing of relationships the gentle extinguisher of the lights that failed when there were no longer messages of hope and cheer to be sent to ardent young writers and reformers ardessa delivered as sweetly as possible whatever messages were left in handling these people with whom O'Malley was quite through. Ardessa had gradually developed an industry which was immensely gratifying to her own vanity. Not only did she not crush them, she even fostered them a little. She continued to advise them in the reception room and personally received their manuscripts long after O'Malley had declared that he would never read another line they wrote. She let them outline their plans for stories and articles to her, promising to bring these suggestions to the editor's attention. She denied herself to nobody, was gracious even to the Shakespeare Bacon man, the perpetual motion man, the travel article man, the ghosts which haunt every magazine office. The writers who had had their happy hour of O'Malley's favor kept feeling that Ardessa might reinstate them. She answered their letters of inquiry, in her most polished and elegant style, and even gave them hints as to the subjects in which the restless editor was or was not interested at the moment. She feared it would be useless to send him an article on how to trap lions, because he had just bought an article on elephant shooting in Majuba land, etc. So when O'Malley plunged into his office at 11.30 on this, the fourth day of May, Having just got back from three days fishing, he found Ardessa in the reception room, surrounded by a little court of discards. This was annoying, for he always wanted his stenographer at once. Telling the office boy to give her a hint that she was needed, he threw off his hat and top coat and began to race through the pile of letters Ardessa had put on his desk. When she entered, he did not wait for her polite inquiries about his trip, but broke in at once. What is that fellow who writes about Fossy Jaw still hanging round here for? I don't want any articles on Fossy Jaw, and if I did, I wouldn't want his. He has just sold an article on the match industry to the new age, Mr. O'Malley, Ardessa replied as she took her seat at the editor's right. Why does he have to come and tell us about it? We've nothing to do with the new age. And that prison reform guy, what's he loafing about for? Ardessa bridled. You remember, Mr. O'Malley, he brought letters of introduction from Governor Harper, the reform governor of Mississippi. O'Malley jumped up, kicking over his wastebasket in his impatience. That was months ago. I went through his letters and went through him, too. He hasn't got anything we want. I've been through with Governor Harper a long while. We're asleep at the switch in here, and let me tell you, if I catch sight of that causes of blindness in babies woman around here again i'll do something violent clear them out miss devine clear them out we need a traffic policeman in this office have you got that article on stealing our national water power ready for me mr gerard took it back to make modifications he gave it to me at noon on saturday 
just before the office closed. I will have it ready for you to-morrow morning, Mr. O'Malley, if you have not too many letters for me this afternoon. Ardessa replied pointedly. Holy Mike! muttered O'Malley. We need a traffic policeman for the staff, too. Gerard's modified that thing half a dozen times already. Why don't they get accurate information in the first place? He began to dictate his morning mail, walking briskly up and down the floor by way of giving his stenographer an energetic example. Her indolence and her ladylike deportment weighed on him. He wanted to take her by the elbows and run her around the block. He didn't mind that she loafed when he was away, but it was becoming harder and harder to speed her up when he was on the spot. He knew his correspondence was not enough to keep her busy, so when he was in town he made her type his own breezy editorials and various articles by members of his staff. Transcribing editorial copy is always laborious, and the only way to make it easy is to farm it out. This Ardessa was usually clever enough to do. When she returned to her own room after O'Malley had gone out to lunch, Ardessa rang for an office boy and said, languidly, James, call Becky, please. In a moment, a thin, tense-faced Hebrew girl of eighteen or nineteen came rushing in, carrying a wire basket full of typewritten sheets. She was as gaunt as a plucked spring chicken, and her cheap, gaudy clothes might have been thrown on her. She looked as if she were running to catch a train, and in mortal dread of missing it. While Miss Devine examined the pages in the basket, Becky stood with her shoulders drawn up and her elbows drawn in, apparently trying to hide herself in her insufficient open-work waist. Her wild black eyes followed Miss Devine's hands desperately. Ardessa sighed. This seems to be a very smeary copy again, Becky. You don't keep your mind on your work, and so you have to erase continually. Becky spoke up in wailing self-vindication. It ain't that, Miss Devine. It's so many hard words he uses that I have to be at the dictionary all the time. Look, look! She produced a bunch of manuscript faintly scrawled in pencil, and thrust it under Ardessa's eyes. He don't write out the words at all. He just begins a word, and then makes waves for you to guess. I see you haven't always guessed correctly, Becky, said Ardessa, with a weary smile. There are a great many words here that would surprise Mr. Gerard, I am afraid. And the inserts, Becky persisted. How is anybody to tell where they go, Miss Devine? It's mostly inserts, see? all over the top and sides and back. Ardessa turned her head away. Don't clod the pages like that, Becky. You make me nervous. Mr. Gerard has not time to dot his I's and cross his T's. That is what we keep copyists for. I will correct these sheets for you. It would be terrible if Mr. O'Malley saw them, and then you can copy them over th again. It must be done by tomorrow morning, so you may have to work late. See that your hands are clean and dry, and then you will not smear it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Miss Devine. Will you tell the janitor, please, it's all right, if I have to stay? He was cross because I was here Saturday afternoon doing this. He said it was a holiday, and when everybody else was gone, I ought to— That will do, Becky. Yes, I will speak to the janitor for you. You may go to lunch now. Becky turned on one heel and then swung back. "'Miss Devine,' she said anxiously, "'will it be all right if I get white shoes for now?' Ardessa gave her kind consideration. "'For office wear, you mean?' "'No, Becky. With only one pair, you could not keep them properly clean, and black shoes are much less conspicuous. Tan, if you prefer.' Becky looked down at her feet. They were too large, and her skirt was as much too short as her legs were too long. Nearly all the girls I know wear white shoes to business, she pleaded. They are probably little girls who work in factories or department stores, and that is quite another matter. Since you raised the question, Becky, I ought to speak to you about your new waist. Don't wear it to the office again, please. 
those cheap open-work waists are not appropriate in an office like this they are all very well for little chorus girls but miss kowski wears expensive waists to business more open than this and jewelry ardessa interrupted her face grew hard miss kowski she said coldly works for the business department you are employed in the editorial offices there is a great difference you see becky i might have to call you in here at any time when a scientist or a great writer or the president of a university is here talking over editorial matters and such clothes as you have on to-day would make a bad impression nearly all our connections are with important people of that kind and we ought to be well but quietly dressed yes miss devine thank you becky gasped and disappeared heaven knew she had no need to be further impressed with the greatness of the outcry office during the year and a half she had been there she had never ceased to tremble she knew the prices all the authors got as well as miss devine did and everything seemed to her to be done on a magnificent scale she hadn't a good memory for long technical words but she never forgot dates or prices or initials or telephone numbers becky felt that her job depended on miss devine and she was so glad to have it that she scarcely realized she was being bullied besides she was grateful for all that she had learned from ardessa ardessa had taught her to do most of the things that she was supposed to do herself becky wanted to learn she had to learn that was the train she was always running for her father isaac teitelbaum the tailor who pressed miss devine's skirts and kept her ladylike suits in order had come to his client two years ago and told her he had a bright girl just out of commercial high school he implored ardessa to find some office position for his daughter ardessa told an appealing story to o'malley and brought becky into the office at a salary of six dollars a week to help with copying and to learn business routine when becky first came she was as ignorant as a young savage she was rapid at her shorthand and typing but a kaffir girl would have known as much about the english language nobody ever wanted to learn more than becky she fairly wore the dictionary out she dug up her old school grammar and worked over it at night she faithfully mastered miss devine's fussy system of punctuation there were eight children at home younger than becky and they were all eager to learn they wanted to get their mother out of the three dark rooms behind the tailor shop and to move into a flat upstairs where they could as becky said live private the young title bombs doubted their father's ability to bring this change about for the more things he declared himself ready to do in his window placards the fewer were brought to him to be done dyeing cleaning ladies furs remodeled it did no good rebecca was out to improve him herself as her father had told her she must ardessa had easy way with her it was one of those rare relationships from which both persons profit the more becky could learn from ardessa the happier she was and the more ardessa could unload on becky the greater was her contentment she easily broke becky of the gum-chewing habit taught her to walk quietly to efface herself at the proper moment and to hold her tongue Becky had been raised to eight dollars a week, but she didn't care half so much about that as she did about her own increasing efficiency. The more work Miss Devine handed over to her, the happier she was, and the faster she was able to eat it up. She tested and tried herself in every possible way. She now had full confidence that she would surely one day be a high-priced stenographer, a real businesswoman. Becky would have corrupted a really industrious person, but a bilious temperament like Ardessa's couldn't make even a feeble stand against such willingness. Ardessa had grown soft and had lost the knack of turning out work. Sometimes, in her importance and serenity, she shivered. What if O'Malley should die and she were thrust out into the world to work in competition with the brazen, competent young women? she saw about her everywhere she believed herself indispensable 
but she knew that in such a mischanceful world as this the very powers of darkness might rise to separate her from this pearl among jobs when becky came in from lunch she went down the long hall to the washroom where all the little girls who worked in the advertising and circulation departments kept their hats and jackets there were shelves and shelves of bright spring hats piled on top of one another all as stiff as sheet iron and trimmed with gay flowers at the marble washstand stood Raina Kalski, the right bower of the business manager, polishing her diamond rings with a nail brush. Hello, kid, she called over her shoulder to Becky. I've got a ticket for you for Thursday afternoon. Becky's black eyes glowed, but the strained look on her face drew tighter than ever. I'll never ask her, Miss Kalski, she said rapidly. I don't dare. I have to stay late night again and I know she'd be hard to please after, if I was to try to get off on a weekday. I thank you, Miss Kalski, but I'd better not. Miss Kalski laughed. She was a slender young Hebrew, handsome in an impudent tenderloin sort of way, with a small head, reddish-brown almond eyes, a trifle tilted, a rapacious mouth, and a beautiful chin. Ain't you under that woman's thumb, though? Call her bluff. She isn't half the prima donna she thinks she is. On my side of the hall, we know who's who about this place. The business and editorial departments of the outcry were separated by a long corridor and a great contempt. Miss Kalski dried her rings with tissue paper and studied them with an appraising eye. Well, since you're such a fraidy calf, she went on. Maybe I could get a rise out of her myself. Now I've got you a ticket out of that shirt front, I want you to go. I'll drop in on Divine this afternoon. When Miss Kalski went back to her desk in the business manager's private office, she turned to him familiarly, but not impertinently. Mr. Henderson, I want to send a kid over in the editorial stenographers to the palace Thursday afternoon. She's a nice kid, only she's scared out of her skin all the time. Miss Devine's her boss, and she'll be just mean enough not to let the young one off. Would you say a word to her? The business manager lit a cigar. I'm not saying words to any of the highbrows over there. Try it out with the Devine yourself. You're not bashful. Miss Kalski shrugged her shoulders and smiled. Oh, very well. She serpentined out of the room and crossed the Rubicon into the editorial offices. She found Ardessa typing O'Malley's letters and wearing a pained expression. "'Good afternoon, Miss Devine,' she said carelessly. "'Can we borrow Becky over there for Thursday afternoon? We're short.' Miss Devine looked piqued and tilted her head. "'I don't think it's customary, Miss Kalski, for the business department to use our people. We never have girls enough here to do the work. Of course, if Mr. Henderson feels justified— Thanks awfully, Miss Devine, Miss Kalski interrupted her with the perfectly smooth, good-natured tone which never betrayed a hint of the scorn every line of her sinuous figure expressed. I will tell Mr. Henderson. Perhaps we can do something for you some day. Whether this was a threat, a kind wish, or an insinuation— no mortal could have told. Miss Kalski's face was always suggesting insolence without being quite insolent. As she returned to her own domain, she met the cashier's head clerk in the hall. That divine woman's a crime, she murmured. The head clerk laughed tolerantly. That afternoon, as Miss Kalski was leaving the office at 5.15, on her way down the corridor, she heard a typewriter clicking away in the empty, echoing editorial offices. She looked in and found Becky bending forward over the machine as if she were about to swallow it. "'Hello, kid. Do you sleep with that?' she called. She walked up to Becky and glanced at her copy. "'What do you let em keep you up nights over that stuff for?' she asked contemptuously. "'The world wouldn't suffer if that stuff never got printed.' Rebecca looked up wildly. Not even Miss Kalski's French pansy hat or her earrings and landscape veil could loosen Becky's tenacious mind from Mr. Guerin's article 
on water power. She scarcely knew what Miss Kowski had said to her, certainly not what she meant. But I must make progress already, Miss Kowski, she panted. Miss Kowski gave her low siren laugh. I should say you must, she ejaculated. Ardessa decided to take her vacation in June, and she arranged that Miss Milligan should do O'Malley's work while she was away. Miss Milligan was blunt and noisy, rapid and inaccurate. It would be just as well for O'Malley to work with a coarse instrument for a time. He would be more appreciative, perhaps, of certain qualities to which he had seemed insensible of late. Ardessa was to leave for East Hampton on Sunday, and she spent Saturday morning instructing her substitute as to the state of the correspondence. At noon O'Malley burst into her room. All the morning he had been closeted with a new writer of mystery stories just over from England. "'Can you stay and take my letters this afternoon, Miss Devine? You're not leaving until tomorrow.' Ardessa pouted and tilted her head at the angle he was tired of. "'I'm sorry, Mr. O'Malley, but I've left all my shopping for this afternoon. I think Becky Teitelbaum could do them for you. I will tell her to be careful.' "'Oh, all right.' O'Malley bounced out with a reflection of Ardessa's disdainful expression on his face. Saturday afternoon was always a half-holiday, to be sure, but since she had weeks of freedom when he was away, however. At two o'clock, Becky Teitelbaum appeared at his door, clad in the sober office suit which Miss Devine insisted she should wear, her notebook in her hand, and so frightened that her fingers were cold and her lips were pale. She had never taken dictation from the editor before. It was a great and terrifying occasion. "'Sit down,' he said encouragingly. He began dictating while he shook from his bag the manuscripts he had snatched away from the amazed English author that morning. Presently he looked up. "'Do I go too fast?' "'No, sir,' Becky found strength to say. At the end of an hour, he told her to go and type as many of the letters as she could, while he went over the bunch of stuff he had torn from the Englishman. He was with the Hindu detective in an opium den in Shanghai when Becky returned and placed a pile of papers on his desk. "'How many?' he asked, without looking up. "'All you gave me, sir.' "'All? So soon? Wait a minute, and let me see how many mistakes.' He went over the letters rapidly, signing them as he read. They seem to be all right. I thought you were the girl that made so many mistakes. Rebecca was never too frightened to vindicate herself. Mr. O'Malley, sir, I don't make mistakes with letters. It's only copying the articles that have so many long words, and when the writing isn't plain, like Mr. Gerard's, I never make any mistakes with Mr. Johnson's articles, or with yours. I don't. O'Malley wheeled round in his chair, looked with curiosity at her long, tense face, her black eyes, and straight brows. Oh, so you sometimes copy articles, do you? How does that happen? Yes, sir. Always Miss Devine gives me the articles to do. It's good practice for me. I see. O'Malley shrugged his shoulders. He was thinking that he could get a rise out of the whole American public any day easier than he could get a rise out of Artessa. What editorials of mine have you copied lately, for instance? Rebecca blazed out at him, reciting rapidly. Oh, a word about the Rosenbaums, useless navy yards, who killed Cock Robin? Wait a minute, O'Malley checked her flow. What was that one about Cock Robin? It was all about why the Secretary of the Interior dismissed. All right, all right, copy those letters and put them down the chute as you go out. Come in here for a minute on Monday morning. Becky hurried home to tell her father that she had taken the editor's letters and had made no mistakes. On Monday she learned that she was to do O'Malley's work for a few days. He disliked Miss Milligan, and he was annoyed with Ardessa for trying to put her over on him when there was better material at hand. With Rebecca, he got on very well. She was impersonal, unreproachful and she fairly panted for work. Everything was done almost before he told her what he wanted. 
she raced ahead of him it was like riding a good modern bicycle after pumping along on an old hard tire on the day before miss devine's return o'malley strolled over for a chat with the business office henderson your people are taking vacations now i suppose could you use an extra girl if it's that thin black one i can o'malley gave him a wise smile it isn't to be honest i want to put one over on you i want you to take miss devine over here for a while and speed her up i can't do anything she's got the upper hand of me i don't want to fire her you understand but she makes my life too difficult it's my fault of course i've pampered her give her a chance over here maybe she'll come back you can be firm with them can't you henderson glanced toward the desk where miss kowski's lightning eye was skimming over the printing-house bills that he was supposed to verify himself well if i can't i know who can he replied with a chuckle exactly o'malley agreed i'm counting on the force of miss kowski's example miss devine's all right miss kowski but she needs regular exercise she owes it to her complexion i can't discipline people miss kowski's only reply was a low indulgent laugh O'Malley braced himself on the morning of Ardessa's return. He told the waiter at his club to bring him a second pot of coffee, and to bring it hot. He was really afraid of her. When she presented herself at his office at ten-thirty, he complimented her upon her tan, and asked her about her vacation. Then he broke the news to her. "'We want to make a few temporary changes about here, Miss Devine, for the summer months. The business department is short of help.' henderson is going to put miss kowski on the books for a while to figure out some economies for him and he is going to take you over meantime i'll get becky broken in so that she could take your work if you were sick or anything ardessa drew herself up i've not been accustomed to commercial work mr o'malley i've no interest in it and i don't care to brush up on it Brushing up is just what we need, Miss Devine, O'Malley began, tramping about his room expansively. I'm going to brush everybody up. I'm going to brush a few people out. But I want you to stay with us, of course. You belong here. Don't be hasty now. Go to your room and think it over. Ardessa was beginning to cry, and O'Malley was afraid he would lose his nerve. He looked out of the window at a new skyscraper that was building while she retired without a word. At her own desk, Ardessa sat down breathless and trembling. The one thing she had never doubted was her unique value to O'Malley. She had, as she told herself, taught him everything. She would say a few things to Becky Teitelbaum and to that pigeon-breasted tailor, and her father, too. The worst of it was that Ardessa had herself brought it all about. She could see that clearly now she had carefully trained and qualified her successor why had she ever civilized becky why had she taught her manners and deportment broken her of the gum-chewing habit and made her presentable in her original state o'malley would never have put up with her no matter what her ability ardessa told herself that o'malley was notoriously fickle becky amused him but he would soon find out her limitations the wise thing she knew was to humor him but it seemed to her that she could not swallow her pride. Ardessa grew le yellower within the hour. Over and over in her mind she bade O'Malley a cold adieu, and minced out past the grand old man at the desk for the last time. But each exit she rehearsed made her feel sorrier for herself. She thought over all the offices she knew, but she realized that she could never meet their inexorable standards of efficiency. While she was bitterly deliberating, O'Malley himself wandered in, rattling his keys nervously in his pocket. He shut the door behind him. Now you're going to come through with this all right, aren't you, Miss Devine? I want Henderson to get over the notion that my people over here are stuck up and think the business department are old shoes. That's where we get our money from, as he often reminds me. You'll be the best paid girl over there. No reduction, of course. You don't want to go wandering off to some new office where personality doesn't count for anything. He sat down confidentially on the edge of her desk. 
do you know, Miss Devine? Ardessa simpered tearfully as she replied. Mr. O'Malley, she brought out, you'll soon find that Becky is not the sort of girl to meet people for you when you are away. I don't see how you can think of letting her. That's one thing I want to change, Miss Devine. You're too soft-handed with the has-beens and the never wasers You're too much of a lady for this rough game. Nearly everybody who comes in here wants to sell us a gold brick, and you treat them as if they were bringing in wedding presents. Becky is as rough as sandpaper, and she'll clear out a lot of dead wood. O'Malley rose and tapped Ardessa's shrinking shoulder. Now be a sport and go through with it, Miss Devine. I'll see that you don't lose. Henderson thinks you'll refuse to do his work, so I want you to get moved in there before he comes back from lunch. I've had a desk put in his office for you. Miss Kowski is in the bookkeeper's room half the time now. Rena Kowski was amazed that afternoon when a line of office boys entered, carrying Miss Devine's effects, and when Ardessa herself coldly followed them. After Ardessa had arranged her desk, Miss Kowski went over to her and told her about some matters of routine very good-naturedly. Ardessa looked pretty badly shaken up, and Raina bore no grudges. When you want the dope on the correspondence with the paper men, don't bother to look it up. I've got it all in my head, and I can save time for you. If he wants you to go over the printing bills every week, you'd better let me help you with that for a while. I can stay almost any afternoon. It's quite a trick to figure out the plates and overtime charges till you get used to it. I've worked out a quick method that saves trouble. When Henderson came in at three, he found Ardessa, chilly but civil, awaiting his instructions. He knew she disapproved of his tastes and his manners, but he didn't mind. What interested and amused him was that Raina Kalski, whom he had always thought as cold-blooded as an adding machine, seemed to be making a hair mattress of herself to break Ardessa's fall. At five o'clock, when Ardessa rose to go, the business manager said, breezily, See you at nine in the morning, Miss Devine. We begin on the stroke. Ardessa faded out of the door, and Miss Kalski's slender back squirmed with amusement. I never thought to hear such words spoken she admitted, but I guess she'll limber up all right. The atmosphere is bad over there. They get moldy. After the next monthly luncheon of the heads of departments, O'Malley said to Henderson, as he feed the coat boy, By the way, how are you making it with a bartered bride? Henderson smashed on his Panama, as he said. Any time you want her back, don't be delicate. But O'Malley shook his red head and laughed. Oh, I'm no Indian giver. End of Ardessa by Willa Cather. The Ghetto from the Ghetto and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. The Ghetto from the Ghetto and Other Poems by Lola Ridge. 1. Cool, inaccessible air is floating in velvety blackness, shot with steel-blue lights. But no breath stirs the heat, leaning its ponderous bulk upon the ghetto, and most on Hester Street. The heat, nosing in the body's overflow, like a beast pressing its great steaming belly close, covering all avenues of air. The heat in Hester Street heaped like a dray with the garbage of the world. Bodies dangle from the fire escapes or sprawl over the stoops. Upturned faces glimmer pallidly, herring yellow faces, spotted as with a mold and moist faces of girls like dank white lilies, and infants' faces with open parched mouths that suck at the air as at empty teats. Young women pass in groups, converging to the forums and meeting halls, 
surging, indomitable, slow, through the gross underbrush of heat. Their heads are uncovered to the stars, and they call to the young men and to one another with a free camaraderie. Only their eyes are ancient and alone. The street crawls undulant like a river addled with its hot tide of flesh that ever thickens. Heavy surges of flesh break over the pavements, clavering like a surf. Flesh of this abiding brood of those ancient mothers who saw the dawn break over Egypt and turned their cakes upon the dry hot stones and went on till the gold of the Egyptians fell down off their arms, fasting and athirst, and yet on. Did they vision with those eyes darkly clear that looked the sun in the face and were not blinded across the centuries the march of their enduring flesh? Did they hear under the molten silence of the desert like a stopped wheel and the scorpions tick-ticking on the sand, the infinite procession of those feet? 2. I room at Sotos, in the little green room that was Benny's, with Sadie and her old father and her mother, who is not so old and wears her own hair. Old Sotos no longer makes saddles. He has forgotten how. He has forgotten most things, even Benny, who stays away and sends wine on holidays. And he does not like Sadie's mother, who hides God's candles, nor Sadie, whose young pagan breath puts out the light that should burn always like errands before the Lord. Time spins like a crazy dial in his brain, and night by night I see the love gesture of his arm in his green, greasy coat sleeve, circling the book and the candles gleaming starkly on the blotched paper whiteness of his face, like a miswritten psalm. Night by night I hear his lifted praise, like a broken whinnying before the Lord's shut gate. Sadie dresses in black. She has black, wet hair full of cold lights, and a fine-drawn face, too white. All day the power machines drone in her ears. All day the fine dust flies, till throats are parched and itch, and the heat, like a kept corpse, fouls to the last corner. Then, when needles move more slowly on the cloth, and sweaty fingers slacken, and hair falls in damp wisps over the eyes. Sped by some power within, Sadie quivers like a rod, a thin black piston flying, one with her machine. She, who stabs the piecework with her bitter eye, and bids the girls, slow down, you'll have him cutting us again. She, fiery static atom, held in place by the fierce pressure all about, speeds up the driven wheels and biting steel that twice has nipped her to the bone. Nights she reads those books that have most unset thought, new poured and malleable, to which her thought leaps fusing at white heat, or spits her fire out in some dim manger of a hall, or at a protest meeting on the square, her lit eyes kindling the mob, or dances madly at a festival, each dawn finds her a little whiter, though up and keyed to the long day, alert yet weary, like a bird that all night long has beat about a light. The Gentile lover that she charms and shrews is one more pebble in the pack for Sadie's mother, who greets him with her narrowed eyes that hold some welcome back. What's to be done, she'll say, when Sadie wants, she takes. Better than Benny with his Christian woman, a man is not so like, if they should fight, to call her Jew. Yet when she lies in bed, and the soft babble of their talk comes to her, and the silences, I know she never sleeps till the keen draught blowing up the empty hall edges through her transom, and she hears his foot on the first stairs. Sarah and Anna live on the floor above. Sarah is swarthy and ill-dressed. Life for her has no ritual. She would break an ideal like an egg for the winged thing at the core. Her mind is hard and brilliant and cutting, like an acetylene torch. If any impurities drift there, they must be burnt up as in a clear flame. It is droll that she should work in a pants factory. Yet, where else? Tousled and collar awry at her olive throat. Besides, her hands are unkept. 
with english and everything there is so little time she reads without bias doubting clamorously psychology plays science philosophies those giant flowers that have bloomed and withered scattering their seed and out of this young forcing soil what growth may come what amazing blossomings anna is different one is always aware of anna and the young men turn their heads to look at her she has the appeal of a folk song and her cheap clothes are always in rhythm when the strike was on she gave half her pay she would give anything save the praise that is hers and the love of her lyric body but sarah's desire covets nothing apart she would share all things even her lover three the sturdy ghetto children march by the parade waving their toy flags prancing to the bugles lusty unafraid shaking little fire sticks at the night the old blinking night swerving out of the way wrapped in her darkness like a shawl but a small girl cowers apart her braided head shiny as a blackbird's in the gleam of the torchlight is poised as for flight her eyes have the glow of darkened lights she stammers in yiddish but i do not understand and there flits across her face a shadow as of a drawn blind i give her an orange large and golden and she looks at it blankly i take her little cold hand and try to draw her to me but she is stiff like a doll suddenly she darts through the crowd like a little white panic blown along the night away from the terror of oncoming feet and drums rattling like curses in red roaring mouths and torches spluttering silver fire and lights that nose out hiding places to the night squatting like a hunchback under the curved stoop the old mammy night that has outlived beauty and knows the ways of fear the night wide opening crooked and comforting arms hiding her as in a voluminous skirt the sturdy ghetto children march by the parade waving their toy flags prancing to the bugles lusty unafraid but i see a white frock and eyes like hooded lights out of the shadow of pogroms watching watching four calicoes and furs pocket-books and scarves razor straps and knives patterns in check olive hands and russet head pickles red and coppery green pickles brown pickles patterns in tapestry coral beads blue beads beads of pearl and amber gugas beauty pins jewelry for chits darting rays of violet amethyst and jade all the colors out to play jumbled iridescently patterns in stained glass shivered into bits nooses of gay ribbon tugging at one's sleeve dainty little garters hanging out their sign here a powder frilly things there a sonsy feather white beards black beards like knots in the weave and ah the little babies shiny black-eyed babies half a million pink toes wriggling all together baskets full of babies like grapes on a vine mothers waddling in and out making all things right picking up the slip threads in grand street at night grand street like a great bazaar crowded like a float bulging like a crazy quilt stretched on a line but nearer seen this litter of the east takes on a garbled majesty the herded stalls in dissolute array the glitter and the jumbled finery and strangely juxtaposed cans paper rags and colors decomposing faded like old hair with flashes of barbaric hues and eyes of mystery flung like an ancient tapestry of motley weave upon the open wall of this new land here a tawny-headed girl lemons in a greenish broth and a huge earthen bowl by a bronze merchant with a tall black lamb's wool cap upon his head he has no glance for her his thrifty eyes bend glittering intent their hoarded looks upon his merchandise as though it were some splendid cloth or sumptuous raiment stitched in gold and red 
He seldom talks save of the goods he spreads, the meager cotton with its dismal flower, but with his skinny hands that hover like two hawks above some luscious meat, he fingers lovingly each calico as though it were a gorgeous shawl or costly vesture wrought in silken thread or strange bright carpet made for sandaled feet. Here an old scholar stands, his brooding eyes that hold long vistas without end of caravans and trees and roads and cities dwindling in remembrance, bend mostly on his tapes and thread. What if they tweak his beard, these raw young seed of Israel, who have no backward vision in their eyes, and mock him as he sways above the sunken arches of his feet? They find no peg to hang their taunts upon. His soul is like a rock that bears a front worn smooth by the coarse friction of the sea, and unperturbed he keeps his bitter peace. What if a rigid arm and stuffed blue shape, backed by a nickel star, does prod him on, taking his proud patience for humility? All gutters are as one to that old race that has been thrust from off the curbstones of the world, and he smiles with the pale irony of one who holds the wisdom of the Talmud stored away in his mind's lavender. But this young trader, born to trade as to a call, peddles the notions of the hour. The gestures of the craft are his, and all the lore, as when to hold, withdraw, persuade, advance, and be it gum or flags or clean all or the newest thing in tags, demand goes to him as the bee to flower. And he, appraising all who come and go, with his amazing sleight of mind and glance and nimble thought, and nature balanced like the scales at knot, looks westward where the trade lights glow, and sees his vision rise, a tape-ruled vision circumscribed in stone some fifty stories to the skies. 5. As I sit in my little fifth-floor room, bare save for bed and chair, and coppery stains left by seeping rains on the low ceiling and green plaster walls, where, when night falls, golden ladybugs come out of their holes, and roaches sepia brown consort. I hear bells pealing out of the great church at Rutgers Street, holding its high-flung cross above the ghetto, and one floor down across the court the parrot screaming, For rats! For rats! The parrot, frowsy white, everlastingly swinging on its iron bar. A little old woman with a wig of smooth black hair, gummed about her shrunken brows, comes sometimes on the fire escape. An old stooped mother, the left shoulder low, with that uneven droopiness that women know who have suckled many young, yet I have seen no other than the parrot there. I watch her mornings as she shakes her rugs, feebly with futile reach and fingers without clutch. Her thews are slack and curve the ruined back and flesh empurpled like old meat, yet each conspires to feed those guttering fires with which her eyes are quick. On Friday nights her candles signal infinite fine rays to other windows, coupling other lights, linking the tenements like an endless prayer. She seems less lonely than the bird, that day by day about the dismal house screams out his frenzied word, that night by night, if a dog yelps, or a cat yowls, or a sick child whines, or a door screaks on its hinges, or a man and woman fight, sends his cry above the huddled roofs, For Varts! For Varts! 6. In this dingy café the old men sit, muffled in woolens. Everything is faded, shabby, colorless, old the chairs loose-jointed, creaking like old bones, the tables, the waiters, the walls, whose mottled plaster blends in one tone with the old flesh. Young life and young thought are alike barred, and no unheralded noises jolt old nerves, and old wheezy breaths pass around old thoughts, dry as snuff. And there is no divergence and no friction, because life is flattened and ground as by many mills. And it is here the committee, sweet-breathed and smooth of skin and supple of spine and knee, 
with shining unpouched eyes and the blood high-powered leaping in flexible arteries the insolent young enthusiastic undiscriminating committee who would placard tombstones and scatter leaflets even in graves comes trampling with sacrilegious feet the old men turn stiffly mumbling to each other they are gentle and torpid and busy with eating but one lifts a face of clayish pallor there is a dull fury in his eyes like little rusty grates he rises slowly trembling in his many swathings like an awakened mummy ridiculous yet terrible and the committee flings him a waste glance dropping a leaflet by his plate a lone fire flickers in the dusty eyes the lips chant inaudibly the warped shrunken body straightens like a tree and he curses with uplifted arms and perished fingers claw-like clutching so centuries ago the old men cursed acosta when they prophetic heard upon their sepulchres those feet that may not halt nor turn aside for ancient things seven here in this room bare like a barn egos gesture one to the other naked unformed unwinged egos out of the shell examining searching devouring avid alike for the flower or the dung having no dainty antenna for the touch and withdrawal only the open maw egos cawing expanding in the mean egg little squat tailors with unkept faces pale as lard fur makers factory hands shop workers newsboys with battling eyes and bodies yet vibrant with the momentum of long runs here and there a woman words 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 pattering like hail like hail falling without aim egos rampant screaming each other down one motions perpetually waving arms like overgrowths he has burning eyes and a cough and a thin voice piping like a flute among trombones one red-bearded rearing a welter of maimed face bashed in from some old wound garbles max stirner his words knock each other like little wooden blocks no one heeds him and a lank boy with hair over his eyes pounds upon the table he is chairman egos yet in the primer hearing world voices chanting grand arias majors resonant stunning with sound baffling minors half heard like rain on pools majestic discordances greater than harmonies gleaning out of it all passion bewilderment pain egos yearning with the world old want in their eyes hurt hot eyes that do not sleep enough striving with infinite effort frustrate yet ever pursuing the great white liberty trailing her dissolving glory over each hard-worn barricade only to fade anew egos crying out of unkept deeps and waving their dreams like flags multicolored dreams winged and glorious a gas jet throws a stunted flame vaguely illumining the groping faces and through the uncurtained window falls the waste light of stars as cold as wise men's eyes indifferent great stars fortuitously glancing at the secret meeting in this shut-in room bare as a manger eight lights go out and the stark trunks of the factories melt into the drawn darkness sheathing like a seamless garment and mothers take home their babies waxen and delicately curled like little potted flowers closed under the stars lights go out and the young men shut their eyes but life turns in them life in the cramped ova tearing and rendering asunder its living cells wars arts discoveries rebellions travails immolations cataclysms hates pent in the shut flesh and the young men twist on their beds in languor and dizziness unsupportable their eyes heavy and dimmed with dust of long oblivions in the gray pulp behind staring as through a choked glass and they gaze at the moon throwing off a faint heat the moon blonde and burning creeping to their cots softly as on naked feet lolling on the coverlet like a woman offering her white body nude glory of the moon that leaps like an athlete on the bosoms of the young girls stripped of their linens stroking their breasts that are smooth and cool as mother-of-pearl 
till the nipples tingle and burn as though little lips plucked at them. They shudder and grow faint, and their ears are filled as with a delirious rhapsody that life, like a drunken player, strikes out of their clear white bodies as out of ivory keys. Lights go out, and the great lovers linger in little groups still passionately debating or one may walk in silence listening only to the still summons of life life making the great demand calling its new christs till tears come blurring the stars that grow tender and comforting like the eyes of comrades and the moon rolls behind the battery like a word molten out of the mouth of god lights go out and colors rush together fusing and floating away pale worn gold like the settings of old jewels mauves exquisite tremulous and luminous purples and burning spires and aureoles of light like shimmering auras they are covering up the push carts now all have gone save an old man with mirrors little oval mirrors like tiny pools he shuffles up a darkened street and the moon burnishes his mirrors till they shine like phosphorus the moon like a skull staring out of eyeless sockets at the old men trundling home the push carts nine a sallow dawn is in the sky as i enter my little green room sadie's light is still burning without the frail moon worn to a silvery tissue throws a faint glamour on the roofs and down the shadowy spires lights tiptoe out softly as when lovers close street doors out of the battery a little wind stirs idly as an arm trails over a boat's side in dalliance rippling the smooth dead surface of the heat and hester street like a forlorn woman overborne by many babies at her teats turns on her trampled bed to meet the day life startling vigorous life that squirms under my touch and baffles me when i try to examine it or hurls me back without apology leaving my ego ruffled and preening itself life articulate shrill screaming in provocative assertion or out of the black and clotted gutters piping in silvery thin sweet staccato of children's laughter or clinging over the push carts like a litter of tiny bells or the jingle of silver coins perpetually changing hands or like the jordan somberly swirling in tumultuous uncharted tides surface calm electric currents of life throwing off thoughts like sparks glittering disappearing making unknown circuits or out of spent particles stirring feeble contortions in old faiths passing before the new long nights argued away in meeting halls back of interminable stairways in romanian wine shops and little russian tea rooms feet echoing through deserted streets in the soft darkness before dawn brows aching throbbing burning life leaping in the shaken flesh like flame at an asbestos curtain life pent overflowing stoops and facades jostling pushing contriving seething as in a great vat bartering changing extorting dreaming debating aspiring astounding indestructible life of the ghetto strong flux of life like a bitter wine out of the bloody stills of the world out of the passion eternal end of the ghetto from the ghetto and other poems by lola ridge noblesse from the copycat and other stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosie Noblesse from The Copycat and Other Stories by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman Margaret Lee encountered in her late middle age the rather singular strait of being entirely alone in the world. She was unmarried, and as far as relatives were concerned, she had none except those connected with her by ties not of blood but by marriage. Margaret had not married when her flesh had been comparative. Later, when it had become superlative, she had no opportunities to marry. Life would have been hard enough for Margaret under any circumstances, but it was especially hard, living, as she did, with her father's stepdaughter and that daughter's husband. 
Margaret's stepmother had been a child in spite of her two marriages, and a very silly, although pretty child. The daughter, Camille, was like her, although not so pretty, and the man whom Camille had married was what Margaret had been taught to regard as common. His business pursuits were irregular and partook of mystery. He always smoked cigarettes and chewed gum. He wore loud shirts and a diamond scarf-pin which had upon him the appearance of stolen goods. The gem had belonged to Margaret's own mother, but when Camille expressed a desire to present it to Jack Desmond, Margaret had yielded with no outward hesitation, but afterward she wept miserably over its loss when alone in her room. The spirit had gone out of Margaret, the little which she had possessed. She had always been a gentle, sensitive creature, and was almost helpless before the wishes of others. After all, it had been a long time since Margaret had been able to force the ring even upon her little finger, but she had derived a small pleasure from the reflection that she owned it in its faded velvet box, hidden under laces in her top bureau drawer. She did not like to see it blazing forth from the tie of this very ordinary young man who had married Camille. Margaret had a gentle, high-bred contempt for Jack Desmond, but at the same time a vague fear of him. Jack had a measure of unscrupulous business shrewdness, which spared nothing and nobody, and that in spite of the fact that he had not succeeded. Margaret owned the old Lee place, which had been magnificent, but of late years the expenditures had been reduced and it had deteriorated. The conservatories had been closed. There was only one horse in the stable. Jack had bought him. He was a worn-out trotter with legs carefully bandaged. Jack drove him at reckless speed, not considering those slender, braceleted legs. Jack had a racing gig, and when in it, with striped coat, cap on one side, cigarette in his mouth, lines held taut, skimming along the roads in clouds of dust, he thought himself the man and true sportsman which he was not. Some of the old Lee Silver had paid for that waning trotter. Camille adored Jack, and cared for no associations, no society, for which he was not suited. Before the trotter was bought, she told Margaret that the kind of dinners which she was able to give in Fairhill were awfully slow. "'If we could afford to have some men out from the city, some nice fellers that Jack knows, it would be worth while,' said she. "'But we have grown so hard up we can't do a thing to make it worth their while. Those men haven't got any use for a back-number old place like this. We can't take them round in autos, nor give them a chance at cards, for Jack couldn't pay if he lost, and Jack is awful honourable. We can't have the right kind of folks here for any fun. I don't propose to ask the rector and his wife, and old Mr. Harvey, or people like the Leeches. The Leeches are a very good family, said Margaret feebly. I don't care for good old families when they are so slow, retorted Camille. The fellers we could have here, if we were rich enough, come from fine families, but they are up to date. It's no use hanging on to old silver dishes we never use, and that I don't intend to spoil my hands shining. Poor Jack don't have much fun anyway. If he wants that trotter, he says it's going dirt cheap. I think it's mean he can't have it, instead of your hanging on to a lot of out-of-style old silver. So there. Two generations ago there had been French blood in Camille's family. She put on her clothes beautifully, and she had a dark, rather fine-featured, alert little face, which gave a wrong impression, for she was essentially vulgar. Sometimes poor Margaret Lee wished that Camille had been definitely vicious, if only she might be possessed of more of the characteristics of breeding. Camille so irritated Margaret in those somewhat abstruse traits called sensibilities, that she felt as if she were living with a sort of spiritual nutmeg grater. Seldom did Camille speak that she did not jar Margaret, although unconsciously. Camille meant to be kind to the stout woman, whom she pitied as far as she was capable of pitying without understanding. She realized that it must be horrible to be no longer young, and so stout that one was fairly monstrous, but how horrible she could not with her mentality conceive. Jack also meant to be kind. He was not of the brutal, that is, intentionally brutal type, but he had a shrewd eye to the betterment of himself, and no realization of the torture he inflicted upon those who opposed that betterment. For a long time matters had been worse than usual financially in the Lee house. The sisters had been left in charge of the sadly dwindled estate, and had depended upon the judgment, or lack of judgment, of Jack. He approved of taking your chances and striking for larger income. The few good old grandfather securities had been sold, and wild ones from the very jungle of commerce had been substituted. Jack, like most men of his type, while shrewd, was as credulous as a child. 
he lied himself and expected all men to tell him the truth camille at his bidding mortgaged the old place and margaret dared not oppose taxes were not paid interest was not paid credit was exhausted then the house was put up at public auction and brought little more than sufficient to pay the creditors jack took the balance and staked it in a few games of chance and of course lost the weary trotter stumbled one day and had to be shot jack became desperate he frightened camille he was suddenly morose he bade camille pack and margaret also and they obeyed camille stowed away her crumpled finery in the bulging old trunks and margaret folded daintily her few remnants of past treasures she had an old silk gown or two, which resisted with their rich honesty the inroads of time, and a few pieces of old lace, which Camille understood no better than she understood their owner. Then Margaret and the Desmonds went to the city and lived in a horrible tawdry little flat in a tawdry locality. Jack roared with bitter mirth when he saw poor Margaret forced to enter her tiny room sidewise. Camille laughed also, although she chided Jack gently. "'Mean of you to make fun of poor Margaret, Jackie dear,' she said. For a few weeks, Margaret's life in that flat was horrible. Then it became still worse. Margaret nearly filled with her weary, ridiculous bulk her little room, and she remained there most of the time, although it was sunny and noisy, its one window giving on a courtyard strung with clotheslines and teeming with boisterous life. Camille and Jack went trolley-riding, and made shift to entertain a little, merry, but questionable people— who gave them passes to vaudeville and entertained in their turn until the small hours unquestionably these people suggested to jack desmond the scheme which spelled tragedy to margaret she always remembered one little dark man with keen eyes who had seen her disappearing through her door of a sunday night when all these gay bedraggled birds were at liberty and the fun ran high great scott the man had said and margaret had heard him demand of jack that she be recalled she obeyed and the man was introduced also the other members of the party. Margaret Lee stood in the midst of this throng, and heard their repressed titters of mirth at her appearance. Everybody there was in good humor with the exception of Jack, who was still nursing his bad luck, and the little dark man whom Jack owed. The eyes of Jack and the little dark man made Margaret cold with a terror of something she knew not what. Before that terror the shame and mortification of her exhibition to that merry company was of no import. She stood among them, silent, immense, clad in her dark purple silk gown spread over a great hoop skirt. A real lace collar lay softly over her enormous, billowing shoulders. Real lace ruffles lay over her great, shapeless hands. Her face, the delicacy of whose features was veiled with flesh, flushed and paled. Not even flesh could subdue the sad brilliancy of her dark blue eyes, fixed inward upon her own sad state, unregardful of the company. She made an indefinite murmur of response to the salutations given her, and then retreated. She heard the roar of laughter after she had squeezed through the door of her room. Then she heard eager conversation, of which she did not catch the real import, but which terrified her with chance expressions. She was quite sure that she was the subject of that eager discussion. She was quite sure that it had boded her no good. In a few days she knew the worst, and the worst was beyond her utmost imaginings. This was before the days of moving picture shows. It was the day of humiliating spectacles of deformities, when inventions of amusements for the people had not progressed. It was the day of exhibitions of sad freaks of nature, calculated to provoke tears rather than laughter in the healthy-minded, and poor Margaret Lee was a chosen victim. Camille informed her in a few words of her fate. Camille was sorry for her, although not in the least understanding why she was sorry, she realized dimly that Margaret would be distressed, but she was unable from her narrow point of view to comprehend fully the whole tragedy. "'Jack has gone broke,' stated Camille. "'He owes Bill Stark a pile, and he can't pay a cent of it, and Jack's good sense of honor about a poker debt is about the biggest thing in his character. Jack has got to pay. And Bill has a little circus, going to travel all summer, and he's offered big money for you.' Jack can pay Bill what he owes him, and we'll have enough to live on, and have lots of fun going around. You hadn't ought to make a fuss about it. Margaret, pale as death, stared at the girl, pertly slim and common and pretty, who stared back laughingly, although still with the glimmer of uncomprehending pity in her black eyes. "'What does he want me for?' gasped Margaret. "'For a show, because you are so big,' replied Camille." 
"'You will make us all rich, Margaret. Ain't it nice?' Then Camille screamed, the shill, raucous scream of the woman of her type, for Margaret had fallen back in a dead faint, her immense bulk inert in her chair. Jack came running in alarm. Margaret had suddenly gained value in his shrewd eyes. He was as pale as she. Finally, Margaret raised her head, opened her miserable eyes, and regained her consciousness of herself and what lay before her. There was no course open but submission. She knew that from the first. All three faced destitution— she was the one financial asset, she and her poor flesh. She had to face it, and with what dignity she could muster. Margaret had great piety. She kept constantly before her mental vision the fact in which she believed that the world which she found so hard, and which put her to unspeakable torture, was not all. A week elapsed before the wretched little show of which she was to be a member went on the road, and night after night she prayed. She besieged her God for strength. She never prayed for respite. Her realization of the situation and her lofty resolution prevented that. The awful, ridiculous combat was before her. There was no evasion. She prayed only for the strength which leads to victory. However, when the time came, it was all worse than she had imagined. How could a woman, gently born and bred, conceive of the horrible ignominy of such life? She was dragged hither and yon to this and that little town, she travelled through sweltering heat on jolting trains, she slept in tents, she lived, she, Margaret Lee, on terms of equality with the common and the vulgar. Daily her absurd unwieldiness was exhibited to crowds screaming with laughter. Even her faith wavered. It seemed to her that there was nothing for evermore beyond those staring, jeering faces of silly mirth and delight at sight of her, seated in two chairs, clad in a pink spangled dress, her vast shoulders bare and sparkling with a tawdry necklace, her great bare arms covered with brass bracelets, her hands encased in short white kid gloves, over the fingers of which she wore a number of rings, stage properties. Margaret became a horror to herself. At times it seemed to her that she was in the way of fairly losing her own identity. It mattered little that Camille and Jack were very kind to her, that they showed her the nice things which her terrible earnings had enabled them to have. She sat in her two chairs, the two chairs proved a most successful advertisement, with her two kid-cushiony hands clenched in her pink-spangled lap, and she suffered agony of soul, which made her inner self stern and terrible, behind that great pink mask of face. And nobody realized until one sultry day, when the show opened at a village in a pocket of Green Hills, indeed its name was Green Hill, and Sidney Lord went to see it. Margaret, who had schooled herself to look upon her audience as if they were not, suddenly comprehended among them another soul who understood her own. She met the eyes of the man, and a wonderful comfort, as of a cool breeze blowing over the face of clear water, came to her. She knew that the man understood. She knew that she had his fullest sympathy. She saw also a comrade in the toils of comic tragedy, for Sidney Lord was in the same case. He was a mountain of flesh— as a matter of fact, had he not been known in Greenhill, and respected as a man of weight of character as well as of body, and of an old family, he would have rivaled Margaret. Beside him sat an elderly woman, sweet-faced, slightly bent as to her slender shoulders, as if with a chronic attitude of submission. She was Sidney's widowed sister, Ellen Waters. She lived with her brother and kept his house, and had no will other than his. Sidney Lord and his sister remained when the rest of the audience had drifted out, after the privileged handshakes with the queen of the show. Every time a coarse, rustic hand reached familiarity after Margaret's, Sidney shrank. He motioned his sister to remain seated when he approached the stage. Jack Desmond, who had been exploiting Margaret, gazed at him with admiring curiosity. Sidney waved him away with a commanding gesture. "'I wish to speak to her a moment. Pray leave the tent,' he said, and Jack obeyed. People always obeyed Sidney Lord. Sidney stood before Margaret, and he saw the clear crystal which was herself, within all the flesh, clad in a tawdry raiment, and she knew that he saw it. "'Good God!' said Sidney. "'You are a lady.' He continued to gaze at her, and his eyes, large and brown, became blurred. At the same time his mouth tightened. "'How came you to be in such a place as this?' demanded Sidney. He spoke almost as if he were angry with her. Margaret explained briefly. "'It is an outrage,' declared Sidney. He said it, however, rather absently. He was reflecting. "'Where do you live?' he asked. "'Here.' 
"'You mean, they make up a bed for me here, after the people have gone. "'And I suppose you had, before this, a comfortable house. "'The house which my grandfather Lee owned, the old Lee Mansion House, before we went to the city. "'It was a very fine old colonial house,' explained Margaret, in her finely modulated voice. "'And you had a good room?' The southeast chamber had always been mine. It was very large, and the furniture was old Spanish mahogany. And now, said Sidney. Yes, said Margaret. She looked at him, and her serious blue eyes seemed to see past him. It will not last, she said. What do you mean? I try to learn a lesson. I am a child in the school of God. My lesson is one that always ends in peace. Good God, said Sidney. He motioned to his sister, and Ellen approached in a frightened fashion. Her brother could do no wrong, but this was the unusual, and alarmed her. "'This lady,' began Sidney. "'Miss Lee,' said Margaret. "'I was never married. I am Miss Margaret Lee.' "'This,' said Sidney, "'is my sister Ellen, Mrs. Waters. Ellen, I wish you to meet Miss Lee.' Ellen took into her own Margaret's hand, and said feebly that it was a beautiful day, and she hoped Miss Lee found Greenhill a pleasant place to— visit. Sidney moved slowly out of the tent and found Jack Desmond. He was standing near with Camille, who looked her best in a pale blue summer silk and a black hat trimmed with roses. Jack and Camille never really knew how the great man had managed, but presently Margaret had gone away with him and his sister. Jack and Camille looked at each other. "'Oh, Jack, ought you to have let her go?' said Camille. "'What made you let her go?' asked Jack. "'I—' "'Don't know. I couldn't say anything. That man has a tremendous way with him. Goodness!' "'He is all right here in the place, anyhow,' said Jack. "'They look up to him. He is a big bug here. Comes of a family like Margaret's, though he hasn't got much money. Some chaps were bragging that they had a bigger show than her right here, and I found out.' "'Suppose,' said Camille, "'Margaret does not come back.' "'He could not keep her without being arrested,' declared Jack, but he looked uneasy.' He had, however, looked uneasy for some time. The fact was, Margaret had been very gradually losing weight. Moreover, she was not well. That very night, after the show was over, Bill Stark, the dark little man, had a talk with the Desmonds about it. "'Truth is, before long, if you don't look out, you'll have to pad her,' said Bill. "'And giants don't amount to a row of pins after that begins.' Camille looked worried and sulky. "'She ain't very well, anyhow,' said she. I ain't going to kill Margaret. It's a good thing she's got a chance to have a night's rest in a house, said Bill Stark. The fat man has asked her to stay with him and his sister. Well, the show is here, said Jack. The sister invited her, said Camille, with a little stiffness. She was common, but she had lived with Lees, and her mother had married a Lee. She knew what was due Margaret, and also due herself. The truth is, said Camille, this is an awful sort of life for a woman like Margaret, she and her folks were never used to anything like it. "'Why didn't you make your beauty husband hustle, and take care of her and you, then?' demanded Bill, who admired Camille, and disliked her because she had no eyes for him. "'My husband has been unfortunate. He has done the best he could,' responded Camille. "'Come, Jack, no use talking about it any longer. Guess Margaret will pick up. Come along, I'm tired out.' That night Margaret Lee slept in a sweet chamber with muslin curtains at the windows, in a massive old mahogany bed, much like hers which had been sacrificed at an auction sale. The bed linen was linen and smelled of lavender. Margaret was too happy to sleep. She lay in the cool, fragrant sheets and was happy, and convinced of the presence of the God to whom she had prayed. All night Sidney Lord sat downstairs in his book-walled sanctum and studied over the situation. It was a crucial one. The great psychological moment of Sidney Lord's life for night errantry had arrived. He studied the thing from every point of view. There was no romance about it. These were hard, sordid, tragic, ludicrous facts with which he had to deal. He knew to a nicety the agonies which Margaret suffered. He knew because of his own capacity for sufferings of like stress. And she is a woman and a lady, he said aloud. If Sidney had been rich enough, the matter would have been simple. He could have paid Jack and Camille enough to quiet them, and Margaret could have lived with him and his sister and their two old servants but he was not rich. He was even poor. The price to be paid for Margaret's liberty was a bitter one, but it was that or nothing. Sidney faced it. He looked about the room. 
to him the walls lined with the dull gleams of old books were lovely there was an oil portrait of his mother over the mantel shelf the weather was warm now and there was no need for a hearth fire but how exquisitely homelike and dear that room could be when the snow drove outside and there was the leap of flame in the hearth sydney was a scholar and a gentleman he had led a gentle and sequestered life here in his native village there was none to jibe and sneer the contrast of the travelling show would be as great for him as it had been for margaret but he was the male of the species and she the female chivalry racial harking back to the beginning of nobility in the human to its earliest dawn fired sydney the pale daylight invaded the study sydney as truly as any knight of old had girded himself and with no hope, no thought of reward, for the battle in the eternal service of the strong for the weak, which makes the true worth of the strong. There was only one way. Sidney Lord took it. His sister was spared the knowledge of the truth for a long while. When she knew, she did not lament. Since Sidney had taken the course, it must be right. As for Margaret, not knowing the truth, she yielded. She was really on the verge of illness. Her spirit was of too fine a strain to enable her body to endure long. When she was told that she was to remain with Sidney's sister, while Sidney went away on business, she made no objection. A wonderful sense of relief, as of wings of healing being spread under her despair, was upon her. Camille came to bid her good-bye. "'I hope you have a nice visit in this lovely house,' said Camille, and kissed her. Camille was astute and to be trusted she did not betray sydney's confidence sydney used a disguise a dark wig over his partially bald head and a little make-up and he travelled about with the show and sat on three chairs and shook hands with the gaping crowd and was curiously happy it was discomfort it was ignominy it was maddening to support by the exhibition of his physical deformity a perfectly worthless young couple like jack and camille desmond but it was all superbly ennobling for the man himself. Always as he sat on his three chairs, immense, grotesque, the more grotesque for his splendid dignity of bearing, there was in his soul of a gallant gentleman the consciousness of that other whom he was shielding from a similar ordeal. Compassion and generosity, so great that they comprehended love itself and excelled its highest type, irradiated the whole being of the fat man exposed to the gaze of his inferiors chivalry which rendered him almost godlike strengthened him for his task sydney thought always of margaret as distinct from her physical self a sort of crystalline angelic soul with no encumbrance of earth he achieved a purely spiritual conception of her and margaret living again by her gentle lady life was likewise ennobled by a gratitude which transformed her always a clear and beautiful soul she gave out new lights of character like a jewel in the sun and she also thought of sydney as distinct from his physical self the consciousness of the two human beings one of the other was a consciousness as of two wonderful lines of good and beauty moving forever parallel separate and inseparable in an eternal harmony of spirit end of noblesse recording by rosie Humoresque by Fanny Hurst. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Humoresque by Fanny Hurst. For the American Women's Literature Collection. On either side of the Bowery, which cuts through like a drain to catch its sewage, every man's land a reeking march of humanity and humidity steams with the excrement of seventeen language flung in patois from tenement windows fire escapes curbs stoops and cellars whose walls are terrible and spongy with fungi by that impregnable chemistry of race whereby the red blood of the mongolian and the red blood of the caucasian become as oil and water in the mingling mulberry street bounded by sixteen languages runs its intact latin length of push-carts clothes-lines naked babies drying vermicelli black-eyed women in rhinestone combs and perennially big with child whole families of buttonhole makers who first saw the blue and gold light of sorrento bent at homework round a single gas flare 
pomaded barbers of a thousand Neapolitan amours. And then, just as suddenly, almost without osmosis, and by the mere stepping down from the curb, Mulberry becomes Mott Street, hung in grillwork balconies, the mouldy smell of poverty touched up with incense. Orientals whose feet shuffle, and whose faces are carved out of satin wood. Forbidden women, their white, drugged faces, behind upper windows. Yellow children, incongruous enough in western clothing. A draughty areaway with an oblique of gaslight and a black well of descending staircase. Show windows of jade and tea and Chinese porcelains. More streets emanating out from Mott like a handful of crooked rheumatic fingers, then suddenly the Bowery again, cowering beneath elevated trains, where men burned down to the butt end of soiled lives, pass in and out and out and in of the knee-high swinging doors, a veiny-nosed, acid-eaten race in themselves. Allen Street, too, still more easterly and half as wide, is straddled its entire width by the steely, long-legged skeleton of elevated traffic, so that its third-floor windows no sooner shudder into silence from the rushing shock of one train than they are shaken into chatter by the passage of another. Indeed, third-floor dwellers of Allen Street, reaching out, can almost touch the serrated edges of the elevated structure, and in summer the smell of its hot rails becomes an actual taste in the mouth. Passengers, in turn, look in upon this horizontal of life as they whiz by. Once, in fact, the blurry figure of what might have been a woman leaned out, as she passed, to toss into one Abraham Cantor's apartment a short-stemmed pink carnation. It hit softly on little Leon Cantor's crib, brushing him fragrantly across the mouth and causing him to pucker up. Beneath, where even in August noonday the sun cannot find its way by a chink, and babies lie stark naked in the cavernous shade, Allen Street presents a sort of submarine and greenish gloom, as if its humanity were actually moving through a sea of aqueous shadows, faces rather bleached and shrunk from sunlessness as water can bleach and shrink, and then, like a shimmering background of orange vent and copper flanked, marine life the brass shops of allen street whole rows of them burn flamelessly and without benefit of fuel to enter abram cantor's brasses was three steps down so that his casement show-window at best filmed over with a constant rain of dust ground down from the rails above was obscure enough but crammed with copied loot of khediv and czar the seven branch candlestick so biblical and supplicating of arms, an urn shaped like Rebecca's, of brass, all beaten over with little pox, things, cups, trays, knockers, icons, gargoyles, bowls, and teapots, a symphony of bells in graduated sizes, jardinieres with fat sides, a pot-bellied samovar, a swinging lamp for the dead, star-shaped, against the door an octave of tubular chimes, prisms of voiceless harmony and of heatless light. Opening this door, they rang gently, like melody heard through water and behind glass. Another bell rang, too, in tilted sing-song from a pulley operating somewhere in the catacomb, rear of this lambent veil of things and things and things. In turn, this pulley set in toll still another bell, two flights up in abram cantor's tenement which overlooked the front of whizzing rails and a rear wilderness of gibbet-looking clothes-lines dangling perpetual spectres of flapping union suits in a mid-air flaky with soot often at lunch or even the evening meal this bell would ring in on abram cantor's digestive well-being and while he hurried down napkin often bib fashion still about his neck and into the smouldering lanes of copper would leave an eloquent void at the head of his well-surrounded table the bell was ringing now jingling in upon the slumber of a still newer cantor snuggling peacefully enough within the ammoniac depths of a cradle recently evacuated by leon heretofore impinged upon you 
On her knees, before an oven that billowed forth hotly into her face, Mrs. Cantor, fairly fat and not yet forty, at the, and at the immemorable task of plumbing a delicately swelling layer cake with broom straw, raised her face, reddened and faintly moist. Isidore, run down and say your papa is out until six. If it's a customer, remember the first asking price is the two middle figures on the tag, and the last asking price is the two outside figures. See once with your papa out to buy your little brother his birthday present and your mother in a cake if you can't make a sale for first price isidore cantor aged eleven and hunched with a younger cantor over an oilcloth covered table hunched himself still deeper in a barter for a large crystal marble with a candy stripe down its centre izzy did you hear me yes am go down this minute do you hear Rudolph, stop always letting your big brother get the best of you in marbles. Izzy, don't let me have to ask you again. Isidore Cantor. Ah, ma, I got some arithmetic to do. Let Esther go. Always Esther. Your sister stays right in the front room with her spelling. Ah, ma, I get spelling too. Every time I ask that boy he should do me one thing, right away he gets lessons. With me, that lessons talk don't go no more. Every time you get put down in school, I'm surprised there's a place left lower where they can put you. Working papers for such a boy like you. I'll wake. How I worried myself. Violin lessons yet. Thirty cents a lesson out of your papa's pants while he slept. That's how I wanted to have in the family a profession. Maybe a musician on the violin. Lesson for you out of money I had to lie to your papa about. Honest, when I think of it. My own husband. It's a wonder I don't punch you just for remembering it. Rudolph, will you stop licking that cake pan? It's safe for your little brother, Leon. Ain't you ashamed even on your little brother's birthday to steal from him? Ma, give me the spoon. I'll give you the spoon, Isidore Cantor, where you don't want it. If you don't hurry down, the way that bell is ringing, not one bite do you get out of your little brother's birthday cake tonight. I'm going, ain't I? Always on my children's birthdays, a meanness sets into this house. Rudolph, will you put down that bowl? Izzy, for the last time, I ask you, for the last time. Erect now, Mrs. Cantor lifted an expressive hand, letting it hover. I'm going, Ma, for golly's sake, I'm going, said her recalcitrant one, shuffling off toward the staircase, shuffling shuffling then mrs cantor resumed her plumbing and through the little apartment its middle and only bedroom of three beds and a crib lighted vicariously by the front room and kitchen began to wind the warm the golden-brown fragrance of cake in the rising by six o'clock the shades were drawn against the dirty dusk of allen street and the oilcloth covered table dragged out centre and spread by esther cantor nine in years in the sturdy little legs bulging over shoe-tops in the pink cheeks that sagged slightly of plumpness and in the utter roundness of face and gaze but mysteriously older in the little mother lore of crib and knee-dandling ditties and in the ropey length and thickness of the two brown plates down her back there was an eloquence to that waiting laid-out table the print of the family already gathered about it the dynastic high chair throne of each succeeding cantor an armchair drawn up before the paternal moustache cup the ordinary kitchen chair of manny cantor who spilled things an oilcloth sort of bib dangling from its back the little chair of leon cantor cushioned in an old family album that raised his chin above the table even in cutlery the cantor family was not lacking in variety surrounding a centerpiece of thick russian lace were russian spoons washed in washed off gilt forks of one two and three tines steel knives with black handles a hartshorn carving knife thick-lipped china in stacks before the armchair a round four-pound loaf of black bread waiting to be torn and to-night on the festive mat of cotton lace a cake of pinkly gleaming icing, encircled with five pink little candles. 
At slightly after six, Abram Cantor returned, leading by a resisting wrist, Leon Cantor, his stem-like little legs, hit midship, as it were, by not sufficiently cut-down trousers and so narrow and bird-like of face that his eyes quite obliterated the remaining map of his features, like those of a still-wet nesting, all except his ears. They poised at the sides of Leon's shaved head of black bristles, as if butterflies had just lighted there, whispering, with very spread wings, their message, and presently would fly off again. By some sort of muscular contraction he could wiggle these ears at will, and would do so for a penny or a whistle, and upon one occasion for his brother Rudolph's dead rat, so devised as to dangle from string and window before the unhappy passer-by. They were quivering now, these ears, but because the entire little face was twitching back tears and gulps of sobs. Abram? Leon? What is it? Her hands and her forearms instantly out from the business of kneading something meaty and flowery. Miss Cantor rushed forward, her glance quick from one to the other of them. Abram, what's wrong? I'll feedle him. I'll feedle him. The little pulling wrist still in clutch, Mr. Cantor regarded his wife, the lower half of his face well covered with reddish bristles, undershot, his free hand and even his eyes violently lifted. To those who see in a man a perpetual kinship to that animal kingdom of which he is supreme, there was something undeniably anthropoidal about Abram Cantor, a certain simian width between the eyes and long, rather agile hands with hairy backs. Hush it! cried Mr. Conter, his free hand raised in threat of descent, and covering his small son to still more undersized proportions. Hush it, or by golly, I'll— Abram? Abram? What is it? Then Mr. Cantor gave vent in acridity of word and feature. Schlemiel, he, he cried, Mamzer, Ganif, Nebish, by which, in smiting mother tongue, he branded his offspring with attributes of apostate and ne'er-do-well, of idiot and thief. Abram! Schlemiel! repeated Mr. Cantor, swinging Leon so that he described a large semicircle that landed him into the meaty and waiting embrace of his mother. Take him! You should be proud of such a little mumser for a son. Take him! And here you got back his birthday dollar. A fetal, honest. When I think of it, a fetal. <laughs> Such a rush of outrage seemed fairly to strangle Mr. Cantor, that he stood, hands still upraised, choking and inarticulate, above the now frankly howling huddle of his son. Abram, you should just once touch this child. How he trembles! Leon, Mama's baby, what is it? Is this how you come back when Papa takes you out to buy your birthday present? Ain't you ashamed? Mouth distended to a large and blackly hollow, oh, Leon, between terrifying spells of breath-holding, continued to howl. All the way to Naphtal's toy store I drank him. A birthday present for a dollar his mother wants he should have, all right. A birthday present. I give you my word till I'm ashamed for Naphtal. Every toy in his shells is pulled down. Such a cow that shakes with his head. No, no, no. This from young Leon, beating at his mother's skirts. Again, the upraised but never quite descending hand of his father. By golly, I'll no know you. Abram, go away. Baby, what did Papa do? Then Mr. Cantor broke into an actual tarantella of rage, his hands palms up and dancing. "'What did Papa do?' she asked. She's got easy asking. "'What did Papa do? The whole shop, I tell you. A sheep with a baw inside when you squeeze on him. Games. A horn so he can holler my head off. Such a knife, like Izzy's with a scissors in it. "'Leon,' I said, ashamed for Nafo. "'That's a fine knife like Izzy's so you can cut up with. All right, then when i see how he hollers such a box full of soldiers to have war with dollar seventy five says naftal all right then i says when i seen how he keeps hollering keep you a dollar fifteen for em 
I should make myself small for fifteen cents more. Dollar fifteen, I says. Anything so he should shut up with his hollering for what he seen in the window. He seen something in the window he wanted, Abram? Didn't I tell you? A fiddle, a four-dollar fiddle a musiker so we should have another fiddler in the family for some thirty cents lessons abram you mean he our leon wanted a violin wanted she says i could potch him again this minute for how he wanted it do you little bum you chammer mumser i'll fiddle you across mrs cantor's face as she knelt there in the shapeless cotton stuff uniform of poverty through the very tenement of her body, a light had flashed up into her eyes. She drew her son closer, crushing his puny cheek again, up against hers, cupping his bristly little head in her by no means immaculate palms. "'You wanted a violin! It's come, Abram! The dream of all my life! My prayers! It's come! I knew it must be one of my children if I waited long enough and prayed enough! A musician!' He wants a violin. He cried for a violin, my baby. Why, darling, mamma'll sell her clothes off her back to get you a violin. He's a musician, Abram. I should have known it, the way he's fooling always around the chimes and the bells in the store. Then Mr. Cantor took to rocking his head between his palms. Ay, ay, the mother is crazier as her son. A musician. A fresher, you mean. Such an eater. It's a wonder he ain't twice too big instead of twice too little for his age. That's a sign, Abram. Geniuses, they all eat big. For all we know, he's a genius. I swear to you, Abram. All the months before he was born, I prayed for it. Each one before they came, I prayed it should be the one. I thought that time the way our Isidore ran after the organ grinder, he would be the one. How could I know it was the monkey he wanted? When Isidore wouldn't take to it, I prayed my next one, and then my next one should have the talent. I've prayed for it, Abram. If he wants a violin, please, he should have it. Not with my money. With mine. I've got enough saved, Abram. Them three extra dollars right here inside my own weights. Just that much for that cape down on Grand Street. I wouldn't have it now the way they say the wind blows up them. I tell you the woman's crazy. I feel it. I know he's got talent. I know my children so well. A, a father don't understand. I'm so next to them. It's like I can tell always everything that will happen to them. It's like a pain somewhere here, like in back of my heart. A pain in the heart she gets. For my own children, I'm always a prophet, I tell you. You think I don't know that? That terrible night after the pogrom, after we got out of Kiev to across the border. You remember, Abram, how I predicted it to you then. How our money would be born too soon, and not right for my suffering. Did it happen on the ship to America, just the way I said it would? Did it happen just exactly how I predicted our Izzy would break his leg that time playing on the fire escape? I tell you, Abram. I get a real pain here under my heart that tells me what comes to my children. Didn't I tell you how Esther would be the first in her confirmation class, and our baby Boris would be red-headed? At only five years, our Leon, all by himself, cries for a fiddle. Get it for him, Abram. Get it for him. I tell you, Sarah, I got a crazy woman for a wife. It ain't enough we celebrate eight birthdays a year with one-dollar presents each time and copper goods every day higher. It ain't enough that right tomorrow I got a fifty-dollar note over me from Sol Ginsberg. A four-dollar present she wants for a child that don't even know the name of a fiddle. Leon, baby, stop hollering. Papa will go back and get the fiddle for you now before supper. See, Mama's got money here in her waist. Papa will go back for the fiddle, not. Three dollars she saved for herself. He can holler out of her for a fiddle. Abram, he's screaming, so he, he'll he have a fit. He should have two fits. Darling. I tell you the way you spoil your children, it will some day come back on us. It's his birthday night, Abram. 
five years since his little head first lay on the pillow next to me. All right, all right, drive me crazy because he's got a birthday. Leon, baby, if you don't stop hollering, you'll make yourself sick. Abram, I never saw him like this. He is green. I'll green him. Where is that old fiddle for Isidore, that seventy-five cents one? I never thought of that. You broke it that time you got mad at Isidore's lessons. I'll run down. Maybe it's with the junk behind the store. I never thought of that fiddle. Leon, darling, wait. Mama'll run down and look. Wait, Leon, till Mama finds you a fiddle. The raucous screams stopped then, suddenly, and on their very lustiest crest, leaving an echoing gash across silence. On willing feet of haste, Mrs. Cantor wound down backward the high, ladder-like staircase that led to the brass shop. Meanwhile, to a gnawing consciousness of dinner hour, had assembled the house of Cantor. Attuned to the intimate atmosphere of the tenement, which is so constantly rent with cry of child, childbearing, delirium, delirium tremens, Leon Cantor had howled no impression into the motley den of things. There were Isidore, already astride his chair, leaning well into center table, for first vociferous tear at the four-pound loaf. Esther, old at chores, settling an infant into the high chair, careful of tiny fingers in lowering the wooden bib. Izzy's eating first again. Put down that loaf and wait until your mother dishes up, or you'll get a potch you won't soon forget. Say pop. Don't say pop me. I don't want no street bum freshness from you. I mean, Papa, there was an uptown swell in, and she brought one of them seventy-five cent candlesticks for the first price. Shlamil, chamer, said Mr. Cantor, rinsing his hands at the sink. Didn't I always tell you it's the first price, times two, when you see uptown business come in? Haven't I learned it to you often enough a slummer must pay for her nosiness? They entered then, on poor shuffling feet. Manny Cantor, so marred in the mysterious and ceramic process of life that the brain and the soul had stayed back sooner than inhabit him, seventeen in years, in the down upon his face, and in growth unretarded by any great nervosity of system, his vacuity of face was not that of childhood, but rather as if his light eyes were peering out from some hinterland, and wanting so terribly and so dumbly to communicate what they beheld to brain cells closed against himself. At sight of Manny, Leon Cantor, the tears still wetly and dirtily down his cheeks, left off his black, fierce-eyed stare of waiting long enough to smile darkly, it is true, but sweetly. Giddy up! he cried. Giddy up! And then Manny, true to habit, would scamper and scamper. Up out of the trap-like stair-opening came the head of Mrs. Cantor, disheveled, and a smudge of soot across her face, but beneath her arm, triumphant, a violin of one string and a broken back. See, Leon, what Mama got? A violin, a fiddle. Look, the boat, too, I found. It ain't much, baby, but it's a fiddle. Ah, Ma, that's my old violin. Gimme, I want it. Where'd you find? Hush up, Easy. This ain't yours no more. See, Leon, what Mama brought you? A violin. Now, you little chairman, you got a fiddle. And if you ever let me hear you holler again for a fiddle, by golly, if I don't. From his corner, Leon Cantor reached out, taking the instrument and fitting it beneath his chin, the bow immediately feeling, surely and lightly, for string. Look, Abram, he knows how to hold it. What did I tell you? A child that never in his life seen a fiddle, except a beggar's on the street. Little Esther suddenly cantered down floor, clapping her chubby hands. Looky, looky, Leon! The baby ceased, clattering his spoon against the wooden bib. A silence seemed to shape itself. So black and so bristly of head, his little claw-like hands hovering over the bow, Leon Cantor withdrew a note, strangely round and given up, almost sobbingly from the single string, a note of warm twining quality like a baby's finger. Leon, darling, 
fumbling for string and for notes the instrument could not yield up to him the bird-like mouth began once more to open widely and terribly into the orificial o oh. it was then abram cantor came down with a large hollow resonance of palm against that aperture lifting his small son and depositing him plop upon the family album take that by golly one more whimper out of you and if i don't make you black and blue birthday or no birthday dish up sarah quick or i'll give him something to cry about the five pink candles had been lighted burning pointedly and with slender little smoke wisps regarding them owlishly the tears dried on leon's face his little tongue licking up at them look how solemn he is like he was thinking of something a million miles away except how lucky he is he should have a pink birthday cake uh 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 don't you begin to holler again here i'm putting the fiddle next to you uh 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 to a meal plentifully ladled out directly from stove to table the cantor family drew up dipping first into the rich black soup of the occasion all except mrs cantor esther you dish up i'm going somewhere i'll be back in a minute where are you going sarah won't it keep until but even in the face of query sarah cantor was two flights down and well through the lambent aisles of the copper shop outside she broke into a run along two blocks of the indescribable bizarre atmosphere of grand street then one block to the right before mattel's show window a jet of bright gas burned into a gibberwock land of toys there was that in sarah cantor's face that was actually lyrical as fumbling at the bosom of her dress she entered to leon cantor by who knows what symphonic scheme of things life was a chromatic scale yielding up to him through throbbing living nerves of sheep gut the sheerest semitones of man's emotions when he tucked his stradivarius beneath his chin the book of life seemed suddenly translated to him in melody even sarah cantor who still brewed for him on a portable stove carried from city to city and surreptitiously unpacked in hotel suites the blackest of soups and despite his protestation would encase his ears of nights in an old home-made device against their flightiness would oftentimes bleed inwardly at the sense of his isolation there was a realm into which he went alone leaving her as detached as the merest ticket purchaser at the box office at seventeen leon cantor had played before the crowned heads of europe the aching heads of american capital and even the shaved head of a south sea prince there was a layout of anecdotal gifts from the molar tooth of the south sea prince set in a south sea pearl to a blue enameled snuff-box encrusted with the rearing lion coat of arms of a very royal house at eighteen came the purchase of a king's stradivarius for a king's ransom and acclaimed by sunday supplements to repose of nights in an ivory cradle at nineteen under careful auspices of press agent the ten singing digits of the son of abram cantor were insured at ten thousand dollars the finger at twenty he had emerged surely and safely from the perilous quicksands which have sucked down whole lilliputian worlds of infant prodigies at twenty-one when leon cantor played a sunday night concert there was a human queue curling entirely around the square block of the opera house waiting its one two even three and four hours for the privilege of standing room only usually these were leon cantor's own people pouring up from the lowly lands of the east side to the white lands of broadway parched for music these burning brethren of his old men in that line frequently carrying their own little folding camp chairs not against weariness of the spirit but of the flesh youth with slavic eyes and cheekbones these were the six deep human phalanx which would presently slant down at him from tiers of steepest balconies and stand frankly emotional and jammed in the unreserved space behind the railing which shut them off from the three-dollar seats of the reserved at a very special one of these concerts dedicated to the meagre purses of just these and held in new york's super opera house 
the amphitheatre a great bowl of humanity the metaphor made perfect by tiers of seats placed upon the stage rose from orchestra to dome a gigantic cup of a coliseum lined in stacks and stacks of faces from the door of his dressing-room leaning out leon cantor could see a great segment of it buzzing down into adjustment orchestra twitting and tuning into it in the bare little room illuminated by a sheaf of roses just arrived mrs cantor drew him back by the elbow leon you're in a drought the amazing years had dealt kindly with mrs cantor stouter softer apparently even taller she was full of small new authorities that could shut out cranks newspaper reporters and autograph fiends a fitted over corsets black taffeta and a high comb in the graying hair had done their best with her pride too had left its flush upon her cheeks like two round spots of fever leon it's thirty minutes till your first number close that door do you want to let your papa and his excitement in on you the son of sarah cantor obeyed leaning his short rather narrow form in silhouette against the closed door in spite of slimly dark evening clothes worked out by an astute manager to the last detail in boyish effects there was that about him which defied long-haired precedent slimly and straightly he had shot up into an unmannered a short even a bristly-haired young manhood disqualifying by a close shave for the older school of her suit virtuosity but his nerves did not spare him on concert nights they seemed to emerge almost to the surface of him and shriek their exposure. Just feel my hands, Ma, like ice. She dived down into her large silk whatnot of a reticule. I've got your fleece-lined gloves here, son. No, no, for God's sake, not those things. No. He was back at the door again, opening it to a slit, peering through. They're bringing more seats on the stage. If they crowd me in, I won't go on. I can't play if I hear them breathe. Hi out there no more chairs pa hancock leon leon ain't you ashamed to get so worked up close that door have you got a manager who is paid just to see to your comfort when papa comes i'll have him go out and tell hancock you don't want chairs so close to you leon will you mind mamma and sit down it's a bigger house than the royal concert in madrid ma why i never saw anything like it it's a stampede god this is real this is what gets me playing for my own i should have given a concert like this three years ago i'll do it every year now i'd rather play before them than all the crowned heads on earth it's the biggest night of my life they're rioting out there ma rioting to get in leon leon won't you sit down if mamma begs you to he sat then strumming with all ten fingers upon his knees try to get quiet son count like you always do one two three please ma for god's sake please please look such beautiful roses from saul ginsburg an old friend of papa's used to buy brasses from eighteen years ago six years he's been away with his daughter in munich such a beautiful mezzo they say engaged already for metropolitan next season i hate it ma if they breathe on my neck leon darling did mamma promise to fix it have i ever let you play a concert when you wouldn't be comfortable his long slim hands suddenly prehensile and cutting a streak of upward gesture leon cantor rose to his feet face whitening do it now now i tell you i won't have them breathe on me do you hear me now 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 risen also her face soft and tremulous for him mrs cantor put out a gentle a sedative hand upon his sleeve son she said with an edge of authority even behind her smile don't holler at me he grasped her hand with his two and immediately quiet lay a close string of kisses along it mamma 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 i know son eats nurse they eat me ma feel i'm like ice i didn't mean it you know i didn't mean it my baby 
she said my wonderful boy it's like i can never get used to the wonder of having you the greatest one of them all should be mine a plain woman's like mine he teased her eager to conciliate and to ride down his own state of quivering now ma now now don't forget rinsky rinsky a man three times your age who was playing concert before you were born is that a comparison from your clippings books i can show you rimsky who the world considers the greatest violinist rimsky he rubs into me all right then the press clippings but did elsas the greatest manager of them all bring me a contract for thirty concerts at two thousand a concert now i've got you now she would not meet his laughter elsas believe me he'll come to you yet my boy should worry if he makes fifty thousand a year more or less. Rimsky should have that honor for so long as he can hold it, but he won't hold it long. Believe me, I don't rest easy in my bed till Elsass comes after you, not for so big a contract like Rimsky's, but bigger, not for thirty concerts, but for fifty. Brava, brava, there's a woman for you more money than she knows what to do with and then not satisfied still she was still too tremulous for banter not satisfied why leon i never stop praying my thanks for you all right then he cried laying his icy fingers on her cheek to-morrow we'll call it a mignon a regular old-fashioned allen street prayer party leon you mustn't make fun make fun of the sweetest girl in this room girl ah if i could only hold you by me this way leon always a boy with me your poor old mother your only girl that's a fear i suffer with you leon to lose you to a girl that's how selfish the mother of such a wonder child like mine can get to be all right trying to get me married off again nice fine is it any wonder i suffer son Twenty-one years to have kept you by me a child, a boy that never in his life was out after midnight except to catch trains, a boy that never has so much as looked at a girl, and could have looked at princesses, to have kept you all these years. Mine, is it any wonder, son, I never stop praying my thanks for you. You don't believe Hancock, son, the way he keeps always teasing you that you should have a what he calls affair a love affair such talk is not nice leon an affair love affair poppycock said leon cantor lifting his mother's face and kissing her on eyes about ready to tear why i've got something ma right here in my heart for you that leon be careful your shirt front that's so so what you call tender for my best sweetheart that i Oh, love affair, poppycock. She would not let her tears come. My boy, my wonder boy. There goes the overture, ma. Here, darling, your glass of water. I can't stand it in here. I'm suffocating. Got your mute in your pocket, son? Yes, ma. For God's sake, yes. Yes, don't keep asking things. Ain't you ashamed, Leon, to be in such an excitement? For every concert, you get worse. The chairs, they'll breathe on my neck. Leon, did Mama promise you those chairs would be moved? Where's Hancock? Say, I'm grateful if he stays out. It took me enough work to get this room cleared. You know your papa, how he likes to drag in the whole world to show you off, always just before you play. The minute he walks in the room, right away he gets everybody to trembling just from his own excitements. I dare him this time he should bring people. No dignity has that man got, the way he brings everyone. Even upon her words came a rattling of door, of doorknob, and a voice through the clamor. Open quick, Sarah. Leon. A stiffening raced over Mrs. Cantor, so that she sat rigid on her chair edge, lips compressed, eye darkly upon the shivering door open sarah with a narrowing glance mrs cantor laid to her lips a forefinger of silence sarah it's me 
quick, I say. Then Leon Cantor sprang up, the old prehensile gesture of curving fingers shooting up. For God's sake, Ma, let him in. I can't stand that infernal battering. Abram, go away. Leon's got to have quiet before his concert. Just a minute, Sarah. Open quick. With a spring, his son was at the door, unlocking and flinging it back. Come in, Pa. The years had weighed heavily upon Abram Cantor, in Avour du Bois only. He was himself plus eighteen years, fifty pounds, and a new sleek pomposity that was absolutely oleagnous. It shone roundly in his face, doubling of chin, in the bulge of waistcoat, heavily gold-chained, and in eyes that behind the gold-rimmed glasses gave sparkling forth his estate of well-being. Abram! Didn't I tell you not to dare to? On excited balls of feet that fairly bounced him, Abram Cantor burst in. Leon, Mama, I got out here an old friend, Saul Ginsberg. You remember Mama from Brasses? Abram, not now. Go away with your not now. I want Leon should meet him. Saul, this is him. A little grown up from such a nebbage like you remember him, no? Sarah, you remember Saul, Ginsburg. Say, I should ask you if you remember your right hand. Ginsburg and Essel, the firm. This is his girl. A five years contract signed yesterday. Five hundred dollars an opera for a beginner. Six rolls. Not bad, no. Abra, you must ask Mr. Ginsburg, please, to excuse Leon until after his concert. Shake hands with him, Ginsburg. He's had his hand shook enough in his life, and by kings, to shake it once more with an old bouncer like you. Mr. Ginsburg, not unlike his colleague in rotundities, held out a short, a dimpled hand. It's a proud day, he said, for me to take the hands from mine old friend's son and the finest violinist living today, my little daughter. Yes, yes, Gina. Here, shake hands with him, Leon. They say a voice like a fountain. Gina Berg, eh? Ginsburg. Is how you stage named her? You hear, Mama, how fancy. Gina Berg. We go hear her, eh? There was about Miss Gina Berg, whose voice could soar to the tiralera of a lark, and then deepen to mezzo, something of the actual slimness of the poor, maligned Elsa, so long buried beneath the buxomness of divas. She was like a little flower that in its crannied nook keeps dewy longest. How do you do, Leon Cantor? There was a whir through her English of three acquired languages. How do you do? We, father and I, travelled once all the way from Brussels to Dresden to hear you. It was worth it. I shall never forget how you played the humoresque. It made me laugh and cry. You like Brussels? She laid her little hand to her heart, half closing her eyes. I will never be so happy again as with the sweet little people of Brussels. I, too, love Brussels. I studied there four years with Ehrenfest. I know you did. My teacher, Lindahl, in Berlin, was his brother-in-law. You have studied with Lindahl? He is my master. I, will I some time hear you sing? I am not yet great. When I am foremost like you, yes. Gina, Gina Burke, that is a beautiful name to make famous. You see how it is done? Gins, Burke, Gina, Burke. Clever. They stood then, smiling across a chasm of the diffidence of youth, she fumbling at the great fur pelt out of which her face flowered so dewily. I, well, we, we... we are in the fourth box. I guess we had better be going. Fourth box. Left. He wanted to find words, but for consciousness of self could not. It's a wonderful house they're waiting for you, Leon Cantor. And you, you're wonderful, too. The flowers. Thanks. My father, he sent them. Come, father, quick. Suddenly there was a tight tensity seemed to crowd up the little room. Abram. Quick, get Hancock. That first row of chairs has got to be moved. There he is, in the wings. See that piano ain't dragged down too far. Leon, got your mute in your pocket. 
please mr ginsburg you must excuse here leon is your glass of water drink it i say shut that door up there boy so there ain't a draught in the wings here leon your violin got your neckerchief listen how they're shouting it's for you leon darling go the centre of that vast human bowl which had shouted itself out slim boylike and in his supreme isolation leon cantor drew bow and a first thin pellucid and perfect note into a silence breathless to receive it throughout the arduous flexuosities of the mendelssohn e minor concerto singing winding from tonal to tonal climax and out of the slow movement which is like a tourniquet twisting the heart into the spirited allegro molto vivace it was as if beneath leon cantor's fingers the strings were living vein chords youth vitality and the very foam of exuberance racing through them that was the power of him the fichy and the sparkle of youth so that playing the melody poured round him like wine and went down seething and singing into the hearts of his hearers later and because these were his people and because they were dark and slavic with his slavic darkness he played as if his very blood were weeping the kol nidre which is the prayer of his race for atonement and then the super amphitheater filled with those whose emotions lie next to the surface and whose pores have not been closed over with a water-tight veneer burst into its cheers and its tears there were fifteen recalls from the wings abram cantor standing counting them off on his fingers and trembling to receive the stradivarius then finally and against the frantic negative pantomime of his manager a scherzo played so lacily that it swept the house in lightest laughter when leon cantor finally completed his program they were loath to let him go crowding down the aisles upon him applauding up down around him until the great dishevelled house was like the roaring of a sea and he would laugh and throw out his arm in widespread helplessness and always his manager in the background gesticulating against too much of his precious product for the money ushers already slamming up chairs his father's arms out for the stradivarius and deepest in the gloom of the wings sarah cantor in a rocker especially dragged out for her and from the depths of the black silk reticule darning his socks bravo bravo give us the humoresque chopin nocturne polonaise humoresque bravo bravo and even as they stood hatted and coated importuning and pressing in upon him and with a wisp of a smile to the fourth left box leon cantor played them the humoresque of dvorak skedaddling plucking quirking that laugh on life with a tear behind it then suddenly because he could escape no other way rushed straight back for his dressing-room bursting in upon a flood of family already there isidore cantor blue-shaved aquiline and already graying at the temples his five-year-old son leon a soft little powder pigeon of a wife too enormous of bust in glittering eardrops and a wrist-watch of diamonds half buried in a chubby wrist miss esther cantor pink and pretty rudolph boris not yet done with growing pains at the door miss cantor met her brother her eyes as sweetly moist as her kiss leon darling you surpassed even yourself quit crowding children let him sit down here leon let mamma give you a fresh collar look how the child's perspired pull down that window boris rudolph don't let no one in i give you my word if to-night wasn't as near as i ever came to see a house go crazy not even that time in milan darling when they broke down the doors was it like to-night ought to be seen ma the row of police outside hush up rudy don't you see your brother's trying to get his breath from mrs isidore cantor you should have seen the balconies mother isidore and i went up just to see the jam six thousand dollars in the house to-night if there was a cent said isidore cantor hand me my violin please esther i must have scratched it the way they pushed no son you didn't i've already rubbed it up sit quiet darling he was limply white 
as if the vitality had flowed out of him. God, wasn't it tremendous? Six thousand, if there was a cent, repeated Isidore Cantor. More than Rimsky ever played to in his life. Oh, Izzy, you make me sick. Always counting, counting. Your sister's right, Isidore. You got nothing to complain of if there was only six hundred in the house. A boy whose fiddle has made already enough to set you up in such a fine business. His brother Boris in such a fine college. Automobiles. Style. And now because Vladimir Rimsky, three times his age, gets signed up with Elsass for a few thousand more a year, right away the family gets a long face. Ma, please, Isidore didn't mean it that way. Pa's knocking, Ma. Shall I let him in? Let him in, Rudy. I'd like to know what good it would do to try to keep him out. In an actual rain of perspiration, his tie slid well under one ear, Abram Cantor burst in, mouthing the words before his acute state of strangulation would let them out. Elsass! Is Elsass outside? He wants to sign. Leon, fifty concerts, coast to coast, two thousand next season. He's got the papers already drawn up, the pen outside waiting. Abram! Pa! In the silence that followed, Isidore Cantor, a poppiness of stare and a violent redness set in, suddenly turned to his five-year-old son, sticky with lollipop, and came down soundly and with smack against the infantile, the slightly outstanding and unsuspecting ear. Mom, sir, he cried, Chemer, Lump, Ganif, you hear that? Two thousand, two thousand, didn't I tell you, didn't I tell you to practice? Even as Leon Cantor put pen to this princely document, Franz Ferdinand of Serbia, the assassin's bullet cold, lay dead in state, and let slip were the dogs of war. In the next years, men, forty deep, were to die in piles, hayricks of fields, to become human hayricks of battlefields, Belgium disemboweled, her very entrails dragging, to find all the civilized world her champion, and between the poppies of Flanders, crosses, thousand upon thousand of them, to mark the places where the youth of her allies fell, avenging outrage. Seas, even when calmest, were to become terrible and men's heartbeats, a bit sluggish with the fatty degeneration of a sluggard piece, to quicken and then to throb with the rat-a-tat-tat, the rat-a-tat-tat of the most peremptory, the most reverberating call to arms in the history of the world. In June 1917, Leon Cantor, answering that rat-a-tat-tat, enlisted. In November, honed by the interim of training to even a new leanness, and sailing orders heavy and light in his heart, Lieutenant Cantor, on two days' home leave, took leave of home, which can be crudest when it is tenderest. Standing there in the expensive, the formal, the enormous French parlor of his uptown apartment de luxe, from not one of whose chairs would his mother's feet touch floor, a wall of living flesh, mortared in blood, was throbbing and hedging him in. He would pace up and down the long room, heavy with faces of those who mourn, with a laugh too ready, too facetious, in his fear for them. Well, well, what is this anyway? Awake? Where's the coffin? Who's dead? His sister-in-law shot out her plump, watch-encrusted wrist. Don't, Leon, she cried. Such talk is a sin. It might come true. Rosy posy butterball, he said, pausing beside her chair to pinch her deeply soft cheek. Cry baby roly-poly, you can't shove me off in a wooden kimono that way. From his place before the white and gold mantle, staring steadfastly at the floor tiling, Isidore Cantor turned suddenly, a bit whiter and older, at the temples. I don't get your comedy, Leon. Wooden kimono, Leon? That's the way the fellows at camp joke about coffins, Ma. I didn't mean anything but fun. Great Scott, can't anyone take a joke? Oh, God, oh, God, his mother fell to swaying softly, hugging herself against shivering. Did you sign over power of attorney to Pa? Leon. I'll fix Izzy. 
I'm so afraid, son, you don't take with you enough money in your pockets. You know how you lose it. If only you would let Mama sew that little bag inside your uniform, with a little place for bills and a little place for the asafotida. Now, please, Ma, please, if I needed more, wouldn't I take it? Wouldn't I be a pretty joke among the fellows, tied up in that smelling stuff? Orders are orders, Ma. I know what to take and what not to take. Please, Leon, don't get mad at me. But if you will let me put in your suitcase just one little box of that salve for your fingertips, so they don't crack. Pausing, as he paced to lay cheek to her hair, he patted her. Three boxes, if you want. Now, how's that? And you won't take it out so soon as my back is turned? Cross my heart. His touch seemed to set her trembling again, all her illy-concealed emotions rushing up. I can't stand it, can't, can't. Take my life, take my blood, but don't take my boy, don't take my boy. Mama, Mama, is that the way you're going to begin all over again, after your promise? She clung to him, heaving against the rising storm of sobs. I can't help it, I can't. Cut out my heart from me, but let me keep my boy, my wonder boy. Oughtn't she be ashamed of herself? Just listen to her, Esther. What will we do with her? Talks like she had a guarantee I wasn't coming back. Why, I wouldn't be surprised if by spring I wasn't tuning up again for a coast-to-coast -coast tour. Spring? That talk don't fool me. Without my boy, the springs in my life are over. Why, Ma, you talk like every soldier who goes to war was killed. There's only the smallest percentage of them die in battle. Spring, he says, spring, crossing the seas from me, to live through months with that sea between us. My boy may be shot. My... Mama, please. I can't help it, Leon. I'm not one of those fine mothers that can be so brave. Cut out my heart, but leave my boy. My wonder boy, my child I prayed for. There's other mothers, Ma, with sons. Yes, but not wonder sons. A genius like you could so easy get excuse. Leon, give it up. Genius, it should be the last to be sent to the slaughter pen. Leon, darling, don't go. Ma, Ma, you don't mean what you're saying. You wouldn't want me to reason that way. You wouldn't want me to hide behind my violin. I would, I would. You should wait for the draft. With my Rudy and even my baby Boris enlisted, ain't it enough for one mother? Since they got to be in camp, all right, I say, let them be there. If my heart breaks for it, but not my wonder child. You can get exemption, Leon, right away for the asking. Stay with me, Leon. Don't go away. The people at home got to be kept happy with music. That's being a soldier, too, playing their troubles away. Stay with me, Leon. Don't go leave me. Don't. Don't. He suffered her to lie, tear-drenched, back into his arms, holding her close in his compassion for her, his own face twisting. God! Ma! This! This is awful! Please, you make us ashamed, all of us. I don't know what to say. Esther, come quiet her. For God's sake, quiet her. From her place in that sobbing circle, Esther Cantor crossed to kneel beside her mother. Mama, darling, you're killing yourself. What if every family went on this way? You want Papa to come in and find us all crying? Is this the way you want Leon to spend his last hour with us? Oh, God! God! I mean, his last hour until he comes back, darling. Didn't you just hear him say, darling, it may be by spring? Spring, spring, never no more springs for me. Just think, darling, how proud we should be. Our Leon, who could so easily have been excused, not even to wait for the draft. It's not too late yet, please, Leon. Are Rudy and Boris both in camp, too, training to serve their country? Why, Mama, we ought to be crying for happiness. As Leon says, surely the Cantor family, who fled out of Russia to escape massacre, should know how terrible slavery can be. 
that's why we must help our boys mamma in their fight to make the world free right leon trying to smile with her red-rimmed eyes we've got no fight with no one not a child of mine was ever raised to so much as lift a finger against no one we've got no fight with no one we have got a fight with someone with autocracy only this time it happens to be hunnish autocracy you should know it mamma oh you should know it deeper down in you than any of us the fight our family right here has got with autocracy we should be the first to want to avenge belgium leon's right mamma darling the way you and papa were beaten out of your country there's not a day in your life you don't curse it without knowing it every time we three boys look at your son and our brother manny born an imbecile because of autocracy we know what we're fighting for we know you know too look at him over there even before he was born ruined by autocracy know what i'm fighting for why this whole family knows what's music what's art what's life itself in a world without freedom every time ma you get to thinking we've got a fight with no one all you have to do is look at our poor manny he's the answer he's the answer in a foaming sort of silence manny Cantor smiled softly from his chair beneath the pink and gold shade of the piano lamp the heterogeneous sounds of women weeping had ceased straight in her chair her great shelf of bust heaving sat rosa cantor suddenly dry of eye isidore cantor head up erect now and out from the embrace of her daughter sarah looked up at her son what time do you leave leon she asked actually firm of lip any minute ma getting late this time she pulled her lips to a smile waggling her forefinger don't let them little devils of french girls fall in love with my dude in his uniform her pretense at pleasantry was almost more than he could bear here here our mother thinks i'm a regular lady killer hear that esther pinching her cheek you are leon only only you don't know it don't you bring down too many bows while i'm gone either miss cantor i won't leon sotto voce to her remember esther while i'm gone the royalties from the discophone records are yours i want you to have them for pen money and maybe a dowry she turned from him don't leon don't i like him nice fellow but too slow why if i were in his shoes i'd have popped long ago she smiled with her lashes dewy there entered then in a violet-scented little whirl, Miss Gina Berg, rosy with the sting of a winter's night, and as usual swathed in the high-napped furs. Gina! She was for greeting everyone, a wafted kiss to Mrs. Cantor, and then, arms wide, a great bunch of violets in one outstretched hand, her glance straight, sure, and sparkling for Leon Cantor. Surprise, everybody! Surprise! Why, Gina, we thought you were singing in Philadelphia tonight so did i esther darling until a little bird whispered to me that lieutenant cantor was home on farewell leave he advanced to her down the great length of the room lowering his head over her hand his putty-clad legs clicking together you mean miss gina gina you didn't sing of course i didn't hasn't every prima donna a larynx to hide behind she lifted off her fur cap spilling curls well i i'll be hanged said lieutenant cantor his eyes lakes of her reflected loveliness she let her hand linger in his leon you really going how terrible how how wonderful how wonderful you're coming i you think it was not nice of me to come i think it was the nicest thing that ever happened in the world all the way here in the train i kept saying crazy crazy running to tell leon lieutenant cantor good-bye when you haven't even seen him three times in three years but each each of those three times we we've remembered gina but that's how i feel toward all the boys leon our fighting boys just like flying to them to kiss them each one good-bye come over gina you'll be a treat to our mother i well i'm hanged 
all the way from Philadelphia. There was even a sparkle to talk, then, and a let-up of pressure. After a while, Sarah Cantor looked up at her son, tremulous but smiling. "'Well, son, you're going to play for your old mother before you go. It'll be many a month, spring, maybe longer, before I hear my boy again, except on the discophone.' He shot a quick glance to his sister. "'Why, I—I I don't know. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love it, Ma, if—if if you think, Esther, I'd better.' "'You don't need to be afraid of me, darling. There's nothing can give me the strength to bear. What's before me like—like like my boy's music? That's my life, his music.' "'Why, yes, if Mama is sure she feels that way, play for us, Leon.' He was already at the instrument, where it lay, swathed, up top the grand piano. What'll it be, folks? Something to make me laugh, Leon. Something light. Something funny. Humoresque, he said, with a quick glance for Miss Berg. Humoresque, she said, smiling back at him. He capered through, cutting and playful of bow, the melody of Dvorak's, which is as ironic as a grinning mask. Finished, he smiled at his parent, her face still untearful. How's that? She nodded. It's like life, son, that peace. Crying to laugh its laughing, and laughing to hide its crying. Play that new piece, Leon, the one you set to music. You know, the words by that young boy in the war who wrote such grand poetry before he was killed. The one that always makes poor money laugh. Play it for him, Leon. Her plump, little unlined face, innocent of fault, Mrs. Isidore Cantor ventured her request, her smile tired with tears. No, no, Rosa, not now. Ma wouldn't want that. I do, son, I do. Even Manny should have his share of good-bye. To Gina Berg. They want me to play that little arrangement of mine from Alan Seeger's poem, I Have a Rendezvous. It's... It's beautiful, Leon. I was to have sung it on my program tonight, only I'm afraid you had better not. Here, now. Please, Leon. Nothing you play can ever make me as sad as it makes me glad. Manny should have, too, his good-bye. All right, then, Ma, if you're sure you want it. Will you sing it, Gina? She had risen. Why, yes, Leon. She sang it, then, quite purely her hands clasped simply together and her glance mistily off the beautiful the heroic the lyrical prophecy of a soldier poet and a poet soldier but i've a rendezvous with death on some scarred slope of battered hill when spring comes round again this year and the first meadow flowers appear in the silence that followed a sob burst out stifled from Esther Cantor, this time her mother holding her in arms that were strong. That, Leon, is the most beautiful of all your compositions. What does it mean, son, that word, rendezvous? Why, I, I don't exactly know. A rendezvous, it's a sort of meeting, a, an engagement, isn't it, Miss Gina? Gina, you're up on languages, as if I had an appointment to meet you some place, at the opera house, for instance. That's it, Leon, an engagement. Have I an engagement with you, Gina? She let her lids droop. Oh, how, how I hope you have, Leon. When? In the spring? That's it, in the spring. Then they smiled, these two, who had never felt more than the merest butterfly wings of love brushing them, light as lashes. No word between them, only an unfinished sweetness waiting to be linked up. Suddenly there burst in Abram Cantor, in a carefully rehearsed gale of bluster. Quick, Leon, I got this car downstairs. Just fifteen minutes to make the ferry. Quick! The sooner we get him over there, the sooner we get him back. I'm right, Mama. Now, now, no waterworks. Get your brother's suitcase, Isidore. Now, now, no nonsense. Quick, quick. With the deftly maneuvered round of goodbyes, a grip-laden dash for the door, a throbbing moment of turning back when it seemed as though Sarah Cantor's arms could not unlock their deadlock of him. Leon Cantor 
was out and gone, the group of faces point-etched into the silence behind him. The poor, mute face of Manny, laughing softly, Rosa Cantor crying into her hands, Esther, grief-crumpled, but rich in the enormous hope of youth, the sweet Gina, to whom the waiting months had already begun their reality. Not so, Sarah Cantor, in a bedroom adjoining, its high sailing vastness, as cold as a cathedral to her lowness of stature, sobs, dry and terrible, were rumbling up from her, only to dash against lips, tightly restraining them. On her knees, beside a chest of drawers, and unwrapping it from swaddling clothes, she withdrew what at best had been a sorry sort of fiddle. Cracked of back and solitary as string, it was as if her trembling arms, raising it above her head, would make of themselves and her swaying body the tripod of an altar the old twisting and prophetic pain was behind her heart like the painted billows of music that the old italian masters loved to do there wound and wreathed about her clouds of song but i've a rendezvous with death on some scarred slope of battered hill when spring comes round again this year and the first meadow flowers appear End of Humoresque by Fanny Hurst A Warrior's Daughter from American Indian Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel American Indian Stories by Zitkala Sa A Warrior's Daughter In the afternoon shadow of a large teepee, with red-painted smoke lapels, sat a warrior father with crossed shins. His head was so poised that his eye swept easily the vast, level land to the eastern horizon line. He was the chieftain's bravest warrior. He had won by heroic deeds the privilege of staking his wigwam within the great circle of teepees. He was also one of the most generous gift-givers to the toothless old people. For this he was entitled to the red-painted smoke lapels on his cone-shaped dwelling. He was proud of his honours. He never wearied of rehearsing nightly his own brave deeds. Though by wigwam fires he prated much of his high rank and widespread fame, his great joy was a wee black-eyed daughter of eight sturdy winters. Thus, as he sat upon the soft grass, with his wife at his side, bent over her bead-work, he was singing a dance-song, and beat lightly the rhythm with his slender hands. His shrewd eyes softened with pleasure, as he watched the easy movements of the small body dancing on the green before him. To see, is taking her first dancing lesson. Her tightly braided hair curves over both brown ears, like a pair of crooked little horns, which glisten in the summer sun. With her snugly moccasined feet close together, and a wee hand at her belt, to stay the long string of beads which hang from her bare neck, she bends her knees gently to the rhythm of her father's voice. Now she ventures upon the earnest movement, slightly upward and sideways in a circle, at length the song drops into a closing cadence, and the little woman, clad in beaded deerskin, sits down beside the elder one. Like her mother she sits upon her feet. In a brief moment the warrior repeats the last refrain. Again Tusi springs to her feet, and dances to the swing of the final few measures. Just as the dance was finished, an elderly man, with short, thick hair loose about his square shoulders, rode into their presence from the rear, and leaped lightly from his pony's back. Dropping the rawhide rein to the ground, he tossed himself lazily on the grass. "'Ah, he, you have returned soon,' said the warrior, while extending a hand to his little daughter. Quickly the child ran to her father's side, and cuddled close to him, while he tenderly placed a strong arm about her. Both father and child, eyeing the figure on the grass, waited to hear the man's report. "'It is true,' 
began the man, with a stranger's accent, this is the night of the dance. Ha ha! muttered the warrior, with some surprise. Propping himself upon his elbows, the man raised his face. His features were of the southern type. From an enemy's camp he was taken captive long years ago by Tusi's father, but the unusual qualities of the slave had won the Sioux warrior's heart, and for the last three winters the man had had his freedom. He was made real man again. His hair was allowed to grow. However, he himself had chosen to stay in the warrior's family. Hm ha again ejaculated the warrior father. Then, turning to his little daughter, he asked, Tusi, do you hear that? Yes, father, and I am going to dance to-night. With these words she bounded out of his arm, and frolicked about in glee. Hereupon the proud mother's voice rang out in a chiding laugh. My child, in honour of your first dance your father must give a generous gift. His ponies are wild, and roam beyond the great hill. Pray, what has he fit to offer? she questioned, the pair of puzzled eyes fixed upon her. "'A pony from the herd, mother! A fleet-footed pony from the herd!' Tusi shouted, with sudden inspiration. Pointing a small forefinger toward the man lying on the grass, she cried, "'Uncle, you will go after the pony to-morrow!' And pleased with her solution of the problem, she skipped wildly about. Her childish faith in her elders was not conditioned by a knowledge of human limitations, but thought all things possible to grown-ups. "'Ha, hop exclaimed the mother, with a rising inflection, implying by the expletive that her child's buoyant spirit be not weighted with a denial. Quickly to the hard request the man replied, "'How? I go if Tusi tells me so.' This delighted the little one whose black eyes brimmed over with light. Standing in front of the strong man, she clapped her small brown hands with joy. "'That makes me glad! My heart is good! Go, uncle, and bring a handsome pony!' she cried. In an instant she would have frisked away, but an impulse held her tilting where she stood. In the man's own tongue, for he had taught her many words and phrases, she exploded. "'Thank you, good uncle! Thank you!' then tore away from sheer excess of glee. The proud warrior father, smiling and narrowing his eyes, muttered approval, Howo, Heshitu. Like her mother, Tusi has finely pencilled eyebrows and slightly extended nostrils, but in her sturdiness of form she resembles her father. A loyal daughter, she sits within her teepee, making beaded deerskins for her father, while he longs to stave off her every suitor as all unworthy of his old heart's pride. But Tusi is not alone in her dwelling. Near the entranceway a young brave is half reclining on a mat. In silence he watches the petals of a wild rose growing on the soft buckskin. Quickly the young woman slips the beads on the silvery sinew thread and works them into the pretty flower design. Finally, in a low, deep voice, the young man begins. The sun is far past the zenith. It is now only a man's height above the western edge of land. I hurried hither to tell you to-morrow I join the war party. Pauses for reply, but the maid's head drops lower over her deerskin, and her lips are more firmly drawn together. He continues, Last night, in the moonlight, I met your warrior father. He seemed to know I had just stepped forth from your teepee. I fear he did not like it, for though I greeted him, he was silent. I halted in his pathway, with what boldness I dared, while my heart was beating hard and fast, I asked him for his only daughter. Drawing himself erect to his tallest height, and gathering his loose robe more closely about his proud figure, he flashed a pair of piercing eyes upon me. "'Young man,' said he, with a cold, slow voice that chilled me to the marrow of my bones, "'hear me. Nought but an enemy's scalp-lock, plucked fresh with your own hand, will buy Tusi for your wife.' 
Then he turned on his heel and stalked away. Tusi thrusts her work aside. With earnest eyes she scans her lover's face. My father's heart is really kind. He would know if you are brave and true," murmured the daughter, who wished no ill-will between her two loved ones. Then, rising to go, the youth holds out a right hand. "'Grasp my hand once firmly before I go, Hoy. Pray tell me, will you wait and watch for my return?' Tusi only nods assent, for mere words are vain. At early dawn the round campground awakes into song. Men and women sing of bravery and of triumph. They inspire the swelling breasts of the painted warriors, mounted on prancing ponies, bedecked with the green branches of trees. Riding slowly around the great ring of cone-shaped tepees, here and there, a loud singing warrior swears to avenge a former wrong, and thrusts a bare brown arm against the purple east calling the Great Spirit to hear his vow. All having made the circuit, the singing war-party gallops away southward. Astride their ponies, laden with food and deerskins, brave elderly women follow after their warriors. Among the foremost rides a young woman in elaborately beaded buckskin dress. Proudly mounted, she curbs with a single rawhide loop a wild-eyed pony. It is Tusi on her father's war-horse. Thus the war-party of Indian men and their faithful women vanish beyond the southern skyline. A day's journey brings them very near the enemy's borderland. Nightfall finds a pair of twin tepees nestled in a deep ravine. Within one lounge the painted warriors, smoking their pipes and telling weird stories by the firelight while in the other watchful women crouch uneasily about their centre-fire. By the first grey light in the east the tepees are banished. They are gone. The warriors are in the enemy's camp, breaking dreams with their tomahawks. The women are hid away in secret places in the long thicketed ravine. The day is far spent. The red sun is low over the west. At length, straggling warriors return, one by one, to the deep hollow. In the twilight they number their men. Three are missing. Of these absent ones, two are dead. But the third one, a young man, is a captive to the foe. He, he, lament the warriors, taking food in haste. In silence. Each woman with long strides hurries to and fro, tying large bundles on her pony's back. Under cover of night the war-party must hasten homeward. Motionless, with bowed head, sits a woman in her hiding-place. She grieves for her lover. In bitterness of spirit she hears the warrior's murmuring words. With set teeth she plans to cheat the hated enemy of their captive. In the meanwhile, low signals are given, and the war-party, unaware of Tusi's absence, steal quietly away. The soft thud of pony-hoofs grows fainter and fainter. The gradual hush of the empty ravine whirs noisily in the ear of the young woman. Alert for any sound of footfalls nigh, she holds her breath to listen. Her right hand rests on a long knife in her belt. Ah, yes, she knows where her pony is hid, but not yet has she need of him. Satisfied that no danger is nigh, she prowls forth from her place of hiding. With a panther's tread and pace she climbs the high ridge beyond the low ravine. From thence she spies the enemy's campfires. Rooted to the barren bluff, the slender woman's figure stands on the pinnacle of night outlined against a starry sky. The cool night breeze wafts to her burning ear snatches of song and drum. With desperate hate she bites her teeth. Tusi beckons the stars to witness. With impassioned voice and uplifted face she pleads, Great Spirit, 
Speed me to my lover's rescue. Give me swift cunning for a weapon this night. All-powerful spirit, grant me my warrior father's heart, strong to slay a foe, and mighty to save a friend. In the midst of the enemy's campground, underneath a temporary dance-house, are men and women in gala-day dress. It is late in the night, but the merry warriors bend and bow their nude painted bodies before a bright centre-fire. To the lusty men's voices and the rhythmic throbbing drum they leap and rebound with feathered headgears waving. Women with red-painted cheeks and long braided hair sit in a large half-circle against the willow railing. They too join in the singing, and rise to dance with their victorious warriors. Amid this circular dance arena stands a prisoner bound to a post, haggard with shame and sorrow. He hangs his dishevelled head. He stares with unseeing eyes upon the bare earth at his feet. With jeers and smirking faces the dancers mock the Dakota captive. Rowdy braves and small boys hoot and yell in derision. Silent among the noisy mob, a tall woman, leaning both elbows on the round willow railing, peers into the lighted arena. The dancing centre-fire shines bright into her handsome face, intensifying the night in her dark eyes. It breaks into myriad points upon her beaded dress. Unmindful of the surging throng jostling her at either side, she glares in upon the hateful, scoffing men. Suddenly she turns her head. Tittering maids whisper near her ear, "'There! There! See him now, sneering in the captive's face! Tis he who sprang upon the young man, and dragged him by his long hair to yonder post. See! He is handsome! How gracefully he dances!' The silent young woman looks towards the bound captive. She sees a warrior, scarce older than the captive, flourishing a tomahawk in the Dakota's face. A burning rage darts forth from her eyes, and brands him for a victim of revenge. Her heart mutters within her breast, "'Come, I wish to meet you, vile foe, who captured my lover, and tortures him now with a living death.' Here the singers hush their voices, and the dancers scatter to their various resting-places along the willow ring. The victor gives a reluctant last twirl of his tomahawk, then— like the others, he leaves the centre-ground. With head and shoulders swaying from side to side, he carries a high-pointing chin toward the willow railing. Sitting down upon the ground with crossed legs, he fans himself with an outspread turkey-wing. Now and then he stops his haughty blinking to peep out of the corners of his eyes. He hears someone clearing her throat gently. It is unmistakably for his ear. The wing-fan swings irregularly to and fro. At length he turns a proud face over a bare shoulder, and beholds a handsome woman smiling. Ah! she would speak to a hero! thumps his heart wildly. The singers raise their voice in unison. The music is irresistible. Again lunges the victor into the open arena. Again he leers into the captive's face. At every interval between the songs he returns to his resting-place. Here the young woman awaits him. As he approaches she smiles boldly into his eyes. He is pleased with her face and her smile. Waving his wing-fan spasmodically in front of his face, he sits with his ears pricked up. He catches a low whisper. A hand taps him lightly on the shoulder. The handsome woman speaks to him in his own tongue. Come out into the night. I wish to tell you who I am. He must know what sweet words of praise the handsome woman has for him. With both hands he spreads the meshes of the loosely woven willows, and crawls out unnoticed into the dark. Before him stands the young woman, beckoning him with a slender hand she steps away, away from the light and the restless throng of onlookers. He follows with impatient strides. She quickens her pace. 
he lengthens his strides. Then suddenly the woman turns from him and darts away with amazing speed. Clinching his fists and biting his lower lip, the young man runs after the fleeing woman. In his maddened pursuit he forgets the dance arena. Beside a cluster of low bushes the woman halts. The young man, panting for breath and plunging headlong forward, whispers loud, Pray tell me, are you a woman, or an evil spirit to lure me away?" Turning on heels firmly planted in the earth, the woman gives a wild spring forward, like a panther for its prey. In a husky voice she hissed between her teeth, I am a Dakota woman. From her unerring long knife the enemy falls heavily at her feet. The great spirit heard Tusi's prayer on the hilltop. He gave her a warrior's strong heart to lessen the foe by one. A bent, old woman's figure, with a bundle like a grandchild slung on her back, walks round and round the dance house. The wearied onlookers are leaving in twos and threes. The tired dancers creep out of the willow railing, and some go out at the entrance way, till the singers too rise from the drum and a trudging drowsily homeward. Within the arena the centre fire lies broken in red embers. The night no longer lingers about the willow railing, but hovering into the dance-house covers here and there a snoring man whom sleep has overpowered where he sat. The captive, in his tight-binding rawhide ropes, hangs in hopeless despair. Close about him the gloom of night is slowly crouching. Yet the last red, crackling embers cast a faint light upon his long black hair, and, shining through the thick mats, caress his face with undying hope. Still about the dance-house the old woman prowls. Now the embers are grey with ashes. The old bent woman appears at the entrance-way. With a cautious, groping foot she enters, whispering between her teeth a lullaby for her sleeping child in her blanket, she searches for something forgotten. Noisily snored the dreaming men in the darkest parts. As the lisping old woman draws nigh, the captive again opens his eyes. A forefinger she presses to her lip. The young man arouses himself from his stupor. His senses belie him. Before his wide open eyes the old bent figure straightens into its youthful stature. Tusi herself is beside him. With a stroke upward and downward she severs the cruel cords with her sharp blade. Dropping her blanket from her shoulders, so that it hangs from her girdled waist like a skirt, she shakes the large bundle into a light shawl for her lover. Quickly she spreads it over his bare back. Come, she whispers, and turns to go, but the young man, numb and helpless, staggers nigh to falling. The sight of his weakness makes her strong. A mighty power thrills her body. Stooping beneath his outstretched arms, grasping at the air for support, Tusi lifts him upon her broad shoulders. With half-running, triumphant steps, she carries him away into the open night. End of A Warrior's Daughter by Zitkala Sa From One Who Stays by Amy Lowell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From One Who Stays by Amy Lowell How empty seems the town now you are gone! A wilderness of sad streets, where gaunt walls hide nothing to desire. Sunshine falls eerie, distorted, as it long had shone on white dead faces, tombed in halls of stone. The whir of motors, stricken through with calls of playing boys, floats up at intervals. But all these noises blur to one long moan. What quest is worth pursuing? 
and how strange that other men still go accustomed ways. I hate their interest in the things they do. A spectre horde repeating without change an old routine. Alone, I know the days are stillborn, and the world stopped, lacking you. End of From One Who Stays Sheltered Garden This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Sheltered Garden by Hilda Doolittle I have had enough. I gasp for breath. Every way ends, every road, every footpath leads at last to the hill crest. Then you retrace your steps, or find the same slope on the other side, precipitate. I have had enough. Border pinks, clove pinks, wax lilies, herbs, sweet cress. Oh, for some sharp swish of a branch. There is no scent of rosin in this place, no taste of bark, of coarse weeds, aromatic, astringent. Only border on border of scented pinks. Have you seen fruit under cover that wanted light? Pears wadded in cloth, protected from the frost? Melons, almost ripe, smothered in straw? Why not let the pears cling to the empty branch? All your coaxing will only make a bitter fruit. Let them cling, ripen of themselves, test their own worth, nipped, shriveled by the frost, to fall at last but fair with a russet coat. Or the melon? Let it bleach yellow in the winter light, even tart to the taste. It is better to taste of frost, the exquisite frost, than of wadding and dead grass. For this beauty, beauty without strength, chokes out life. I want wind to break, scatter these pink stalks, snap off their spiced heads, fling them about with dead leaves, spread the paths with twigs, limbs broken off, trail great pine branches hurled from some far wood right across the melon patch, break pear and quince, leave half trees torn, twisted, but showing the fight was valiant. Oh, to blot out this garden, to forget, to find a new beauty in some terrible, wind-tortured place. The End of Sheltered Garden by Hilda Doolittle A Windy Day by Eleanor Wiley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Windy Day by Eleanor Wiley O oh, shameless day, a daring stress, a sweet but insufficient dress, of windy hair in billows piled, lock to bright lock unreconciled, is round your virgin nakedness, O oh, shameless day, we might expect you must confess, some rosy blushes, soft distress, your clear regard is like a child, O oh, shameless day, your self-possession in the press of sunbeams struggling with success to kiss you by blue eyes beguiled your eyes so innocently wild is like some maiden sorceress o oh, shameless day end of a windy day by eleanor wiley chapter 1 of the last of the peterkins this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the last of the peterkins by lucretia hale chapter 1 to the lady from philadelphia beloved by the peterkin family this book is dedicated preface the following papers contain the last records of the Peterkin family, who unhappily ventured to leave their native land and have never returned. Elizabeth Eliza's commonplace book has been found among the family papers, and will be published here for the first time. 
it is evident that she foresaw that the family were ill able to contend with the commonplace struggle of life and we may not wonder that they could not survive the unprecedented far away from the genial advice of friends especially that of the lady from philadelphia it is feared that mr and mrs peterkin lost their lives after leaving tobolsk perhaps in some vast conflagration agamemnon and solomon john were probably sacrificed in some effort to join in or control the disturbances which arose in the distant places where they had established themselves agamemnon in madagascar solomon john in rushchuk the little boys have merged into men in some german university while elizabeth eliza must have been lost in the mazes of the russian language elizabeth eliza writes a paper elizabeth elijah joined the circumambient club with the idea that it would be a long time before she a new member would have to read a paper she would have time to hear the other papers read and to see how it was done and she would find it easy when her turn came by that time she would have some ideas and long before she would be called upon she would have leisure to sit down and write out something but a year passed away and the time was drawing near she had meanwhile devoted herself to her studies and had tried to inform herself on all subjects by way of preparation she had consulted one of the old members of the club as to the choice of a subject oh write about anything was the answer anything that you have been thinking of elizabeth eliza was forced to say that she had not been thinking lately she had not had time the family had moved and there was always an excitement about something that prevented her sitting down to think why not write out your family adventures asked the old member elizabeth eliza was sure her mother would think it would make them too public and most of the club papers she observed had some thought in them she preferred to find an idea so she set herself down to the occupation of thinking she went out on the piazza to think she stayed in the house to think she tried a corner of the china closet she tried thinking in the cars and lost her pocket-book she tried it in the garden and walked into the strawberry bed in the house and out of the house it seemed to be the same she could not think of anything to think of for many weeks she was seen sitting on the sofa or in the window and nobody disturbed her she is thinking about her paper the family would say but she only knew that she could not think of anything agamemnon told her that many writers waited till the last moment when inspiration came which was much finer than anything studied elizabeth eliza thought it would be terrible to wait till the last moment if the inspiration should not come she might combine the two ways wait till a few days before the last and then sit down and write anyhow this would give a chance for inspiration while she would not run the risk of writing nothing she was much discouraged perhaps she had better give it up but no everybody wrote a paper if not now she would have to do it some time and at last the idea of a subject came to her but it was as hard to find a moment to write as to think the morning was noisy till the little boys had gone to school for they had begun again upon their regular course with the plan of taking up the study of cider in october and after the little boys had gone to school now it was one thing now it was another the china closet to be cleaned or one of the neighbors in to look at the sewing machine she tried after dinner but would fall asleep she felt that evening would be the true time after the cares of day were over the peterkins had wire mosquito nets all over the house at every door and every window they were as eager to keep out the flies as the mosquitoes the doors were all furnished with strong springs that pulled the doors to as soon as they were opened the little boys had practiced running in and out of each door and slamming it after them this made a good deal of noise for they had gained great success in making one door slam directly after another and at times would keep up a running volley of artillery as they called it 
with the slamming of the doors. Mr. Peterkin, however, preferred it to the flies. So Elizabeth Eliza felt she would venture to write of a summer evening with all the windows open. She seated herself one evening in the library between two large kerosene lamps, with paper, pen, and ink before her. It was a beautiful night, with the smell of the roses coming in through the mosquito nets, and just the faintest odor of kerosene by her side. She began upon her work, but what was her dismay? She found herself immediately surrounded with mosquitoes. They attacked her at every point. They fell upon her hand as she moved it to the inkstand. They hovered, buzzing over her head. They planted themselves under the lace of her sleeve. If she moved her left hand to, to frighten them from one point, another band fixed themselves upon her right hand. Not only did they flutter and sting, but they sang in a heathenous manner, distracting her attention as she tried to write, as she tried to waft them off. Nor was this all. Myriads of June bugs hovered round flung themselves into the lamps and made disagreeable funeral fires of themselves, tumbling noisily on her paper in their last unpleasant agonies. Occasionally one darted with a rush toward Elizabeth Eliza's head. If there was anything Elizabeth Eliza had a terror of, it was a June bug. She had heard that they had a tendency to get into the hair. One had been caught in the hair of a friend of hers, who had long, luxuriant hair, but the legs of the June bug were caught in it like fish hooks, and it had to be cut out, and the June bug was only extricated by sacrificing large masses of the flowing locks. Elizabeth Eliza flung her handkerchief over her head. Could she sacrifice what hair she had to the claims of literature? She gave a cry of dismay. The little boys rushed in a moment to the rescue. They flapped newspapers, flung sofa cushions, they offered to stand by her side with fly-whisks, that she might be free to write. But the struggle was too exciting for her, and the flying insects seemed to increase. Moths of every description, large brown moths, small delicate white millers, whirled about her, while the irritating hum of the mosquito kept on more than ever. Mr. Peterkin and the rest of the family came in to inquire about the trouble. It was discovered that each of the little boys had been standing in the opening of a wire door for some time, watching to see when Elizabeth Eliza would have made her preparations and would begin to write. Countless numbers of door-bugs and winged creatures of every description had taken occasion to come in. It was found that they were in every part of the house. "'We might open all the blinds and screens,' suggested Agamemnon and make a vigorous onslaught and drive them all out at once. I do believe there are more inside than out now, said Solomon John. The wire nets, of course, said Agamemnon, keep them in now. We might go outside, proposed Solomon John, and drive in all that are left. Then to-morrow morning, when they are all torpid, kill them and make collections of them. Agamemnon had a tent which he had prepared in case he should ever go to the Adirondacks, and he proposed using it for the night. The little boys were wild for this. Mrs. Peterkin thought she and Elizabeth Eliza would prefer trying to sleep in the house, but perhaps Elizabeth Eliza would go on with her paper with more comfort out of doors. A student's lamp was carried out and she was established on the steps of the back piazza, while screens were all carefully closed to prevent the mosquitoes and insects from flying out. But it was of no use. There were, outside still, swarms of winged creatures that plunged themselves about her, and she had not been there long before a huge miller flung himself into the lamp and put it out. She gave up for the evening. Still the paper went on. "'How fortunate!' exclaimed Elizabeth Eliza, "'that I did not put it off till the last evening.' Having once begun, she persevered in it at every odd moment of the day. Agamemnon presented her with a volume of synonym, which was of great service to her. 
she read her paper in its various stages to agamemnon first for his criticism then to her father in the library then to mr and mrs peterkin together next to solomon john and afterward to the whole family assembled she was almost glad that the lady from philadelphia was not in town as she wished it to be her own unaided production she declined all invitations for the week before the night of the club and on the very day she kept her room with eau sucre that she might save her voice solomon john provided her with brown's bronchial chokies when the evening came and mrs peterkin advised a handkerchief over her head in case of june bugs it was however a cool night agamemnon escorted her to the house the club met at anna maria bromwick's no gentlemen were admitted to the regular meetings there were what solomon john called occasional annual meetings to which they were invited when all the choicest papers of the year were re-read elizabeth eliza was placed at the head of the room at a small table with a brilliant gas jet on one side it was so cool the windows could be closed mrs peterkin as a guest sat in the front row this was her paper as elizabeth eliza read it for she frequently inserted fresh expressions the sun it is impossible that much can be known about it this is why we have taken it up as a subject we mean the sun that lights us by day and leaves us by night in the first place it is so far off no measuring tapes could reach it and both the earth and the sun are moving about so that it would be difficult to adjust ladders to reach it if we could of course people have written about it and there are those who have told us how many miles off it is but it is a very large number with a great many figures in it and though it is taught in most if not all of our public schools it is a chance if any one of the scholars remembers exactly how much it is it is the same with its size we cannot as we have said reach it by ladders to measure it and if we did reach it we should have no measuring tapes large enough and those that shut up with springs are difficult to use in a high place we are told it is true in a great many of the school books the size of the sun but again very few of those who have learned the number have been able to remember it after they have recited it even if they remembered it then and almost all of the scholars have lost their school books or have neglected to carry them home and so they are not able to refer to them i mean after leaving school i must say that is the case with me i should say with us though it was different the older ones gave their school books to the younger ones who took them back to school to lose them or who have destroyed them when there were no younger ones to go to school i should say there are such families what i mean is the fact that in some families there are no younger children to take off the school books but even then they are put away on upper shelves in closets or in attics and seldom found if wanted if then dusty of course we all know of a class of persons called astronomers who might be able to give us information on the subject in hand and who probably do furnish what information is found in school books it should be observed however that these astronomers carry on their observations always in the night now it is well known that the sun does not shine in the night indeed that is one of the peculiarities of the night that there is no sun to light us so we have to go to bed as long as there is nothing else we can do without its light unless we use lamps gas or kerosene which is very well for the evening but would be expensive all night long the same with candles how then can we depend upon their statements if not made from their own observation i mean if they never saw the sun we could not expect that astronomers should give us any valuable information with regard to the sun which they never see their occupation compelling them to be up at night it is quite likely that they never see it for we should not expect them to sit up all day as well as all night as under such circumstances their lives would not last long 
Indeed, we are told that their name is taken from the word aster, which means star. The word is aster no more. This, doubtless, means that they know more about the stars than other things. We see, therefore, that their knowledge is confined to the stars, and we cannot trust what they have to tell us of the sun. There are other asters which should not be mixed up with these. We mean those growing by the wayside in the fall of the year. The astronomers, from their nocturnal habits, can scarcely be acquainted with them, but as it does not come within our province, we will not inquire. We are left, then, to seek our own information about the sun, but we are met with a difficulty. To know a thing, we must look at it. How can we look at the sun? It is so very bright that our eyes are dazzled in gazing upon it. We have to turn away, or they would be put out the sight, I mean. It is true, we might use smoked glass, but that is apt to come off on the nose. How, then, if we cannot look at it, can we find out about it? The noonday would seem to be the better hour when it is the sunniest, but, besides injuring the eyes, it is painful to the neck to look up for a long time. It is easy to say that our examination of this heavenly body should take place at sunrise, when we could look at it more on a level, without having to endanger the spine. But how many people are up at sunrise? Those who get up early do so because they are compelled to, and have something else to do than look at the sun. The milkman goes forth to carry the daily milk, the ice man to leave the daily ice. But either of these would be afraid of exposing their vehicles to the heating orb of day the milkman afraid of turning the milk, the ice-man timorous of melting his glass. And they probably avoid those directions where they shall meet the sun's rays. The student, who might inform us, has been burning the midnight oil. The student is not in the mood to consider the early sun. There remains to us the evening, also, the leisure hour of the day. But alas, our houses are not built with an adaptation to this subject. They are seldom made to look toward the sunset. A careful inquiry and close observation, such as have been called for in preparation of this paper, have developed the fact that not a single house in this town faces the sunset. There may be windows looking that way, but in such a case there is always a barn between. I can testify to this from personal observations, because, with my brothers, we have walked through the several streets of this town with notebooks, carefully noting every house looking upon the sunset, and have found none from which the sunset could be studied. Sometimes it was the next house, sometimes a row of houses, or in its own wood house that stood in the way. Of course a study of the sun might be pursued out of doors. But in summer, sunstroke would be likely to follow. In winter, neuralgia and cold. And how could you consult your books, your dictionaries, your encyclopedias? There seems to be no hour of the day for studying the sun. You might go to the east to see it at its rising, or to the west to gaze upon its setting. But you don't. Here Elizabeth Eliza came to a pause. She had written five different endings, and had brought them all, thinking when the moment came she would choose one of them. She was pausing to select one, and inadvertently said, to close the paragraph, you don't. She had not meant to use the expression, which she would not have thought sufficiently imposing. It dropped out unconsciously. But it was received as a close, with rapturous applause. She had read slowly, and now that the audience applauded at such a length, she had time to feel she was much exhausted and glad of an end. Why not stop there, though there were some pages more? Applause, too, was heard from the outside. Some of the gentlemen had come, Mr. Peterkin, Agamemnon, and Solomon John, with others, and demanded admission. Since it is all over, let them in, said Anna Maria Bromwick. Elizabeth Eliza assented and rose to shake hands with her applauding friends. End of chapter 1
Story One of Buttered Side Down. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marco Zinberg. Buttered Side Down by Edna Ferber. Story Number One The Frog and the Puddle. Anyone who has ever written for the magazines, nobody could devise a more sweeping opening. It includes the Iceman, who does a humorous article on the subject of his troubles, and the neglected wife next door, who journalizes, knows that a story, the scene of which is not New York, is merely junk. Take Fifth Avenue as a framework, pat it out to five thousand words, and there you have the ideal short story. Consequently, I feel a certain timidity in confessing that I do not know Fifth Avenue from Hester Street when I see it, because I've never seen it. It has been said that from the latter to the former is a ten-year journey, from which I've gathered that they lie some miles apart. As for Forty-Second Street, of which musical comedians carol, I know not if it be a fashionable shopping thoroughfare or a factory district. A confession of this kind is not only good for the soul, but for the editor. It saves him the trouble of turning to page two. This is a story of Chicago, which is a first cousin of New York, although the two are not on chummy terms. It is a story of that part of Chicago, which lies east of Dearborn Avenue and south of Division Street, and which may be called the Nottingham Curtain District. In the Nottingham Curtain District, Every front parlor window is embellished with a rooms with or without board sign. The curtains themselves have mellowed from their original department store basement white to a rich deep tone of Chicago smoke, which has the notorious London variety beaten by several shades. Block after block, the two-story and basement houses stretch all grimy and gritty, and looking sadly down upon the five square feet of mangy grass forming the pitiful front yard of each. Now and then the monotonous line of front stoops is broken by an outjutting basement delicatessen shop, but not often. The Nottingham Curtain District does not run heavily to delicacies. It is stronger on creamed cabbage and bread pudding. Up in the third floor, back at Ms. Buck's, elegant rooms two dollars fifty cents and up a week gents preferred gertie was brushing her hair for the night one hundred strokes with a bristle brush anyone who reads the beauty column in the newspapers knows that there was something heroic in the sight of gertie brushing her hair one hundred strokes before going to bed at night only a woman could understand her doing it gertie clerked downtown on state street in a gents glove department a gents' glove department requires careful dressing on the part of its clerks, and the manager, in selecting them, is particular about choosing lookers, with a special attention to figure, hair, and fingernails. Gertie was a looker. Providence had taken care of that. But you cannot leave your hair and fingernails to Providence. They demand coaxing with a bristle brush and an orangewood stick. Now clerking, as Gertie would tell you, is fierce on the feet. And when your feet are tired, you are tired all over. Gertie's feet were tired every night. About 8.30, she longed to peel off her clothes, drop them in a heap on the floor, and tumble, unbrushed, unwashed, unmanicured, into bed. She never did it. Things had been particularly trying tonight. After washing out three handkerchiefs and pasting them with practiced hand over the mirror, Gertie had taken off her shoes and discovered a hole the size of a silver quarter in the heel of her left stocking. Gertie had a country-bred horror of holy stockings. She darned the hole, yawning, her aching feet pressed against the smooth, cool leg of the iron bed. That done, she had had the colossal courage to wash her face, slap cold cream on it, and push back the cuticle around her nails. Seated huddled on the side of her thin little iron bed, Gertie was brushing her hair bravely, counting the strokes somewhere in her subconscious mind, and thinking busily all the while of something else. Her brush rose, fell, swept downward, rose, fell, rhythmically. Ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety... 
Oh, darn it, what's the use? cried Gertie and hurled the brush across the room with a crack. She sat looking after it with wide staring eyes until the brush blurred in with the faded red roses on the carpet. When she found it doing that, she got up, wadded her hair viciously into a hard bun in the back instead of braiding it carefully as usual, crossed the room, it wasn't much of a trip, picked up the brush and stood looking down at it, her underlip caught between her teeth. That is the humiliating part of losing your temper and throwing things. You have to come down to picking them up anyway. Her lips still held prisoner, Gertie tossed the brush on the bureau, fastened her nightgown at the throat with a safety pin, turned out the gas, and crawled into her bed. Perhaps the hard bun at the back of her head kept her awake. She lay there with her eyes wide open and sleepless, staring into the darkness. At midnight, the kid next door came in whistling, like one unused to boarding-room rules. Gertie liked him for that. At the head of the stairs, he stopped whistling and came softly into his own third floor back, just next to Gertie's. Gertie liked him for that, too. The two rooms had been one in the fashionable days of the Nottingham Curtain District, long before the advent of Miss Buck. That thrifty lady, on coming into possession, had caused a flimsy partition to be run up, slicing the room in twain and doubling its rental. Lying there, Gertie could hear the kid next door moving about, getting ready for bed, and humming, Every little movement has a meaning of a tone, very lightly, under his breath. He polished his shoes briskly, and Gertie smiled there in the darkness of her own room in sympathy, Poor kid, he had his beauty struggles, too. Gertie had never seen the kid next door, although he'd come four months ago. But she knew he wasn't a grouch, because he alternately whistled and sang off-key tenor while dressing in the morning. She had also discovered that his bed must run along the same wall against which her bed was pushed. Gertie told herself that there was something almost immodest about being able to hear him breathing as he slept. He had tumbled into bed with a little grunt of weariness. Gertie lay there another hour, staring into the darkness. Then she began to cry softly, lying on her face with her head between her arms. The cold cream and the salt tears mingled and formed a slippery paste. Gertie wept on because she couldn't help it. The longer she wept, the more difficult her sobs became, until finally they bordered on the hysterical. They filled her lungs until they ached, and reached her throat with a force that jerked her head back. Rap, 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 sounded sharply from the head of her bed. Gertie stopped sobbing, and her heart stopped beating. She lay tense and still, listening. Everyone knows that spooks rap three times at the head of one's bed. It's a regular high sign with them. Rap, rap, rap. Gertie's skin became goose flesh, and cold water effects chased up and down her spine. "'What's your trouble in there?' demanded an unspooky voice so near that Gertie jumped. "'Sick?' It was the kid next door. N "'No, I'm not sick,' faltered Gertie, her mouth close to the wall. Just then a belated sob that had stopped halfway when the raps began hustled on to join its sisters. It took Gertie by surprise and brought prompt response from the other side of the wall. "'I'll bet I scared you green. I didn't mean to, but... On the square, if you're feeling sick, a little nip of brandy will set you up. Excuse my mentioning it, girlie, but I do the same for my sister. I hate like sin to hear a woman suffer like that. And anyway, I don't know whether you're fourteen or forty, so it's perfectly respectable. I'll get the bottle and leave it outside your door. No, you don't, answered Gertie in a hollow voice, praying meanwhile that the woman in the room below might be sleeping. I'm not sick. Honestly, I'm not. I'm just as much obliged, and, and I'm dead sorry I woke you up with my blubbering. I started out with a soft pedal on, but things got away from me. Can you hear me? Like a phonograph. Sure you couldn't use a sip of brandy where it'd do the most good? Sure. Well, then, cut out the weeps and get your beauty sleep, kid. He ain't worth sobbing over anyway, believe me. He? snorted Gertie indignantly. You're cold. There was never anything in peg tops that could make me carry on like the heroine of the Elsie series. Lost your job? No such luck. Well, then, what in Sam Hill could make a woman? Lonesome, snapped Gertie. And the floor walker got fresh today, and I found two gray hairs tonight. 
and I give my next week's pay envelope to hear the double click that our front gate gives back home. Back home? echoed the kid next door in a dangerously loud voice. Say, I want to talk to you. If you'll promise you won't get sore and think I'm fresh, I'll ask you a favor. Slip on a kimono and we'll sneak down to the front stoop and talk it over. I'm as wide awake as a chorus girl and twice as hungry. I've got two apples and a box of crackers. Are you on? Gertie snickered. It isn't done in our best sets, but I'm on. I've got a can of sardines and an orange. I'll be ready in six minutes. She was, too. She wiped off the cold cream and salt tears with a dry towel, did her hair in a schoolgirl braid, and tied it with a big bow, and dressed herself in a black skirt and a baby blue dressing sack. The kid next door was waiting outside in the hall. His gray sweater covered a multitude of sartorial deficiencies. Gertie stared at him, and he stared at Gertie, in the sickly blue light of the boarding house hall, and it took her one half of one second to discover that she liked his mouth and his eyes and the way his hair was mussed. "'Why, you're only a kid,' whispered the kid next door in surprise. Gertie smothered a laugh. "'You're not the first man that's been deceived by a pigtail braid and a baby blue waist. I could locate those two gray hairs for you with my eyes shut and my feet in a sack. Come on, boy. These Robert W. Chalmers situations make me nervous.' Many earnest young writers with a flow of adjectives and a passion for detail have attempted to describe the quiet of a great city at night, when a few million people within it are sleeping, or ought to be. They work in the clang of a distant owl car, and the roar of an occasional L train, and the hollow echo of the footsteps of the late passer-by. They go elaborately into description, and are strong on the brooding hush, but the thing has never been done satisfactorily. Gertie, sitting on the front stoop at two in the morning, with her orange in one hand and the sardine can in the other, put it this way. If I was to hear a cricket chirp now, I'd screech. This isn't really quiet. It's like waiting for a cannon cracker to go off just before the fuse is burned down. The bang isn't there yet, but you hear it a hundred times in your mind before it happens. My name's Augustus G. Eddy, announced the kid next door solemnly. Back home they always called me Gus. You peel that orange while I unroll the top of the sardine can. I'm guilty of having interrupted you in the middle of what the girls call a good cry, and I know you'll have to get it out of your system some way. Take a bite of apple, and then wade right in and tell me what you're doing in the spurg if you don't like it. This thing ought to have slow music, began Gertie. It's pathetic. I came to Chicago from Beloit, Wisconsin, because I thought that little town was a lonesome hole for a vivacious creature like me. Lonesome. Listen while I laugh a low, mirthless laugh. I didn't know anything about the three-ply, double-barreled, extra-heavy brand of loneliness that a big town like this can deal out. Talk about your desert wastes. They're sociable and snug compared to this. I know three-fourths of the people in Beloit, Wisconsin, by their first names. I've lived here six months, and I'm not on informal terms with anybody, except Teddy, the landlady's dog. And he's a trained rat and book agent terrier, not inclined to over-friendliness. When I clerked at the Enterprise store in Beloit, the women used to come in and ask for something we didn't carry, just for an excuse to copy the way the lace yoke effects were planned in my shirtwaists. You ought to see the way those same shirtwaists stack up here. Why, boy... The lingerie waist that the other girls in my department wear make my best hand-tucked effort look like a simple English country blouse. They're so dripping with Irish crochet and real Val and Clooney insertions that it's a wonder the girls don't get stoop-shouldered carrying them around. Hold on a minute, commanded Gus. This thing is uncanny. Our cases dovetail like the deductions in a detective story. Kneel here at my feet, little daughter, and I'll tell you the story of my sad young life. I'm no child of city streets, either. Say, I came to this town because I thought there was a bigger field for me in gents' furnishings. Choke, what? But Gertie didn't smile. She gazed up at Gus, and Gus gazed down at her, and his fingers fiddled absently with a big bow at the end of her braid. And isn't there? asked Gertie sympathetically. Girlie... I haven't saved twelve dollars since I came. 
I'm no tightwad, and I don't believe in packing everything away into a white marble mausoleum, but still a gink kind of whispers to himself that some day he'll be furnishing up a kitchen pantry of his own. Oh, said Gertie. And let me mention in passing, continued Gus, winding the ribbon bow around his finger, that in the last hour or so that whisper's been swelling to a shout. Oh, said Gertie again. You said it but I couldn't buy a second-hand gas stove with what I've saved in the last half year here. Back home they used to think I was a regular little village John Drew, I was so dressy. But here I look like a yokel on circus day compared to the other fellows in the store. All they need is a field glass strung over their shoulder to make them look like a clothing ad in the back of a popular magazine. Say, girlie, you've got the prettiest hair I've seen since I blew in here. Look at that braid, thick as a rope. That's no relation to the piles of jute that the Flossies here stack on their heads, and shines like satin. It ought to, said Gertrude wearily. I brush at a hundred strokes every night. Sometimes I'm so beat that I fall asleep with my brush in the air. The manager won't stand for any romping curls or hooks and eyes that don't connect. Keeps me so busy being beautiful, and what the society writers call well-groomed, that I don't have time to sew the buttons on my underclothes. But don't you get some amusement in the evening? marveled Gus. What was the matter with you and the other girls in the store? Can't you hit it off? Me? No, I guess I was too woodsy for them. I went out with them a couple of times. I guess they're nice girls, all right. But they've got what you call a broader way of looking at things than I have. Living in a little town all your life makes you narrow. These girls... Well, maybe I'll get educated up to their plane some day, but— No, you don't, hissed Gus. Not if I can help it. But you can't, replied Gertie sweetly. My, ain't this a grand night? Evenings like this, I used to love to putter around the yard after supper, sprinkling the grass and weeding the radishes. I'm the greatest kid to fool around with a hose. And flowers? Say, they just grow for me. You ought to have seen my pansies and nasturiums last summer. The fingers of the kid next door wandered until they found Gertie's. They clasped them. This thing just points one way, little one. It's as plain as a path leading up to a cozy little three-room flat up here on the north side somewhere. See it? With me and you married, and playing at housekeeping in a parlor and bedroom and kitchen, and both of us going downtown to work in the morning, just the same as we do now, only not the same either. Wake up, little boy, said Gertie, prying her fingers away from those other detaining ones. I'd fit into a three-room flat like a whale in a kitchen sink. I'm going back to Beloit, Wisconsin. I've learned my lesson all right. There's a fellow there waiting for me. I used to think he was too slow, but say, he's got the nicest little painting and paper hanging business you ever saw, and making money. He's the secretary of the K.P.'s back home. They give some swell little dances during the winter, especially for the married members. In five years, we'll own our own home, with a vegetable garden in the back. I'm a little frog, and it's me for the puddle. Gus stood up slowly. Gertie felt a little pang of compunction when she saw what a boy he was. I don't know when I've enjoyed a talk like this. I've heard about these dawn teas, but I never thought I'd go to one. She said, "'Good night, girlie,' interrupted Gus abruptly. "'It's the dreamless couch for mine. "'We've got a big sail on in tan and black seconds tomorrow. End of Story 1 The Frog and the Puddle In Buttered Side Down by Edna Ferber Chapter 1 of The Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe Compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by My Helen. Life of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Compiled from her letters and journals by her son Charles Edward Stowe. Chapter 1 Childhood. 1811-1824 Death of her mother First journey from home Life at Nut Plains School days and hours with favorite authors 
the new mother litchfield academy and its influence first literary efforts a remarkable composition goes to hartford harriet beecher stowe was born june fourteenth eighteen eleven in the characteristic new england town of litchfield corn her father was the rev dr lyman beecher a distinguished calvinistic divine her mother was on foot his first wife the little newcomer was ushered into a household of happy healthy children and found five brothers and sisters awaiting her the eldest was catherine born september sixth eighteen hundred following her were two sturdy boys william and edward then came Murray, then jog and at last harriet another little harriet born three years before had died when only one month old and the fourth daughter was named in memory of the sister harriet elizabeth beecher just two years after harriet was born in the same month another brother henry word was welcomed to the family circle and after him come charles the last of rosen beecher's children the first memorable incident of harriet's life was the death of her mother which occurred when she was four years old and which ever afterwards remained with her as the tenderest saddest and most sacred memory of her childhood mrs stowe's recollections of her mother are found in a letter to her brother charles afterwards published in the autobiography and correspondence of lyman beecher she says i was between three and four years of age when our mother died and my personal recollections of her are therefore but few but the deep interest and veneration that she inspired in all who knew her was such that during all my childhood i were constantly hearing her spoken of and from one friend or another some incident or anecdote of her life was constantly being impressed upon me mother was one of those strong restful yet widely sympathetic natures in whom all around seemed to find comfort and repose the communion between her and my father was a peculiar one it was an intimacy throughout the whole range of their being there was no human mind in whose decisions he had greater confidence both intellectually and morally he regarded her as the better and stronger portion of himself and i remember hearing him say that after her death his first sensation was a sort of terror like that of a child suddenly shut out alone in the dark in my old childhood only two incidents of my mother twinkled like rays through the darkness one was of our all running and dancing out before her from the nursery to the sitting-room one sabbath morning and her pleasant voice saying after us remember the sabbath day to keep it holy children another remembrance is this mother was an enthusiastic horticulturist in all the small ways that limited means allowed her brother john in new york had just sent her a small parcel of five tulip bulbs i remember rummaging these out of an obscure corner of the nursery one day when she was gone out and being strongly seized with the idea that they were good to eat using all the little english i then possessed to persuade my brothers that these were onions such as grown people ate and would be very nice for us so we fell to and devoured the whole and i recollect being somewhat disappointed in the art switch's taste and thinking that onions was not so nice as i had supposed then mother's serene face appeared at the nursery door and we all ran towards her telling with one voice of our discovery and achievement we had found a bag of onions and had eaten them all up also i remember that there was not even a momentary expression of impatience but that she sat down and said my dear children what you have done makes mamma very sorry those were not onions but roots of beautiful flowers and if you have let them alone we should have next summer in the garden great beautiful red and yellow flowers such as you never saw i remember how drooping and dispirited we all grew at this picture and how sadly we regarded the empty paper bag 
then i have a recollection of her dreading a row to the children miss edgeworth's frank which had just come out i believe and was exciting a good deal of attention among the educational circles of lichfield after that came a time when every one said she was sick and i used to be permitted to go once a day into her room where she sat bolstered up in bed i have a vision of a very fair face with a bright red spot on each cheek and a quiet smile i remember dreaming one night that mamma had got well and of waking with loud transports of joy that were hushed down by some one who came into the room my dream was indeed a true one she was forever well then came the funeral henry was too little to go i can see his golden curls and little black frock as it frolicked in the sun like kitten full of ignoring joy i recollect the morning dresses the tears of the older children the walking to the funeral ground and somebody speaking at the grave then all was closed and we little ones to whom it was so confused asked where she was gone and would she never come back they told us at one time that she had been led in the ground and at another that she had gone to heaven thereupon henry putting us two things together resolved to take through the ground and go to heaven to find her for being discovered under sister catherine's window one morning digging with great zeal and earnestness she called to him to know what he was doing lifting his curly head he answered with great simplicity why i am going to heaven to find mamma although our mother's bodily presence thus disappeared from our circle i think her memory and example had more influence in moulding her family in deterring from evil and exciting to good than the living presence of many mothers it was a memory that met us everywhere for every person in the town from the highest to the lowest seemed to have been so impressed by her character and life that they constantly reflected some portion of it back upon us the passage in uncle tom where augustine st clair describes his mother's influence is a simple reproduction of my old mother's influence as it has always been felt in her family of his deceased wife dr beecher said few women had attained to more remarkable piety her faith was strong and her prayer prevailing it was her wish that all her sons should devote themselves to the ministry and to it she consecrated them with fervent prayer her prayers have been heard all her sons have been converted and are now according to her wish ministers of the christ such was rosen beecher whose influence upon her four-year-old daughter was strong enough to mould the whole after-life of the author of uncle's tom cabin after the mother's death the litchfield home was such a sad lonely place for the child that her aunt harriet foot took her away for a long visit at her grandmother's at nut plains near guideford con the first journey from home the little one had ever made of this visit mrs stowe herself says among my earliest recollections are those of a visit to nut plains immediately after my mother's death aunt harriet foot who was with mother during all her last sickness took me home to stay with her at the close of what seems to me a long day's ride we arrived after dark at a lonely little white farmhouse and were ushered into a latch parlour where a cheerful wood fire was crackling i was placed in the arms of an old lady who held me close and wept silently a thing at which i marvelled for my great loss was already faded from my childish mind i remember being put to bed by my aunt in a latch room on one side of which stood the bed appropriated to her and me and on the other that of my grandmother my aunt harriet was no common character a more energetic human being never undertook the education of a child her ideas of education were those of a vigorous english woman of the old school she believed in the church and had she been born under that regime would have believed in the king stoutly 
although being of the generation following the revolution she was not less stanch supporter of the declaration of independence according to her views the two girls were to be taught to move very gently to speak softly and brightly to say yes ma'am and no ma'am never to tear their clothes to sew to knit at regular hours to go to church on sunday and make all the responses and to come home and be catechized during these catechizings she used to place my little cousin mary and myself bolt upright at her knee while black dinner and harry the bowed boy were ranged at a respectful distance behind us for aunt harriet always impressed it upon her servants to offer themselves lowly and reverently to all their betters a portion of the church catechism that always pleased me particularly when applied to them as it ensured their calling me miss harriet and treating me with a degree of consideration such as i never enjoyed in the more democratic circle at home i became proficient in the church catechism and gave my aunt great satisfaction by the old-fashioned gravity and steadiness with which i learned to repeat it as my father was a congregational minister i believe aunt harriet though the highest of high church women felt some scruples as to whether it was desirable that my religious education should be entirely out of the sphere of my birth therefore when this catechetical exercise was finished she would say now niece you have to learn another catechism because your father is a presbyterian minister and then she would endeavour to make me commit to memory the assembly catechism at this lengthening of the exercise i secretly murmured i was rather pleased at the first question in the church catechism which is certainly quite on the level of any child's understanding what is your name it was such an easy good start i could say it so loud and clear and i was accustomed to compare it with the first question in primer what is the chief end of man as vastly more difficult for me to answer in fact between my own secret unbelief and my old childish impatience of too much catechism the matter was indefinitely postponed after a few ineffectual attempts and i was overjoyed to hear her announce privately to grandmother that she thought it would be time enough for harriet to learn the presbyterian catechism when she went home mingled with the superabundance of catechism and plentiful needlework of child was treated to copious extracts from Lowe's isa buchanan's researches in asia bishop haber's life and dr johnson's works which after her bible and prayer book were her grandmother's favourite reading harriet does not seem to have fully appreciated these but she did enjoy her grandmother's comments upon their biblical readings among the evangelists especially was the old lady perfectly at home and her idea of each of the apostles was so distinct and dramatic that she spoke of them as of familiar acquaintances she would for instance always smile indulgently at peter's remarks and say there he is again now that's just like peter he's always so ready to put in it must have been during this winter spent at nutplants amidst such surroundings that harriet began committing to memory that wonderful assortment of hymns poems and scriptural passages from which in after years she quoted so readily and effectively for her sister catherine in writing of her the following november says harriet is a very good girl she has been to school all this summer and has learned to read very fluently she has committed to memory twenty-seven hymns and two long chapters in the bible she has a remarkably retentive memory and will make a very good scholar at this time the child was five years old and a regular attendant at ma'am kilbourne's school on west street to which she walked every day hand in hand with her chubby rosy-faced bare-footed boyal brother henry ward with the ability to read germinated the intense victory longing that was to be hers through life 
in those days but few books were specially repaired for children and at six years of age we find the little girl hungrily searching for mental food amidst barrels of old sermons and pamphlets stored in a corner of a garret here it seems to her with some thousand of the most unintelligible things an appeal on the unlawfulness of a man marrying his wife's sister turned up in every barrow she investigated by twos or threes or dozens to her soul despaired of finding an end at last her patient search was rewarded for at the very bottom of a barrow of musty sermons she discovered an ancient volume of the arabian nights with this her fortune was made for in these most fascinating of fairy tales the imaginative child discovered a well-spring of joy that was all her own when things went astray with her when her brothers started off on long excursions refusing to take her with them when any of the childish sorrows she had only to curl herself up in some snug corner and sail forth on her bit of enchanted carpet into fairy land to forget all her griefs in recalling her old child life mrs stowe among all the things describes her father's library and gives a vivid bit of her old experiences within its walls she says high above all the noise of the house this room had to me the air of a refuge and a sanctuary its walls were set spread from floor to ceiling with the friendly quiet faces of books and there stood my father's great writing chair on one arm of which lay open always his scrutins concordance and his bible here i loved to retreat and niche myself down in a quiet corner with my favourite books around me i had a kind of sheltered feeling as i thus sat and watched my father writing turning to his books and speaking from time to time to himself in a loud earnest whisper i vaguely felt that he was about some holy and mysterious work quite beyond my little comprehension and i was careful never to disturb him with question or remark the books fringed around filled me too with a solemn awe on the lower shelves were enormous folios on whose backs i spelled in black letters light fit opera a title whereat i wondered considering the bunk of the volumes above these grouped along in friendly social rows were books of all sorts size and bindings the titles of which i had read so often that i knew them by heart there were bell sermons bonus inquiries berg essays top lady on predestination boston fourfold state law serious call and all the works of that kind these i looked over wistfully day after day without even a hope of getting something interesting out of them the thought that father could read and understand things like these filled me with a vague awe and i wonder if i would ever be old enough to know what it all was about but there was one of my father's books that proved a mind of wealth to me it was a happy hour when he brought home and set up in his bookcase cotton mather's malaria in a new edition of two volumes what wonderful stories those stories too about my old country stories that made me feel the very ground i chalked on to be consecrated by some special dealing with god's providence in continuing these reminiscences mrs stowe describes as follows her sensations upon first hearing the declaration of independence i had never heard it before and even now had but a vague idea of what was meant by some parts of it still i gathered enough from the recital of the abuses and injuries that had driven my nation to this cause to feel myself swelling with indignation and ready with all my little mind and strength to upload the concluding passage which colonel tamarge rendered with resounding majesty i was as ready as any of them to pledge my life fortune and sacred honour for such a cause the heroic elements were strong in me having a come down by ordinary generation from a long line of puritan ancestry and just now it made me long to do something i knew not what to fight for my country or to make some declaration on my own account when harriet was nearly six years old her father married as his second wife 
Miss Harriet Porter of Portland, Maine, and Mrs. Doe thus describes her new mother. I slept in the nursery with my two younger brothers. We knew that father was gone away somewhere on a journey and were expected home. Therefore, the sound of a bustle in the house the more easily awoke us. As father came into our room, our new mother followed him. She was very fair, with bright blue eyes and soft auburn hair, bowed well with a black velvet bandeau. Then to us, she seemed very beautiful. Never did stepmother make a brightier or sweeter impression. The morning following, her arrival, we looked at her with awe. She seemed to us so fair, so delicate, so elegant, that we were almost afraid to go near her. We must have appeared to her as rough, red-faced, country children, honest, obedient, and bashful. She was peculiarly dainty and neat in all her ways and arrangements, and I used to feel breezy, rough, and rude in her presence. In her religion she was distinguished for a most unfaltering Christ worship. She was of a type noble but severe, naturally hard, correct, exact, and exacting, with intense natural and moral ideality. Had it not been that Dr. Payson had set up and kept for her a tender, human, loving Christ, she would have been only a conscientious bigot. This image, however, gave softness and warmth to her religious life, and I have since noticed how her Christ enthusiasm has sprung up in the hearts of all her children. In writing to her old home of her first impressions of her new one, Mrs. Beecher says, It is a very lovely family, and with heartfelt gratitude I observed how cheerful and healthy they were. The sentiment is greatly increased, since I perceive them to be of agreeable habits and some of them of uncommon intellect. This new mother proved to be indeed all that the name implies to her husband's children and never did they have occasion to call her aught over van blessed. Another year finds a new baby brother, Frederick by name, added to the family. At this time, too, we catch a characteristic glimpse of Harriet in one of her sister Catherine's letters. She says, Last week we interred John Jr. with funeral honors by the side of old Tom of happy memory. Our Harriet is chef mourner always at the funerals, she asked for what she called an epithet for the gravestone of Tom Jr., which it gave as follows. Here lies our kit, who had a fit, and acted queer, shot with a gun, her race is run, and she lies here. In June 1820, little Frederick died from a scarlet fever, and Harriet was seized with a violent attack of the same dread disease, but, after a severe struggle, recovered. Following her happy, hearty drive life, we find her chomping through the woods or going on fishing excursions with her brothers, sitting thoughtfully in her father's study, listening eagerly to the animated theological discussions of the day, visiting her grandmother at Nutsplans, and figuring as one of the brightest scholars in the Litchfield Academy, taught by Mr. John Brace and Miss Harris. When she was eleven years old, her brother Edward wrote of her. Harriet writes everything she can lay hands on, and sews, and knits diligently. At this time, she was no longer the youngest girl of the family, for another sister, Isabella, had been born in 1822. This event served greatly to mature her, as she was entrusted with much of the care of the baby out of school hours. It was not, however, allowed to interfere in any way with her studies, and, under the skilful direction of her beloved teachers, she seemed to absorb knowledge with every sense. She herself writes, Much of the training and inspiration of my early days consisted not in the things that I was supposed to be studying, but in hearing. While I sat and unnoticed at my desk, the conversation of Mr. Brace with the older classes. There, from hour to hour, I listened with eager ears to historical criticisms and discussions, or to recitations in such works as Pali's Moral Philosophy, Blair's Rhetoric, A Lesson on Taste, 
all full of most awakening suggestions to my thoughts mr praise exceeded all teachers i ever knew in the faculty of teaching composition the constant excitement in which he kept the minds of his pupils the wide and varied regions of thought into which he led them formed a preparation for composition the main requisite for which is to have something which one feels interested to say can the immortality of the soul be proved by the light of nature it has justly been concluded by the philosophers of every age that the proper study of mankind is man and his nature and composition both physical and mental have been subject to the most critical examination in the course of these researches many have been at a loss to account for the change which takes place in the body at the time of death by some it has been attributed to the flight of its tenant and by others to its final annihilation the questions what becomes of the soul at the time of death and if it be not annihilated what is its destiny after death are those which from the interest that we all feel in them will probably engross universal attention in pursuing these inquiries it will be necessary to divest ourselves of all that knowledge which we have obtained from the light which revelation has shed over them and place ourselves in the same position as the philosophers of past ages when considering the same subject the first argument which has been advanced to prove the immortality of the soul is drawn from the nature of the mind itself it has said the supporters of this theory no composition of parts and therefore as there are no particles is not susceptible of divisibility and cannot be acted upon by decay and therefore if it will not decay it will exist forever now because the mind is not susceptible of decay effected on the ordinary way by a gradual separation of particles affords no proof that the same omnipotent power which created it cannot by another simple exertion of power again reduce it to nothing the only reason for belief which this argument affords is that the soul cannot be acted upon by decay but it does not prove that it cannot destroy its existence therefore for the validity of this argument it must either be proved that the creator has not the power to destroy it or that he has not the will but as neither of these can be established our immortality is left dependent on the pleasure of the creator but it is said that it is evident that the creator desired the soul for immortality or he would never have created it so essentially different from the body for had they both been desired for the same end they would both have been created alike as there would have been no object in forming them otherwise this only proves that the soul and body had not the same destinations now of what these destinations are we know nothing and after much useless reasoning we return where we began our argument depending upon the good pleasure of the creator and here it is said that being of such infinite wisdom and benevolence as that of which the creator is possessed would not have formed a man with such vast capacities and balanced desires and would have given him no opportunity for exercising them in order to establish the validity of this argument it is necessary to prove by the light of nature that the greater is benevolent which being impracticable is of itself sufficient to render the argument invalid but the argument proceeds upon the supposition that to destroy the soul would be unwise now this is arraigning the all-wise before the tribunal of his subjects to answer for the mistakes in his government can we look into the council of the unsearchable and see what means are made to answer their ends we do not know but the destruction of the soul may in the government of god be made to answer such a purpose that its existence would be contrary to the dictates of wisdom the great desire of the soul for immortality its secret in its horror of annihilation has been brought to prove its immortality but do we always buy this horror or this desire is it not much more evident that the great majority of mankind have no such dread at all true that there is a strong feeling of horror excited 
by the idea of perishing from the earth and being forgotten of losing all those honours and all that fame awaited them many feel the secret horror when they look down upon the veil of futurity and reflect that though now the idols of the world so all which will be left them will be the common portion of mankind oblivion but this dread does not arise from any idea of a destiny beyond the tomb and even with this true it would afford no proof that the mind would exist for ever merely from its strong desires for it might with as much correctness be argued that the body will exist for ever because we have a great dread of dying and upon this principle nothing which we strongly desire would ever be withheld from us and no evil that we greatly dread will ever come upon us a principle evidently false again it has been said that a constant progression of the powers of the mind affords another proof of its immortality concerning this addison remarks were a human soul ever thus at a stand in her acquirements were her faculties to be full blown and incapable of further enlargements i could imagine that she might fall away insensibly and drop at once into a state of annihilation but can we believe the thinking being that he is in a perpetual progression of improvement and travelling on from to perfection after having just looked abroad into the works of her creator and made a few discoveries of his infinite wisdom and goodness must perish at her first setting out and in the very beginning of her inquiries in answer to this it might be said that the soul is not always progressing in her powers is it not rather a subject of general remark that those brilliant times which in youth expand in manhood become stationary and in old age gradually sink to decay till when the ancient man descends to the tomb scarce a wreck of that once powerful mind remains who but upon reading the history of england does not look with awe upon the effects produced by the talents of her elizabeth who but admires that undaunted firmness in time of peace and that profound depth in policy which she displayed in the cabinet yet behold the tragical end of this learned this politic princess behold the triumph of age and sickness over her once powerful talents and say not that the faculties of man are always progressing in their powers from the activity of the mind at the hour of death has also been deduced its immortality but it is not true that the mind is always active at the time of death we find recorded in history numberless instances of those talents which were once adequate to the governments of a nation being so weakened and pansied by the touch of sickness as scarcely to tell to beholders what they once were the talents of the statesman the wisdom of the sage the courage and might of the warrior are instantly destroyed by it and all that remains of them is the waste of idiocy or the madness of insanity some minds there are who at the time of death retain their faculties very much impaired and if the argument be valid these are the only cases where immortality is conferred again it is urged that the inequality of rewards and punishments in this world demand another in which virtue may be rewarded and vice punished this argument in the first place takes for its foundation that by the light of nature the distinction between virtue and vice can be discovered by some this is absolutely disbelieved and by all considered as extremely doubtful and secondly it puts the creator under an obligation to reward and punish the actions of his creatures no such obligation exists and therefore the argument cannot be valid and this supposes the creator to be a being of justice which cannot by the light of nature be proved and as the whole argument rests upon this foundation it certainly cannot be correct this argument also directly impeaches the wisdom of the creator for the sense of it is this that forasmuch as he was not able to manage his governments in this world he must have another in which to rectify the mistakes and oversights of this and what an idea would this give us of our all-wise creator it is also said that all nations have some conceptions of a future state 
that the ancient greeks and romans believed in it that no nation has been found but had possessed some idea of a future state of existence but the belief arose more from the fact that they wished it to be so wrong from any real ground of belief for arguments appear much more plausible when the mind wishes to be convinced but it is said that every nation however circumstanced possessed some idea of a future state for this we may account by the fact that it was handed down by tradition from the time of the flood from all these arguments which however plausible at first sight are found to be futile may be argued the necessity of a revelation without it the destiny of the noblest of the works of god would have been left in obscurity never till the blessed light of the gospel dawned on the borders of the pit and the harems of the cross proclaimed peace on earth and good will to men was it that bewildered and misled man was enabled to trace its celestial origin and glorious destiny the son of the gospel has dispelled the darkness that has rested on objects beyond the tomb in the gospel man learned that when the dust returned to dust the spirit fled to the god who gave it he there found that though man has lost the image of his divine creator he is still destined after this earthly house of his tabernacle is dissolved to an inheritance incorruptible and defiled and that faith not away to a house not made with hands internal in the heavens soon after the writing of this remarkable conversation harriet's shy life in lichfield came to an end for that same year she went to hartford to pursue her studies in a school which had been recently established by her sister catherine in that city End of chapter one recording by my helen comment and review by charlotte perkins gilman this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Bush, November 2009. Comment and Review by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Published in the Forerunner, Volume 2, Number 6. The New Machiavelli by H. G. Wells. Duffield and Company, New York. $1.35 net. In times past, when an unusual woman showed marked capacity in some line of human service, all were quick to see and point out with scorn or pity the feminine limitations of her work. It was done like a woman, they said. It was womanish. It was to be grudgingly measured as good for a woman, if good at all. Now we are beginning to use something of the opposite point of view in regard to men's achievements, and we need it constantly in considering the work of Mr. H. G. Wells. The masculine limitations of this author are marked and persistent. He sees life wholly from the side of sex, his sex, and when, in this last book, he frankly announces himself feminist, it is only sex in women which he sees, and for which he demands social recognition. Of course, it is difficult for a man to overcome this bias, more so than for a woman, yet many great men have been able to do it. Mr. Wells has not. Note this record of masculine emotion and conduct, its morbid excesses blasting an otherwise valuable life, indeed, several of them, yet discussed with naive solemnity, as if it was all in the necessary order of nature. The book tells of a boy, somewhat unfortunate in birth and breeding, as most of us are, growing up to keen-minded speculation on human life, its pressing needs and problems. Yet in all this wide sociological interest, totally oblivious to such a predominating social question as the woman's movement. The girl he passes in the street who stirs his boyish sensations, the woman of his frankly told experiences, the woman he marries. I suppose it was because I had so great a need of such help as her whiteness proffered, he says. I wanted a woman to save me. And the next one with whom he overwhelmingly falls in love, these are real to him, and one other, mercilessly caricatured. These impress him, but the change in social relation of thousands does not impress him. The work is powerful and clear. The view of the present confusion of methods, especially in the rearing of young people, is vividly appealing. 
but the criticisms of political life show a strange lack of adjustment in eyes that see so far. To be in the immediate workings of the political department of the social body must necessarily be confusing. The social philosopher can see an ordered procession of changes for centuries ahead, but the politician must introduce those changes step by step, with some heat. The worst thing about this book is the spirit of personal enmity it reveals, the Dantesque consigning of enemies to the hell of the wickedly clever characterization. Little London, where everybody who is anybody knows everybody else, buzzed madly over the book. This is pitiful work. If there was no personal animus in this bitter ridicule, it shows sheer malice. If there was a personal ground, it implicates the author with his creation most painfully. Mr. Wells is easily among the first of those who are kindled with the social consciousness and able to spread the light and heat of it to others. His work is extremely able, though irregular, and with his unrivaled imagination, wide scientific knowledge, and highly developed art, he ought to be one of the prime movers of the world today. But here enter the disabilities of sex. Not only, as in this tale, is a man's political life ruined by open scandal, but the artist, scientist, and publicist is cut off from highest usefulness by this constant limitation. In a publication whose popularity proves its knowledge of the prevailing tastes of the man in the street, has been running a story most pleasing and absorbing to that man. With passionate eagerness he read it from week to week, discussed it with his friends, commented sagely on its florid philosophy. This story is The Grain of Dust by the late David Graham Phillips. It is a man's story utterly, masculine from start to finish, with women only thrown in as a background. The vain and shallow fiancé, the vain and shallow sister, the vain and shallow girl who served as a grain of dust to stop the action of the hero's works. Not that she had power even to do that. The power was all in him. It isn't the woman who makes a fool of the man, said Norman. It's the man who makes a fool of himself. The most amusing feature of the book is this, the ultra-male hero, vain beyond belief, brutally self-confident, unprincipled as a fish, indifferent to any interests but his own, self-indulgent to a degree which would have made him a shameful wreck in five years had not the author endowed him with a magic immunity to all excesses, and first, last, and always, the ceaseless mouthpiece of an egotism unmeasured and unashamed. This man dwells continually on the vanity and egotism of women. Because a girl, the effect of whose marvelous ever-changing beauty forms the subject matter of the story, thinks she is beautiful, therefore she is a monument of the egotism of her sex. Because another girl, whom this lovable hero was about to marry for her beauty, money, and position, and who was somewhat in love with him, really expected him to love her, really resented his loving another woman while relentlessly going on to marry her for business purposes, and really recognized in herself the beauty, wealth, and position he was marrying her for. She was another monument of feminine egotism. It would seem on the face of it that if one wished to write a book to establish the utter incapacity, selfishness, and vanity of women, one would choose a type of that sort and surround her with the effective contrast of useful, noble, modest, and unselfish men. Such a woman, so exhibited, should exert her arts in vain upon these noble characters. In this story, however, we have for our heroine a quiet, lovely girl, efficient and devoted as a daughter, self-supporting and self-respecting under long temptation, finally choosing to marry her chief pursuer, even without love, preferring his wealth and professed devotion to long poverty and possible failure and shame, a deed at worst no more to be condemned than his earlier attempt. His wealth, by the way, was non-existent when he married her. He deliberately deceived her in this, and his love vanished on the morning after. Thereafter he treats her as an upper servant, whose only business in life is to minister to his personal comfort, whose only claim on him was for support, and in her new efforts to please him, forgetting that she had done the work of a house for years and cared tenderly for an absent-minded father, while at the same time earning her living at distasteful labor, he is at great pains to show her pitifully inefficient and never more than moderately successful. 
and we can never ask the author if this book was really meant as a satire on men. The Players of London, written by Louise Beecher Chancellor, decorated by Harry B. Matthews, published by B. W. Dodge Company, New York, 1909. This is not a new book in the strict publisher sense, but it is an extremely attractive one, with its binding of lilac and gold, its profuse inner trimmings of lilac, and vivid illuminations in black and white. The story is a simple one, of the days of good Queen Bess, with no less a person for the hero than Master William Shakespeare, and for the heroine the first woman to appear on the English stage. It does seem strange indeed for Romeo and Juliet to be written with the expectation of some lads taking the part of that passionate young heroine. But this appears to be what Shakespeare did. How he was misled in the manner, for what noble purpose, and to what poor end, is shown in this old world tale. End of Comment and Review by Charlotte Perkins Gilman Venus's Dove This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abigail Bartels Venus's Dove by Lydia Maria Child In old heathen times, on the shore of the Adriatic, lived a little girl whose greatest pleasure was to wander by the side of the lonely sea. She liked better to sit on a high rock with the spray just tossing against her feet than to play with her village companions, who laughed at her for her wild ways, and asked her if she were the child of Neptune, and if she dwelt in a shell palace under the water, although they knew very well that old Minos, the fisherman, was her father, and that she lived in a little hut, just above the line of seaweed which the highest tides leave upon the beach. One day Ida roamed far along the beach, amusing herself making deep footprints in the sand, which the rising tide quickly filled, when at last she came upon a high wall of rock, too steep to climb, yet looking as if a pleasant bay might be beyond. She scrambled along the rock, slippery with seaweed, until she could peep round into a great cave, before which was a little beach of smooth white sand, with dark frowning rocks all around, except where the sea broke gently in upon it. In the darkness of the cave an old woman leaned over a book. Its brilliant cover attracted Ida, who, half in fear, stole nearer and nearer, treading so softly in the sand that her footsteps could not be heard, and at last seated herself in the shadow by the old woman and listened to the wonderful stories which she read in a low, murmuring voice. High upon Olympus, on his golden throne, the blue sky shines above him, and around stand the immortals. And then, mingled with the sound of the ways, came songs from Apollo's lyre, and descriptions of Bacchus, drawn by his soft-footed leopards, of Venus and her snowy doves, of fauns and nymphs and wondrous people, of whom Ida had never before heard. She listened until the sun set and night darkened upon the waters, then slowly retraced her way home, thinking every cloud that floated above her might be a messenger from Olympus, and that every fleck of foam was perhaps the little white hand of a nereid sporting amid the waves. In vain came her cousin Lara the next morning, to ask her to go in quest of crabs and sea urchins with the other children. Ida went off alone on another quest. The old woman sat in the cave with the morning sun glancing upon her silver hair and upon a most beautiful picture, to which she had just turned. Now Ida was an affectionate child. She loved her father, although she but seldom saw him, as he was out upon the sea for weeks at a time. And she loved her Aunt Lydian and her cousins, and all who were kind to her. Yet she could not but see that Apollo, with his golden lyre and flashing eyes, had something more glorious in him than she had ever seen in her father, even on the day when he came smiling home, bringing the largest fish he had ever caught. And Minerva's helmet was certainly more splendid than the piece of cloth Aunt Lydian wore on her head, 
and cupids with fluttering wings were much prettier than her little brown-armed cousins without any so she forgot all her old friends and day and night her dreams were full of lofty forms with golden hair and faces like the noonday sun and being an affectionate child she liked to do something for those she loved and she began to fancy what she could do for these unknown immortals of whom she dreamed the old woman had retreated into the depth of the cave whither ida did not venture to follow her and she would sit just within it gazing through its dark arch upon the wide waters and wondering if the bright sunbeams which pierced through the clouds and slanted far down upon the distant sea were not stairs by which she might ascend to olympus then she would think of the boat her father made for her of the ivory tusks he once bought from a far-off land of the pile of shells she had herself collected all very valuable to her but she doubted a little whether they would be much valued upon olympus and she could not go thither without some offering worthy of the immortals one day she found upon the shore a shell curved like a beautiful vase ah this is just the thing she exclaimed i will fill it with honey there is nothing so delicious as honey even the immortals must like that and away she went deep into a wooded dell where the stores of the wild bee were hidden how she found her way to olympus is known only to herself i believe she first climbed some rocks then a cloud then sprang over a rainbow bridge and at last scaled a long sunbeam which led her straight to the marble steps of jupiter's high throne how joyfully she mounted sometimes looking up to marvel at the height of the steps which seemed to ascend into the very sky sometimes looking down at her little shell of honey thinking how brightly it shone like pure gold and how pleased jupiter would be with it at last she stood upon the summit of olympus and with timid step walked through the circle of gazing immortals until she came before the throne of jupiter there she knelt to lift the shell vase and honey nectar to his sceptred hand but trembled so much that she spilt the honey on his jeweled footstool it seemed as if she beheld at once every face in that grand assembly jupiter apparently did not notice her but juno fixed her haughty gaze upon her apollo shot a glance of scorn minerva frowned venus turned away her head bacchus looked annoyed mercury smiled and poor little ida covering her face with her apron fled through the great hall and down the marble steps on the very lowest one she sat down with her feet in a cloud and wept most bitterly soon she heard a fluttering in the air and iris glanced by and vanished in the cloud presently she returned bringing with her a little girl whom ida had often seen frolicking among the other children a sunny-haired rosy-cheeked child named hevi the veriest romp in the village ida had always thought her a foolish little thing because she was always playing about like a kitten and never came to the seashore to listen to the winds and to see the great waves roll in and now here she was ascending the marble stairs with her white feet and rosy smile and rainbow colors from the wings of iris glittering all around her ida knew by the crystal vase she bore that hebe was to serve the immortals and she longed to peep in and see how they would receive her but she feared the haughty gaze of juno and the scornful glance of apollo so burying her face in her hands she remained weeping on the step after a long while she heard a light motion beside her and looking up saw the beautiful eyes of psyche looking gently down upon her ah little girl she said you were sadly awkward i pitied you very much for i know what it is for a mortal to stand among the immortals i could never have been here if i had not been brought by love but i also loved them sobbed ida psyche smiled a little yes my child you were dazzled by their beauty and thought you could fly up hither on the first morning breeze but no the gods are not easily approached 
Weary were the works I had to perform before I could be admitted, although led by Cupid. And know also that all who enter must come with fair foreheads and serene eyes. You are a wee thing with sad, shy eyes, and then those dusty feet of yours, Jupiter would never like to have those treading upon his golden floors. It is useless to sit weeping here. Minerva will order you off if she finds you. She has care of the steps. You had better go back to your village and learn how to spin with your mother. But I have no mother, cried Ida, and my father is always out fishing. If I go among the children, they will only laugh at me, because I told them such grand stories about the immortals, and left their plays to wander alone on the shore, and how can I go back to seaweed and rocks again, after having had a glimpse of this golden Olympus? Oh, I wish I were only a little brown leaf. And she wept more and more, as if her very heart would break. Psyche looked thoughtfully at her a while, and then said, "'Would you like to be one of the doves of Venus?' "'Oh, yes!' exclaimed Ida, her eyes brightening. "'But remember, you will have to obey her every fancy, and fly far and wide, and her jeweled car is not light, nor does she drive with gentle rain.' But Ida, with clasped hands, entreated that she might become one of Venus's doves, so Psyche kissed her tearful face, and she was changed into a dove with soft, bright eyes, dainty red feet, and a breast white as the sea foam. She flew into the circle of immortals, and none recognized in her the little stumbling girl, except Mercury, who merely smiled to himself and was too good-natured to reveal the secret. Venus was much pleased to see a new shining dove fluttering at her feet, and immediately harnessed it to her car with delicate hands, and flew far over land and sea. Whether the little dove Ida found Venus in her winged car a weary burden to draw, I cannot tell you, but some time you may yourself become one of Venus's doves, and then you will know all about it. End of Venus's Dove by Lydia Maria Child A November Night This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abigail Bartels a November Night by Sarah Teasdale There, see the line of lights, a chain of stars down either side the street. Why can't you lift the chain and give it to me, a necklace for my throat? I'd twist it round and you could play with it. You smile at me, as though I were a little dreamy child, behind whose eyes the fairies live. And see, the people on the street look up at us, all envious. We are a king and queen. Our royal carriage is a motor bus. We watch our subjects with haughty joy. How still you are! Have you been hard at work? And are you tired tonight? It is so long since I have seen you. Four whole days, I think. My heart is crowded full of foolish things, like early flowers in an April meadow, and I must give them to you, all of them, before they fade. The people I have met, the play I saw, the trivial shifting things that loom too big or shrink too little, shadows that hurry, gesturing along the wall, haunting or gay, and yet they all grow real and take their proper size here in my heart when you have seen them. There's the plaza now, a lake of light. Tonight it almost seems that all the lights are gathering in your eyes, drawn somehow toward you. See the open park? lying beneath us with a million lamps, scattered in wise disorder like the stars. We look down on them as God must look down, on constellations floating under Him, tangled in clouds. Come, then, and let us walk, since we have reached the park. It is our garden, all black and bloomless this winter night, but we bring April with us, you and I. 
we have set the whole world on the trail of spring. I think that every path we ever took has marked our footprints in mysterious fire, delicate gold that only fairies see. When they wake up at dawn in hollow tree trunks and come out on the drowsy part, they look along the empty paths and say, Oh, here they went, and here, and here, and here. Come, see, here is their bench. Take hands and let us dance about it in a windy ring and make a circle round it. Only they can cross when they come back again. Look at the lake. Do you remember how we watched the swans that night in late October while they slept? Swans must have stately dreams, I think. But now the lake bears only thin reflected lights that shake a little. How I long to take one from the cold black water, new-made gold, to give you in your hand. And see, and see, there is a star deep in the lake, a star. Oh, dimmer than a pearl, if you stoop down, your hand could almost reach it up to me. There was a new frail yellow moon tonight. I wish you could have had it for a cup, with stars like dew to fill it to the brim. How cold it is. Even the lights are cold. They have put shawls of fog around them, see? What if the air should grow so dimly white that we would lose our way along the paths, made new by walls of moving mist, receding the more we follow? What a silver night! That was our bench, the time you said to me, the long new poem. But how different now! How eerie with the curtain of fog, making it strange to all the friendly trees. There is no wind, and yet great curving scrolls carve themselves, ever changing in the mist. Walk on a little, let me stand here watching, to see you, too, grown strange to me and far. I used to wonder how the park would be if one night we could have it all alone, no lovers with close arm-encircled waists to whisper and break in upon our dreams. And now we have it. Every wish comes true. We are alone now in a fleecy world. Even the stars have gone. We, too, alone. End of A November Night The Lumley Autograph by Susan Fenimore Cooper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lumley Autograph by Susan Fenimore Cooper not long since, an American author received an application from a German correspondent for a few autographs, the number of names applied for amounting to more than a hundred, and covering several sheets of foolscap. A few years since, an Englishman of literary note sent his album to a distinguished poet in Paris for his contribution, when the volume was actually stolen from a room where every other article was left untouched showing that autographs were more valuable in the eyes of the thief than any other property. Amused with the recollection of these facts, and others of the same kind, some idle hours were given by the writer to the following view of this mania of the day. The month of November of the year 1600 and blank was cheerless and dark, as November has never failed to be within the foggy, smoky bounds of the great city of London. It was one of the worst days of the season. What light there was seemed an emanation from the dull earth. The heavens would scarce have owned it, veiled as they were, by an opaque canopy of fog which weighed heavily upon the breathing multitude below. Gloom penetrated everywhere, no barriers so strong, no good influences so potent, as wholly to ward off the spell thrown over that mighty town by the spirits of chill and damp. They clung to the silken draperies of luxury. They were felt within the busy circle of industry. They crept about the family hearth, but abroad in the public ways, and in the wretched haunts of misery, they held undisputed sway. Among the throng which choked the passage of Temple Bar toward evening, an individual, shabbily clad, was dragging his steps wearily along, his pallid countenance bearing an expression of misery beyond the more common cares of his fellow-passengers. 
Turning from the great thoroughfare, he passed into a narrow lane, and reaching the door of a mean dwelling he entered, ascended a dirty stairway four stories high, and stood in his garret lodging. If that garret was bare, cold, and dark, it was only like others, in which many a man before and since has pined away years of neglect and penury, at the very moment when his genius was cheering, enriching, enlightening his country and his race. That the individual whose steps we have followed was indeed a man of genius could not be doubted by one who had met the glance of that deep, clear, piercing eye, clouded though it was at that moment by misery of body and mind that amounted to the extreme of anguish. The garret of the stranger contained no food, no fuel, no light. Its occupant was suffering from cold, hunger, and wretchedness. Throwing himself on a broken chair, he clenched his fingers over the manuscript, held with a pale and emaciated hand. "'Shall I die of hunger, or shall I make one more effort?' he exclaimed, in a voice in which bitterness gave a momentary power to debility. "'I will write once more to my patron, possibly—' Without waiting to finish the sentence, he groped about in the dull twilight for ink and paper. Resting the sheet on a book, he wrote in a hand barely legible. November 20th, 16, blank. My lord, I have no light, and cannot see to write— no fire, and my fingers are stiff with cold. I have not tasted food for eight and forty hours, and I am faint. Three times, my lord, I have been at your door to-day, but could not obtain admittance. This note may yet reach you in time to save a fellow-creature from starvation. I have not a farthing left, nor credit for a half-penny. Small debts press upon me, and the publishers refused my last poem. Unless relieved within a few hours— I must perish. Your lordship's most humble, most obedient, most grateful servant, blank, blank. This letter, scarcely legible from the agitation and misery which enfeebled the hand that wrote it, was folded and directed, and again the writer left his garret lodging on the errand of beggary. He descended the narrow stairway, slowly dragged his steps through the lane, and sought the dwelling of his patron. Whether he obtained admittance, or was again turned from the door, whether his necessities were relieved, or the letter was idly thrown aside unopened, we cannot say. Once more mingled with the crowd, we lose sight of him. It is not the man but the letter which engages our attention to-day. There is still much doubt and uncertainty connected with the subsequent fate of the poor poet, but the note written at that painful moment has had a brilliant career a history eventful throughout. If the reader is partial to details of misery and poverty, any volume of general literary biography will furnish him with an abundant supply. For such has too often proved the lot of those who have built up the noble edifice of British literature. Like the bands of labourers on the Egyptian pyramid, theirs was too often a mess of leeks, while milk and honey and oil were the portion of those for whom they toiled, those in whose honour and for whose advantage the monument was raised. Patrons, whether single individuals or nations, have too often proved but indifferent friends, careless and forgetful of those whom they proudly pretend to foster. But leaving the poor poets, with his sorrows, to the regular biographer, we choose rather the lighter task of relating the history of the letter itself. A man's works are often preferred before himself, and it is believed that in this— the day of autographs, no further apology will be needed for the course taken on the present occasion. We hold ourselves, indeed, entitled to the especial gratitude of collectors for the following sketch of a document maintaining so high a rank in their estimation. And justly might the Lumley letter claim a full share of literary homage. Boasting a distinguished signature, it possessed the first essential of a superior autograph. For, Although a rose under any other name may smell as sweet, yet it is clear that with regard to everything coming from the pen, whether folio or billet doux, imaginative poem or matter-of-fact note of hand, there is a vast deal in this important item, which is often the very life and stamina of the whole production. Then again, the subject of extreme want is one of general interest. 
while the allusion to the unpublished poem must always prove an especial attraction to the curious. Such were the intrinsic merits of the document, in addition to which, sober time lent his aid to enhance its value, and capricious fortune added a peculiar charm of mystery, which few papers of the kind could claim to the same extent. The appearance also of this interesting paper was always admitted to be entirely worthy of its fame. The handwriting fully carried out the idea of extreme debility and agitation corresponding with its nature, while a larger and a lesser blot bore painful testimony to that recklessness of property which a starving man might be supposed to feel. One corner had been ruthlessly abstracted at the time it was seen by the writer of this notice, and with it the last figures of the date. A considerable rent crossed the sheet from left to right, but happily without injuring its contents. Several punctures were also observed, one of these encroaching very critically upon the signature. But I need not add that these marks of age and harsh treatment, like the scars on the face of a veteran, far from being blemishes, were acknowledged to be so many additional embellishments. The colouring of the piece was of that precious hue, verging here and there on the dingy, the very tint most charming in the eyes of an antiquary, and which time alone can bestow. In fact, one rarely sees a relic of the kind, more perfect in colour, more expressive in its general aspect, or more becoming to an album, from the fine contrast between its poverty-stricken air, torn, worn, and soiled, and the rich, embossed, unsullied leaf on which it reposed, like some dark Rembrandt within its gilded frame. In short, it was the very torso of autographs. Happily the position which it finally attained was one worthy of its merits, and we could not have wished it a more elegant shrine than the precious pages of the Holberton album, a volume encased in velvet, secured with jewelled clasps, reposing on a tasteful étagère. Étagère, a small table or shelf for displaying curios. French. But I proceed without further delay to relate some of the more important steps in the progress of this interesting paper, from the garret of the starving poet to the drawing-rooms of Holberton House, merely observing, by way of preface, that the following notice may be relied on so far as it goes, the writer, Colonel Jonathan Howard of Trenton, New Jersey, having had access to the very best authorities, and having also had the honour of being enlisted in the service of the Lumley Autograph, upon an occasion of some importance, as will be shown by the narrative. It was just one hundred years since, in 1745, that this celebrated letter was first brought to light, from the obscurity in which it had already lain some half a century, and which no subsequent research has been able to fully clear away. In the month of August of that year, the Rev. John Lumley, tutor to Lord G., had the honour of discovering this curious relic under the following circumstances. Mr. Lumley was one day perched on the topmost step of a library ladder, looking over a black velvet volume of Hollingshed from the well-filled shelves of his pupil. Suddenly he paused, and his antiquarian instincts were aroused by the sight of a sheet of paper, yellow and time-worn. He seized it with the eagerness of a bookworm, and in so doing dropped the volume of Hollingshed alarmingly near the wig-covered head of his youthful pupil, who, with closed eyes and open mouth, lay reclining on a sofa below. The book, grazing the curls of the young lord's wig, he sprang up from his nap, alive and sound, though somewhat startled. Hollingshed, Raphael Hollingshed, D. 1580, famous writer of British historical chronicles, used by Shakespeare as source for some of his plays. "'Hang it, Lumley! What a rumpus you keep up among the books! You well-nigh drove that old volume into my head, by a process more summary than usual.' The learned tutor made a thousand apologies, as he descended the ladder, but on touching the floor his delight burst forth. "'It was this paper, my lord, which made me so awkward. I have lighted on a document of the greatest interest.' "'What is it?' asked the pupil, looking askance at letter and tutor. "'An original letter which comes to hand, just in time for my lives of the tragedians, the volume to be dedicated to your lordship. It is a letter of poor Otway.' "'Otway, 
Thomas Otway, 1652 to 1685, English playwright who wrote a number of important tragedies in verse, but who died destitute at the age of thirty-three. The Coopers were familiar with his work. James Fenimore Cooper used quotations from Otway's The Orphan, for three chapter-heading epigraphs in his 1850 novel The Ways of the Hour. Otway, what, the fellow you were boring me about last night? The same, my lord, the poet Otway, you may remember we saw his Venice preserved last week. It is a highly interesting letter, written in great distress, and confirms the story of his starvation. You see the signature. Venice Preserved, a well-known play by Otway, written in 1682. That name, Otway, well, to my mind it is as much like Genghis Khan. Oh, my lord, Thomas Otway clearly. Signatures are always more or less confused. Well, have it your own way. It may be Tom, Dick, or Harry, for all I care, said the youth, stretching himself preparatory to a visit to his kennels, and such was his indifference to this literary treasure that he readily gave it to his tutor. In those days few lords were literary. Mr. Lumley's delight at this discovery was very much increased by the fact that he was at that moment anxious to bring out an edition of the English tragedians of the seventeenth century. The lives of several of these authors had already been written by him, and he was at that moment engaged on that of Otway. A noted publisher had taken the matter into consideration, and if the undertaking gave promise of being both palatable to the public and profitable to himself, a prospectus was to be issued. Now here was a little titbit which the public would doubtless relish, for it was beginning to feel some interest in Otway's starvation, the poet having been dead half a century. It is true that the signature of the poor starving author, whoever he may have been, was so illegible that it required some imagination to see it, the name of Otway. But Mr. Lumley had enough of the true antiquarian spirit to settle the point to his own entire satisfaction. The note was accordingly introduced into the life of Otway, with which the learned tutor was then engaged. The work itself, however, was not destined to see the light. Its publication was delayed, while Mr. Lumley accompanied his pupil on the usual continental tour, and from this journey the learned gentleman never returned, dying at Rome, of a cold caught in the library of the Vatican. By his will, the M.S., Life of Otway, with all his papers, passed into the hands of his brother, an officer in the army. Unfortunately, however, Captain Lumley, who was by no means a literary character, proved extremely indifferent to this portion of his brother's inheritance, which he treated with contemptuous neglect. After this first stage on the road to fame, twenty more years passed away and the letter of the starving poet was again forgotten. At length the papers of the Rev. Mr. Lumley fell into the hands of a nephew, who inherited his uncle's antiquarian tastes and clerical profession. In looking over the MSS, he came to the life of Otway, and was struck with the letter given there, never having met with it in print. There was also a note appended to it, with an account of the manner in which it had been discovered by the editor, in the library of Lord G., and affirming that it was still in his own possession. The younger Lumley immediately set to work to discover the original letter, but his search was fruitless. It was not to be found, either among the papers of his uncle, or of those of his father. It was gone. He was himself a tutor at Cambridge at the time, and returning to the university he carried with him his uncle's life of Otway, in M.S. Some little curiosity was at first excited among his immediate companions by these facts, but it soon settled down into an opinion unfavorable to the veracity of the late Mr. Lumley. This nettled the nephew, and, as Lord G., was still living, a gouty, bloated rue, he at length wrote to inquire if his lordship knew anything of the matter. His lordship was too busy, or too idle, to answer the inquiry. Some time later, however, the younger Lumley, then a chaplain in the family of a relative of Lord G.'s, accidentally met his uncle's former pupil, and, being of a persevering disposition, he ventured to make a personal application on the subject. 
"'Now you recall the matter to me, Mr. Lumley. I do recollect something of the kind. I remember one day giving my tutor some musty old letter he found in the library at G. And by the by he came near cracking my skull on the same occasion.' Mr. Lumley was not a little pleased by this confirmation of the story, though he found that Lord G. had not even read the letter, nor did he know anything of its subsequent fate. He only remembered looking at the signature. Not long after the meeting at which this explanation had taken place, Mr. Lumley received a visit from a stranger, requesting to see the M.S. Life of Otway in his possession. It was handed to him. He examined it, and was very particular in his inquiries on the subject giving the chaplain to understand that he was the agent of a third person who wished to purchase, either the original letter if possible, or, if that could not be found, the MS containing the copy. Mr. Lumley always believed that the employer of this applicant was no other than the arch-gatherer Horace Walpole, who gave such an impulse to the collecting mania. He declined selling the work, however, for he had thoughts of printing it himself. The application was mentioned by him, and, of course, the manuscript gained notoriety, while the original letter became a greater desideratum than ever. The library at G was searched most carefully by a couple of brother bookworms, who crept over it from cornice to carpeting, but to no purpose. Horace Walpole, Horace Walpole, 1717 to 1797, a prolific writer, connoisseur, and collector, best known for his extensive correspondence. He established a taste for literary collecting by would-be cultured gentlemen in England. Some ten years later still, about the time, by the by, when Chatterton's career came to such a miserable close in London, and when Gilbert was dying in a hospital at Paris, it happened that a worthy physician, well known in the town of Southampton for his benevolence and eccentricity, was on a professional visit to the child of a poor journeyman trunk-maker, in the same place. A supply of old paper had just been brought in for the purpose of lining trunks, according to the practice of the day. A workman was busy sorting these, rejecting some as refuse, and preserving others, when the doctor stopped to answer an inquiry about the sick child. Chatterton, Thomas Chatterton, 1752-1770, to 1770, British poet, who created an imaginary Thomas Rowley, a supposed medieval monk, to whom he ascribed some of his poems. Chatterton committed suicide at the age of eighteen, when a poem of his, allegedly by Rowley, was rejected. He was buried in a pauper's grave. Susan Fenimore Cooper, no doubt, has this in mind in naming a character in this story, Theodosia Rowley. Gilbert, Nicholas Gilbert, 1751 to 1780, French poet, who died in Paris at the age of twenty-nine. The French writer Count Alfred de Vigny, 1797 to 1863, in his book of essays, Stello, 1832, popularized a legend that Gilbert had died insane, and in abject poverty, at the charity hospital of the Hotel Dieu in Paris, and compared his miserable end with that of Chatterton, it seemed likely that Vigny, whose book appeared while Susan Fenimore Cooper was studying in Paris, was her source for this reference to Gilbert. In fact, Gilbert was not impoverished, and died of injuries after falling from his horse. "'Better, Hopkins, doing well. But what have you here? I never see old papers, but I have an inclination to look them over. If a man has leisure, he may often pick up something amusing among such rubbish.' Don't you ever read the papers that pass through your hands? No, sir. I is no time for that, sir. And then I was never taught to read writing, and these air papers is all written ones. We puts them as written for one trunk, and them that's printed for another. As you see, sir, one must have a high to the looks of the work. Why, yes. You seem to manage the job very well and I have a trunk, by the by, that wants patching up before my boy carries it off with him. I'll send it round to you, Hopkins. But stay, what's this? And the doctor took up a soiled yellow sheet of paper, from the heap rejected by the workmen. It contained a scrawl which proved to be the identical letter of the poor poet, the Lumley autograph. Though in what manner it became mingled with that heap of rubbish has never been satisfactorily ascertained. 
"'Here's a poor fellow who had a hard fate, Hopkins,' said the benevolent man thoughtfully. "'It is as good as a sermon on charity to read that letter.' The trunk-maker begged to hear it. "'Well, poor journeyman as I be, I was never yet in so bad a way as that, sir. "'And never will be, I hope. But this was a poet, Hopkins, and that's but an indifferent trade to live by. I'll tell you what, my good friend.' said the doctor suddenly. But that letter is worth keeping, and you may paste it in the trunk I'll send round this afternoon. Put it in the lid where it can be read. The trunk was sent, and the letter actually pasted in it as part of the new lining. Dr. H., who, as we have observed, was rather eccentric in his ways, had a son about to commence his career as a soldier, and the worthy man thought the letter might teach the youth a useful lesson of moderation and temperance by showing him, every time he opened his trunk, the extreme wants to which his fellow-beings were occasionally reduced. What success followed the plan we cannot say. The trunk, however, shared the young soldier's wandering life. It carried the cornet's uniform to America. It was besieged in Boston, and it made part of the besieging barrage at Charleston. It was not destined, however, to remain in the New World, but followed its owner to the East Indies, carrying on this second voyage, a lieutenant's commission. At length, after passing five-and-twenty years in Bengal, the trunk returned again to Southampton, as one among some dozen others, which made up the baggage of the gallant Colonel H., now rich in laurels and rupees. The old trunk had even the honourable duty assigned to it of carrying its master's trophies, doubtless the most precious portion of the Colonel's possessions, though at the same time the lightest. As for the rupees, the old worn-out box would have proved quite unequal to transporting a single bag of them, for it was now sadly unfit for service, thanks to the ravages of time and the white ants, and, indeed, owed its preservation and return to its native soil solely to the letter pasted in the lid, which, in the eyes of Colonel H., was a memento of home and the eccentric character of a deceased parent. Cornet the lowest officer rank in a British cavalry regiment, below that of lieutenant, now obsolete. The time had now come, however, when the Lumley autograph was about to emerge forever from obscurity, and receive the full homage of collectors. The hour of triumph was at hand, the neglect of a century was to be fully repaid by the highest honours of fame. The eye of beauty was about to kindle as it rested on the Lumley autograph, jewelled fingers were to be raised, eager to snatch the treasure from each other. Busy literati stood ready-armed for a war of controversy in its behalf. It happened that Colonel H. was invited to a fancy ball, and it also happened that the lady whom he particularly admired was to be present on the occasion. Such being the case, the most becoming costume was to be selected for the evening. What if the locks of the gallant colonel were slightly sprinkled with grey? He was still a handsome man, and knew very well that the dress of an eastern amir was particularly well suited to his face and figure. This dress, preserved in a certain old trunk in the garret, was accordingly produced. The trunk was brought down to the dressing-room, the costume examined piece by piece, pronounced in good condition by the valet, and declared very becoming by the military friend, called in as counsellor. Amir, Emir, a Muslim title signifying commander in Arabic. "'But what a queer old box this is, H.,' said Major D., eyeing the trunk through his glass. "'It's one I've had these hundred years,' replied the colonel. "'So you think this trumpery will do, D?' "'Do. To be sure it will, my dear fellow.' It gives your Milesian skin the true nawab dye. But I was just trying to make out an old letter pasted in the lid of your trunk, under my nose here. Is this the way you preserve your family archives? Milesian, slang term for Irish, from Milesius, mythical Spanish conqueror of Ireland. Nawab, from Nabob, Anglo-Indian slang for one who has returned home from India with a large fortune. That letter is really a curiosity in its way said the colonel, turning from the glass and relating its history, so far at least as it was known to himself. His friend spelt it through. 
"'My dear fellow, why don't you give this letter to the father of your fair Louisa? He's quite rabid on such points. You'll make him a friend for life by it.' The advice was followed. The letter was cut from its old position in the lid of the trunk, and presented to Sir John Blank, the father of the lovely Louisa, who, in his turn, soon placed the hand of his daughter in that of Colonel H. Sir John, a noted follower in the steps of Horace Walpole, had no sooner become the owner of this interesting letter than he set to work to find out its origin, and to fill up its history. Unfortunately the sheet had received some wounds in the wars, as well as the gallant colonel. One corner had been carried away by an unlucky thrust from a razor, not a sword, while the date and signature had also been half-eaten out by the white ants of Bengal. But such difficulties as these were only pleasing obstacles, in the way of antiquarian activity. Sir John had formed an hypothesis, perfectly satisfactory to himself. His mother's name was Butler, and he claimed some sort of affinity with the author of Hudibras, as the Christian name of the poor poet had been almost entirely devoured by the ants, while the surname had also suffered here and there. Sir John ingeniously persuaded himself that what remained had clearly belonged to the signature of the great satirist. As for the date, the abbreviation of November 20th, and the figures 16, marking the century, were really tolerably distinct. Accordingly Sir John wrote a brief notice of Butler's life, dwelling much upon his well-known poverty, and quoting his epitaph, with the allusion to his indigence, underscored, lest he who living wanted all things should, when dead, want a tomb, and placed these remarks opposite the letter of our starving poet, which was registered in the volume in conspicuous characters as an autograph of Samuel Butler, author of Hudibras, showing to what distress he was at one time reduced. Samuel Butler, 1612-1680, to another English author popularly believed to have died in great poverty. He is best known for his long satiric mock epic poem, Hudibras, 1663-1678. to 1678. Here the sheet remained several years, until at length it chanced that Sir John's volume of autographs was placed in the hands of a gentleman who had recently read Mr. Lumley's M.S. Life of Otway. The identity of this letter, with that copied by Mr. Lumley, immediately suggested itself, and now the first sparks of controversy between the Otwaysians and the Butlerites were struck in Sir John's library. From thence they soon spread to the four winds of heaven, filling on combustible materials wherever they lighted on a literary head, or collecting hands. By the by, the rapidity with which this collecting class has increased of late years is really alarming. Who can foresee the state of things likely to exist in the next century, should matters go on at the same rate? Reflect for a moment on the probable condition of distinguished authors, lions of the loudest roar, if the number of autograph hunters were to increase beyond what it is at present. Is it not to be feared that they will yet exterminate the whole race, that the great lion literary, like the mastodon, will become extinct? or perhaps by taming him down to a mere producer of autographs, his habits will change so entirely that he will no longer be the same animal, no longer bear a comparison with the lion of the past. On the other hand, should the great race become extinct, what will be the fate of the family of autograph feeders? What a fearful state of things would ensue, even in our day, were the supply to be reduced but acquire! The heart sickens at the picture which would then be presented, Collectors turning on each other, waging a fierce war over every autographic scrap, making a battlefield of every social circle. Happily, nature seems always to keep up the balance in such matters, and it is a consoling reflection that if the million are now consumers, so have they become producers of autographs. It is therefore probable that the evil will work its own remedy, and we may hope that the great writers of the next century will be shielded in some measure by the diversion made in their favour through the lighter troops of the Lion Corps. As for the full merits of the controversy so hotly waged over the Lumley autograph between the Otwaysians and the Butlerites, dividing the collecting world into two rival parties, we shall not here enter into it. In all such matters it is better to go at once to the fountain-head. If the reader is curious on the subject, as doubtless he must be, 
he is referred to one octavo and five duodecimo volumes, with fifty pamphlets which have left little to say on the point. Let it not be supposed, however, for an instant, that the writer of this article is himself undecided in his opinion on this question. By no means, and he hastens to repeal the unjust suspicion, by declaring himself one of the warmest Otwazians. It is true that he has some private grounds for believing that a dispassionate inquiry might lead one to doubt whether Otway or Butler ever saw the Lumley autograph. But what of that? Who has time or inclination for dispassionate investigation in these stirring days? In the present age of universal enlightenment, we don't trouble ourselves to make up our opinions. We take and give them. We beg, borrow, and steal them. True, there are controversies involving matters so important in their consequences, so serious in their nature, that one might conceive either indifference or fanaticism, equally inexcusable with regard to them, but there are also a thousand other subjects of discussion, at the present day, of that peculiar character which can only thrive when supported by passion and prejudice, and falling in with the dispute of this nature. It is absolutely necessary to jump at once into fanaticism." Accordingly, I had no sooner obtained a glimpse of the letter of the starving poet, embalmed within the precious leaves of one of the most noted albums of Europe, than I immediately enlisted under Lady Halberton's colours as a faithful Otwazian. With that excellent lady, I take a tragical view of the Lumley letter, conceiving that a man must be blind as a bat not to see that it was written by the author of Venice Preserved, and this in spite of other celebrated collectors who find in the same sheet so much that is comical and hudibrastic. Strange that any man in his senses should hold such an opinion. Yet the Butlerites number strong. Some of them are respectable people, too. More's the pity that such should be the case. As we have already observed, the controversy began in the library of Sir John Blank, and it continued throughout the lifetime of that excellent and well-known collector. At his death, a few years since, it passed into the hands of his daughter, the widow of Colonel H. And it will be readily imagined that although the main question is still as much undecided as ever, yet the value of the document itself has immeasurably increased by a controversy of twenty years' standing, on its merits. I wish I could add that the fortune of Colonel H. had augmented in the same proportion, but unhappily for his widow, the reverse was the case. And it was owing to this combination of circumstances that Lady Halberton at length obtained possession of the Lumley autograph. Mrs. H. became very desirous of procuring for her eldest son a cornetcy in the regiment once commanded by his father, as she was now too poor to purchase. The matter required management and negotiation. How it was brought about I cannot exactly say. Suffice it to declare that the young man received his commission, through the influence of Lady Halberton, in a high military quarter, while the Lumley autograph was placed on a distinguished leaf of that lady's velvet-bound, jewel-clasped album. It so happened that I dined at Holberton House on the eventful day upon which the Lumley letter changed owners. I saw immediately, on entering the drawing-room, that Lady Holberton was in excellent spirits. She received me very graciously, and spoke of her son, with whom I had just travelled between Paris and Algiers. "'Wish me joy, Mr. Howard!' exclaimed the lady after a short conversation. Of course I was very happy to do so, and replied by some remarks on the recent success of her friends in a parliamentary measure, just then decided, Lady Holberton being a distinguished politician. But I soon found it was to some matter of still higher moment, she then alluded. "'I never had a doubt as to our success in the house. Last night, no, rather wish me joy that I had at last triumphed in a negotiation of two years' standing. The Lumley autograph is mine, Mr. Howard, the letter of poor Otway, actually written in the first stages of starvation. Only conceive its value. Other guests arriving, I was obliged to make way, not, however, before Lady Holberton had promised me a sight of her recent acquisition, in the evening. In the meantime I fully entered into her satisfaction, for I had already seen her album in Paris, and heard her sigh for this very addition to its treasures. During dinner the important intelligence that the Lumley letter was her own was imparted to the company generally. "'I knew it! 
"'I was sure of it from her smile, the moment I entered the room,' exclaimed Mr. T., the distinguished collector who sat next me. Another guest, Miss Rowley, also a collecting celebrity, was sitting opposite, and turned so pale at the moment that I was on the point of officiously recommending a glass of water. "'Have you albums in America, Mr. Howard?' inquired a charming young lady on my right. "'There is no lack of them, I assure you,' I replied. "'Really? Adela, Mr. Howard tells me they have albums in America,' repeated the young lady to a charming sister near her, while on my left I had the satisfaction of hearing some gratifying remarks from Mr. T. as to the state of civilization in my native country, as shown by such a fact. "'And what are your albums like?' again inquired my lovely neighbour. "'Not like Lady Holberton's, perhaps, but pretty well for a young nation.' "'Oh, dear, not like Lady Holberton's, of course. Hers is quite unique. So full of nice, odd things. But are your albums in America at all like ours?' "'Why, yes, we get most of them from Paris and London.' "'Oh, dear, how strange! But don't you long to see this new treasure of Lady Holberton's?' that dear nice letter of Otway's, written while he was starving, inquired the charming Emily, helping herself to a bit of pate de Perigord. Pate de Perigord, an expensive French delicacy, goose-liver pate with truffles. Yes, I am exceedingly curious to see it. You don't believe it was written by that coarse, vulgar butler, do you? No, indeed, it is the pathetic Otway's, beyond a doubt." My neighbour, the butlerite, gave a contemptuous shrug, but I paid him no attention, preferring to coincide with the soft eyes on my right, rather than dispute with the learned spectacles to the left. After dinner, when we had done full justice to the bill of fare, concluding with pines, grapes, and Newton pippins, we were all gratified with a sight of the poor poet's letter, by way of bonne bouche. A little volume, written by Lady Holberton, printed but not published, relating its past history from the date of its discovery in the library of Lord G., her grandfather, to the present day, passed from hand to hand, and this review of its various adventures, of course, only added force to the congratulations offered upon the acquisition of the celebrated autograph. Pine, pineapple, Newton Pippin, a green, tart, tangy American apple, originally from Long Island, a favorite of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Bon bouche, a tasty morsel, French. While the company were succeeding each other in offering their homage to the great album, my attention was called off by a tap on the shoulder from a friend, who informed me that Miss Rowley, a very clever, handsome woman of a certain age, had expressed a wish to make my acquaintance. I was only too happy to be presented. After a very gracious reception, and an invitation to a party for the following evening, Miss Rowley observed, "'You have autographs in America, I understand, Mr. Howard?' "'Both autographs and collectors,' I replied. "'Really, perhaps you are a collector yourself,' continued the lady, with an indescribable expression, half interest, half disappointment. "'No, merely a humble admirer of the labor of others.' "'Then,' added the lady more blandly, "'Perhaps you will be good-natured enough to assist me.' And after a suspicious glance toward the spot where Lady Holberton and Mr. T. were conversing together, she adroitly placed herself in a position to give to our conversation the privacy of a diplomatic tat a tat "'Could you possibly procure me some American autographs for my collection? I find a few wanting under the American head, perhaps a hundred or two. I professed myself ready to do anything in my power in so good a cause. Here is my list. I generally carry it about me. You will see those that are wanting, and very possibly may suggest others. As the lady spoke, she drew from her pocket a roll of paper as long, and as well covered with names as any minority petition to Congress. However, I had lived too much among collectors of late to be easily dismayed. The list was headed by Blackhawk. I expressed my fears that the gallant warrior's ignorance of letters might prove an obstacle to obtaining anything from his pen. I volunteered, however, to procure instead something from a Cherokee friend of mine, the editor of a newspaper. Blackhawk. Blackhawk, 1767, 
1838. An American Indian, Sack, Chieftain, defeated by the U.S. Army in 1832, whose autobiography, 1833, became an American classic. "'How charming!' exclaimed Miss Rowley, clasping her hands. "'How very obliging of you, Mr. Howard. Are you fond of shooting? My brother's preserves are in fine order. Or perhaps you are partial to yachting?' Bowing my thanks for these amiable hints, I carelessly observed that the letter of the Cherokee editor was no sacrifice at all, for the chief and myself were regular correspondents. I had a dozen of his letters, and had just given one to Mr. T. This intelligence evidently lessened Miss Rowley's excessive gratitude. She continued her applications, however, casting an eye on her list. "'Perhaps you correspond also with some rowdies, Mr. Howard. Could you oblige me with a rowdy letter?' Rowdies. In the mid-nineteenth century, an American slang term for a backwoodsman, or other rough and disorderly types. I drew up a little at this request. My correspondents, I assured the lady, were generally men of respectability, though one of them was of a savage race. No doubt, but in the way of autographs, you know, one would correspond with— The sentence remained unfinished, for the lady added— I wrote myself to Madame Lafarge, not long since. I am sorry to say Lady Holberton has two of hers, but although an excellent personage in most respects, yet it cannot be denied that as regards autographs, Lady Holberton is very illiberal. I offered her Grisel Bailey, two cardinals, William Pitt, and Grace Darling, for one of her Lafarges, but she would not part with it. Yet the exchange was very fair, especially as Madame Lafarge is still living." Madame Lafarge, Marie Lafarge, eighteen sixteen to eighteen fifty three, French woman convicted in eighteen forty for poisoning her husband, later pardoned. Grizzle Bailey, Lady Grizzle Bailey, sixteen sixty five to seventeen forty six, Scottish poet. William Pitt, either William Pitt the Elder, seventeen o eight to seventeen seventy eight, or William Pitt the Younger, seventeen fifty nine to eighteen o six both British Prime Ministers. Grace Darling, Grace Darling, 1815-1842, to 1842. English heroine and lighthouse keeper's daughter, famous for her rescue of castaways in 1838. I bowed in assent to the remark. And then she herself actually once made proposals for Schinderhans, to a friend of mine, offering Howard, the philanthropist, Talma, William Penn, and Fenelon, for him, all commonplace enough, you know, and Schinderhans quite unique. My friend was indignant. Schinderhans, German bandit chief, executed in 1803. Howard, John Howard, 1726 to 1790, English philanthropist and prison reformer. Talma, Francois Talma, 1763 to 1826, popular French playwright. William Penn, 1644 to 1718, Quaker founder of Pennsylvania. Fenlon, Francois Fenlon, 1651 to 1715, French archbishop and writer. I ventured to excuse Lady Holberton by suggesting that probably at the time her stock of notabilities was low. Miss Rowley shook her head and curled her lip, as if she fancied the lady had only been seeking to drive a hard bargain. On one point, however, I have carried the day, Mr. Howard. Lady Holberton is not a little proud of her vidocq, but I have obtained one far superior to hers, one addressed to myself so piquant and gallant, too. I called on the dear old burglar on purpose, to coax him into writing me a note. Vidocq, Francois Vidocq, 1775 to 1857, French police detective who turned robber and was exposed in 1832. I wondered in petto whether I should meet any illustrious convicts at Miss Rowley's party the next evening. But, remembering to have heard her called an exclusive, it did not seem very probable. In petto. Silently, to oneself. Latin. After running her eye over the list again, Miss Rowley made another inquiry. "'Mr. Howard, could you get me something from an American colonel?' I assured the lady we had colonels of all sorts— and begged to know what particular variety she had placed on her catalogue. Was it an officer of the regular service, or one of no service at all? 
"'Oh, the last, certainly. Officers who have seen service are so commonplace.' My own pen was immediately placed at Miss Rowley's disposal, as my sword would have been had I owned one. As I had been called Colonel a hundred times without having commanded a regiment once, my own name was as good as any other on the present occasion. "'You are very obliging. Since you are so good, may I also trouble you to procure me a line from a very remarkable personage of your country, a very distinguished man. He has been President, or Speaker of the Senate, or something of that sort.' To which of our head men did Miss Rowley allude? He is called Uncle Sam, I believe. Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam became a popular personification of the United States during the War of 1812, replacing Brother Jonathan, and was often using contradistinction to the British John Bull. This was not so easy a task, for though we have thousands of colonels, there is but one Uncle Sam in the world. On hearing that such was the case, Miss Rowley's anxiety on the subject increased immeasurably. But I assured her the old gentleman only put his name to treaties and tariffs. And although his sons were wonderfully gallant, yet he himself had never condescended to notice any woman but a queen regnant. And I further endeavoured to give some idea of his identity. Miss Rowley stopped me short, however. "'Only procure me one line from him, Mr. Howard, and I shall be indebted to you for life.' It will be time enough to find out all about him when I once have his name. That is the essential thing. I shrunk from committing myself, however, declaring that I would as soon engage to procure a billet doux from Prester John. Prester John, mythical ruler believed in the Middle Ages to head a powerful Christian kingdom somewhere in Asia, later identified with the Christian kings of Ethiopia in Africa. Prester John! that would indeed be quite invaluable this asiatic diversion was a happy one and came very apropos for it carried miss rowley into china she inquired if i had any chinese connections though altogether i am pretty well satisfied with my chinese negotiations as soon as the celestial empire was open to the civilized world i engaged an agent there to collect for me but could you put me on the track of a confucius opened to the civilized world. Following the so-called Opium War, Britain had, in 1842, forced China to open trade with her. I was obliged to admit my inability to do so, and at the same moment the collecting instincts of Lady Holberton and Mr. T. drew their attention to the corner where Miss Rowley and myself were conversing. As they moved toward us, Miss Rowley pocketed her list, throwing herself upon my honor not to betray the deficiencies in her rolled equipage, or the collecting negotiations just opened between us. Lady Holberton, as she advanced, invited Miss Rowley with an ill-concealed air of triumph to feast her eyes once more on the Lumley autograph, and not long after the party broke up. Rolled equipage, muster roll, French. Here Miss Rowley's list of her autographs. The next day, in passing Holberton House, I observed the chariot of a fashionable physician before the door, and at Miss Rowley's party in the evening learned from Mr. T. that Lady Holberton was quite unwell. The following morning I called to inquire, and received for answer that her ladyship was very much indisposed. It was not until a week later that I saw Lady Holberton herself, taking the air in Hyde Park. She looked wretchedly thin and pale. I inquired from the English friend with whom I was riding, if there was any probability of a change of ministry. He looked surprised, and then catching the direction of my eye, he observed, "'You ask on Lady Holberton's account. But Sir A. B. tells me her illness was caused by the loss of the Lumley autograph.' This unexpected intelligence proved only too true. On returning to my lodgings I found a note from Lady Holberton, requesting to see me, and, of course, immediately obeyed the summons." "'Lost, lost, lost, Mr. Howard,' said the lady, endeavouring to conceal her emotion as she gave me the details of her affliction. "'It must have been stolen, basely stolen, on the evening of my party. Oh, why did I so foolishly exhibit it among so many people, and collectors among them, too? Never again will I admit more than one collector at a time into the room with my album,' she exclaimed with energy. I was shocked.' 
Surely Lady Holberton did not conceive it possible that any of her guests could be guilty of such base conduct. "'How little you know them! But it is that, Mr. Howard, which has interested me in your favour. You have so much naivety and ignorance of the moral turpitude of the old world, that I feel convinced you never could be guilty of such an action yourself.' I assured Lady Holberton that in this respect she only did me justice, and in fact a theft of the kind she alluded to appealed to me all but incredible. Remember that it was only the other day that Blank lost his invaluable album. Remember that last winter Madame de Blank had all her notes on botanical subjects stolen from her own portfolio, and I could mention a dozen instances of the same wickedness. These facts were already known to me but I had forgotten them. I remarked with a glow of national pride that we certainly were much more virtuous in these matters across the ocean. In America we are much above pilfering autographs. When we do steal, it is by the volume. We seize all an author's stock in trade at one swoop, and without condescending to say even thank ye for it. Author's Stock in Trade Though ostensibly referring to the stealing of autographs, Susan Fenimore Cooper is also clearly referring to the widespread pirating of British and other foreign literary works by American publishers, in the absence of international copyright laws, which not only cheated the authors, but made life difficult for American authors, expecting to be paid for their creations. So I have always understood, Mr. Howard, and I felt that my album was safe with you, observed Lady Holberton with tears in her eyes. Wishing to relieve this distress, I proposed advertising for the lost treasure, applying to the police. Lady Holberton smiled through her tears, as she assured me that the police, old and new, had been enlisted in her service an hour after the discovery of her loss, while communications had been opened with the municipal governments of Brussels, Paris, and Vienna on the same subject. Police, old and new. The first modern English police force had been established in 1829 by Sir Robert Peel from which the British nickname of Bobby for policemen. And have you no clue, no suspicions, your servants, your maid? The aspersion on her household was indignantly repelled. You will readily believe, Mr. Howard, that a collector, the owner of such an album as I, have the honour of possessing, is particularly careful as to whom she admits into her family. I will vouch for all about me. Still I have suspicions, but— I begged her to speak, if she thought I could be of the least assistance. Yes, I will trust my son's friend. Mr. Howard, I here solemnly accuse Theodosia Rowley of having stolen the Lumley autograph. The dignity of the matter, the concentrated passion of expression, the strength of emphasis with which Lady Holberton spoke, would have done honour to a Sidon's. The natural start of horror and amazement on my part was also no doubt very expressive, for I was speechless with surprise. "'I see you do not credit this,' continued the lady. But thought, like a flash of lightning, had already recalled some circumstances of the last evening at Holberton House. I did credit the accusation, and immediately informed Lady Holberton of what I had observed, but forgotten until reminded of the facts by her own remarks. I had seen Miss Rowley bending low over the album at a moment when someone was telling an exceedingly humorous story which engrossed the attention of the rest of the company. "'Could she have had an accomplice?' cried the lady, with dashing eyes. I knew nothing on that point, but I added that soon after Miss Rowley had left the room very quietly, and as I followed her to fulfill another engagement, she had started, turned pale, and betrayed nervousness scarcely allowing me to assist her to her carriage, although we left the house at the same instant. Lady Holberton's suspicions were now confirmed beyond a doubt. "'And yet it seems incredible that any lady should be guilty of such conduct!' I exclaimed, almost repenting having allowed the previous remarks to pass my lips. "'Miss Rowley is undoubtedly a woman of principle, or good moral standing.' "'Moral standing! Principle!' exclaimed Lady Holberton bitterly. "'Yes, where an autograph is concerned, Theodosia Rowley has all the principle of a magpie.' "'Magpie. European bird known for stealing and hiding small bright objects.' Whatever might have been the fact, 
it was clear at least that Lady Holberton's opinion was now unalterably made up. "'Remember, she is a butlerite,' added the lady, thus putting the last touch to the circumstantial evidence against Miss Rowley. Weeks passed by. The advertisements remained unanswered. The police could give no information. Lady Holberton was in despair. The physicians declared that her health must eventually give way under the anxiety and disappointment consequent upon this melancholy affair. Much sympathy was felt for the afflicted lady. Even Miss Rowley called often to condole, but she was never admitted. "'I could not see the crocodile,' exclaimed Lady Holberton, quite thrown off her guard one day, by the sight of Miss Rowley's card which she threw into the fire." Some consolation, however, appeared to be derived from the assiduous attentions of Mr. T., who personally admired Lady Holberton. At least he professed to do so, though some persons accused him of interested views, and aiming at her album rather than herself. But although his attentions were received, yet nothing could afford full consolation. At length, all other means failing, at the end of a month it was proposed that two persons, mutual friends of Lady Holberton and Miss Rowley, should call on the latter lady, and appeal privately to her sense of honour, to restore the autograph if it were actually in her possession. This plan was finally agreed on, but the very day it was to have been carried into execution, Miss Rowley left town, for an excursion in Finland. As for myself, I was also on the wing, and left London about the same time. The parting with Lady Holberton was melancholy. She was much depressed, and the physicians had recommended the waters of Wiesbaden. Mr. T. was also preparing for an excursion to Germany, and he was suspected of vacillating in his butlerite views, brought over by Lady Holberton's tears and logic. Returning to London some three months later, I found many of my former acquaintances were absent, but Lady Holberton, Miss Rowley, and Mr. T. were all in town again. The day after I arrived, it was Tuesday, the 20th of August, as I was walking along Piccadilly about five o'clock in the afternoon, my eye fell on the windows of Mr. Thorpe's great establishment. I was thinking over his last catalogue of autographs, when I happened to observe a plain, modest-looking young girl, casting a timid glance at the door. There was something anxious and hesitating in her manner, which attracted my attention. Accustomed, like most Americans, to assist a woman in any little difficulty, and with notions better suited, perhaps, to the meridian of Yankee lands than that of London, I asked if she were in any trouble. How richly was I rewarded for the act of good nature! She blushed and curtsied. Tuesday, 20th of August. Does this date the final composition of the Lumley autograph, or of its setting? August 20 fell on a Tuesday in 1844, and 1850. Please, sir, is it true that they pay money for old letters at this place? They do. Have you anything of the kind to dispose of? Judge of my gratification, my amazement, when she produced the Lumley autograph. Of course I instantly took it, at her own price, only half a guinea, and I further gave her Lady Holberton's address, that she might claim the liberal reward promised for the precious letter. Tears came into the poor child's eyes when she found what awaited her, and I may as well observe at once that this young girl proved to be the daughter of a poor bedridden artisan of Clapham, who had seen better days, but was then in great want. It is an ill wind that blows no good luck, and the contest for the Lumley autograph was a great advantage to the poor artisan and his family. The girl had picked up the paper early one morning, in a road near Clapham, as she was going to her work. Lady Holberton gave her a handful of guineas as the promised reward, a sum by the by just double in amount what the poor poet had received for his best poem, and she also continued to look after the family in their troubles. But to return to the important document itself, never can I forget the expressive gratitude that beamed on the fine countenance of Lady Holberton when I restored it once more to her possession. She rapidly recovered her health and spirits, and it was generally reported that, seizing this favourable moment, Mr. T. had offered himself and his collection, and that both had been graciously accepted. Miss Rowley called, and a sort of pay plâtrie was made up between the ladies. A cargo of American autographs arrived, 
containing the letters of the Cherokee editor, the signed manual of governors and colonels without number, and I even succeeded in obtaining epistles from several noted rowdies, especially to gratify the ladies. Lady Holberton made her selection, and the rest were divided between Miss Rowley and Mr. T. Joy at the recovery of the Lumley autograph seemed to diffuse an unusual spirit of harmony among collectors. Many desirable exchanges were brought about, and things looked charmingly. Alas! How little were we prepared for what ensued! Pay Platry, patched up peace, French. On the occasion of the presence in London of two illustrious royal travellers, Lady Holberton gave a large party. So said the papers, at least, but I knew better. It was chiefly to celebrate the recovery of the Lumley autograph, and its restoration to her celebrated album, that the feat was given. The album was produced, in spite of a half-formed vow of Lady Holberton to the contrary, but then His Royal Highness Prince Blank Blank had particularly requested to see the letter of the poor poet, having heard it mentioned at dinner. The evening passed off brilliantly, their Royal Highnesses, came, saw, and departed. The crowd followed them to another house, while a favoured few, chiefly collectors, remained lingering about the table on which lay the album. I should have said earlier that Lady Holberton had appointed a new office in her household, the very day after the loss of the Lumley autograph. This was no other than a pretty little page, dressed in the old costume of a student of Padua, whose sole duty it was to watch over the album whenever it was removed from the rich and heavy case in which it usually lay enshrined. He was the guard of the album, and was strictly enjoined never for one instant to remove his eyes from the precious volume from the moment he was placed on duty, until relieved. Well, there we were, some dozen of us, collected about the table, Lady Holberton looking triumphant, Mr. T. very proud, and there stood the page of the album, dressed in his putasoy gown, with eyes fastened on the book, according to orders, while he supported its gorgeous case in his arms. Some remark was made as to the extraordinary manner in which the precious autograph had been lost, and then found again. My blood actually boiled, as one of the company turned to me, and asked in a suspicious tone if I did not know more of its history than I chose to confess. My indignation was boundless. Fortunately I could produce the friend walking with me in Piccadilly, and the artisan's family at Clapham, as witnesses in my favour. Miss Rowley was standing near me at the moment. Padazoy, a strong corded or gros grain silk fabric, traditionally associated with Padua, Italy. Still, Mr. Howard, observed that lady, I really cannot see why you should resent the insinuation so warmly. Now, do you know, I am not at all sorry to have it in my power to declare that I have some knowledge of the fate of the paper during its eclipse. All eyes were instantly fixed on the speaker. The lady smiled and continued, "'Lady Holberton thinks the Lumley autograph was stolen. I understand she even thought it was stolen by myself.' She here turned deliberately toward our hostess, who looked uneasy. "'If such were your suspicions, Lady Holberton,' continued Miss Rowley, speaking with great deliberation, "'I am happy to say that they were quite correct. You only did me justice.' I am proud to declare the deed was mine. We were all speechless at hearing this sudden and bold avowal. It was I, Theodosia Rowley, who carried off, the word is of little consequence, who stole, I repeat, that precious paper. So long as the treasure was mine, the consciousness of possessing it was sufficient in itself. But having afterward lost it from my pockets by unpardonable carelessness, I shall at least now glory in the daring deed which made it once my own. Conceive the amazement which these remarks, delivered with calm enthusiasm, produced among the listening circle. We all know that high crimes and misdemeanors enough are committed by men, and women too, but somehow or other the delinquents are not often given to talking of them. They would just as leave in general that the act should not be known. The effect of Miss Rowley's words was different on different individuals. As for myself, I voluntarily felt for the handkerchief in my pocket. The page of the album drew nearer. Lady Holberton looked aghast, as though she had seen a cannibal. Some bit their lips, others opened their eyes. Mr. T., however, who held the album at the moment, 
and was bending over it when Miss Rowley began her extraordinary disclosure, raised his eyes, fixed his glasses on the fair speaker, and sent through them such a glance as no words can fully describe. It was a glance of intense admiration. "'What exalted views! What sublime sentiments!' he exclaimed in an ecstasy. But Mr. T.'s blaze of admiration was not the only flame at work, while he was gazing at the heroine of the moment. In a sudden burst of enthusiasm roused by the fair purloiner, he forgot all else. The precious volume in his hand drooped, touched the flame of a wax light on the table, and in another instant the great Holberton album, that album of European reputation, was burning before our eyes. Its invaluable leaves were curling and blackening, and smoking under the devouring flame. A shriek from Lady Holberton, an unearthly cry from the page of the album, both echoed by the spectators, came too late. The volume was half consumed. Of the Lumley autograph, not a line remained. Such was the ill-fated end of the letter of the poor starving poet. It was written amid gloom and distress, its career closed in a stormy hour. The loss of the album, of course, broke off the engagement between Lady Holberton and Mr. T. This, however, could scarcely have been regretted under the circumstances, for their union, after the catastrophe, must have been one long series of miserable reproaches. The sudden change in Mr. T.'s feelings towards Miss Rowley was not a momentary one. The admiration first kindled by that lady's bold declaration grew to be the strongest sentiment of his heart, and only a few weeks later he was made the happiest of men by receiving as his own the fair hand which accompanied the deed. Miss Rowley and Mr. T. were united in the bands of matrimony and collectorship. Lady Holberton was still inconsolable when I left London. She was thinking of travelling among the Hottentots, or in any other clime where albums are unknown, and her loss could be forgotten. The journey to Kaffirland was, however, postponed until the next change of ministry, and I have learned recently that the lady has so far recovered her spirits as to be thinking of an omnibus. The very last packet, indeed, brought a flattering application to myself. Lady Holberton graciously declaring that the name of Jonathan Howard is not only valued by herself as that of a friend, but interesting to collectors generally as having been once connected with the much lamented document now lost to the world, the letter of the poor starving poet known as the Lumley Autograph. Omnibus. In this context, an omnibus bill, i.e., one dealing with a variety of subjects, in Parliament. End of the Lumley Autograph Recording by Katie Riley March 2010Loveliness, a Story by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Bush, January 2010. Loveliness, a Story by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps. Be my benediction, said, with my hand upon thy head, gentle fellow creature. K. B. Browning For the smoke of their torment extendeth. Loveliness sat on an eiderdown cushion, embroidered with cherry-colored puppies on a pearl satin cover. The puppies had gold eyes. They were drinking a saucer of green milk. Loveliness wore a new necktie of cherry, a shade or two brighter than the puppies, and a pearl-gray, or one might call it silver-gray, jacket. He was sitting in the broad window sill, with his head tipped a little, thoughtfully, toward the left side, as the heads of nervous people are said to incline. He was dreamily watching the street, looking for any one of a few friends of his who might pass by, and for the letter carrier, who was somewhat late. Loveliness had dark, brilliant eyes, remarkably alert, but reflective when in repose. Part of their charm lay in the fact that one must watch for their best expression, for loveliness wore bangs. He had a small and delicate nose, not guiltless of an aristocratic tip, with a suspicion of a sniff at the inferior orders of society. 
in truth loveliness was an aristocrat to the end of his tongue which curled daintily against his opalescent teeth at this moment it lay between his teeth and hung forward as if he held a rose-leaf in his lips and this was the final evidence of his birth and breeding for loveliness was a little dog a silver yorkshire blue of blood and delicately reared a tiny creature the essence of tenderness set soul and body to one only tune to love and to be beloved that was his life he knew no other nor up to this time could he conceive of any other for he was as devotedly beloved as he was passionately loving his brain was in his heart in saying this one does not question the quality of the brain any more than one does in saying a similar thing of a woman indeed considered as an intellect his was of the highest order known to his race loveliness would have been interesting as a psychological study had he not been absorbing as an affectional occupation his family and friends often said how clever but not until after they had said how dear he is the order of precedence in this summary of character is the most enviable that can be experienced by human beings but the dog took it as a matter of course this little creature loved a number of people on a sliding scale of intimacy carefully guarded as the intimacies of the high-born usually are but one he loved first most best of all and profoundly i have called him loveliness because it was the pet name the little name given to him by this person in point of fact he answered to a variety of appellations more or less recognized by society of these the most lawful and the least agreeable to himself was mop it was a disputed point whether this was an ancestral name or whether he had received it from the dog store whence he had emerged at the beginning of his history the shaggiest scrubbiest raggedest wildest little terrier that ever boasted of a high descent people of a low type those whose imagination was bounded by menial similes or persons of that too ready inclination to the humorous which fails to consider the possible injustice or unkindness that it may involve had in mop's infancy found a base pleasure in attaching to him such epithets as window washer scrubbing brush feather duster and foot muff but these had not adhered loveliness had it bade fair at the time of our story to outlive every other name the little dog had both friends and acquaintances on the street where the professor lived and he watched for them from his cushion in the window hours at a time there was the cabman the academic-looking cabman who was the favorite of the faculty and who hurrahed and snapped his whip at the yorkshire as he passed by there was the newsboy who brought the sunday papers and who whistled at loveliness and made faces and called him mop Today there was a dark-faced man a stranger standing across the street and regarding the professor's house with the unpleasant look of the foreign and ill-natured this man had eyebrows that met in a straight black line upon his forehead and he wore a yellow jersey the dog threw back his supercilious little head and barked at the yellow jersey severely but at that moment he saw the carrier who ran up the steps laughing and brought a gumdrop in a sealed envelope addressed to loveliness there was a large mail that afternoon including a pile of pamphlets and circulars of the varied description that haunts professors houses kathleen the parlor maid another particular friend of the terriers took the mail up to the study but dropped one of the pamphlets on the stairs the dog rebuked her carelessness after he had given his attention to the carrier's gumdrop by picking the pamphlet up and bringing it back to the window seat where he opened and dog-eared it with a literary manner for a while until suddenly he forgot it altogether and dropped it on the floor and sprang bounding for the dearest person in the world had called him in a whisper loveliness and the dearest face in the world appeared above him and melted into laughing tenderness loveliness where's my loveliness a little girl had come into the room a girl of between five and six years but so small that one would scarcely have guessed her to be four a beautiful child but transparent of coloring and bearing in her delicate face the pathetic patience which only sick children of all human creatures ever show she was exquisitely formed 
but one little foot halted and stepped weakly on the thick carpet. Her organs of speech were perfect in mechanism, but often did not speak quite aloud. Sometimes on her weaker days she carried a small crutch. They called her Ada. She came in without her crutch that afternoon. She was feeling quite strong and happy. The little dog sprang to her heart, and she crooned over him, sitting beside him on the window seat and whispering in her plaintive voice, "'Loveliness, I can't live without you another minute. Loveliness, I can't live without you.' She put her head down on the pearl-gray satin pillow with the cherry puppies, and the dog put his face beside hers. He was kept as sweet and clean as his little mistress, and he had no playfellow except herself, and never went away from home unless at the end of a gray satin ribbon leash. At all events, the two would occupy the same pillow, and all idle effort to struggle with this fact had ceased in the household. Loveliness sighed one of the long sighs of perfect content recognized by all owners and lovers of dogs as one of the happiest sounds in this sad world, and laid his cheek to hers quietly. He asked nothing more of life. He had forgotten the world and all that was therein. He looked no longer for the cabman, the newsboy, or the carrier, and the man with the eyebrows had gone away. The universe did not exist. He and she were together. Heaven had happened. The dog glanced through half-closed, blissful eyes at the yellow hair, eighteen carats fine, that fell against his silver bangs. His short, ecstatic breath mingled with the gentle breathing of the child. She talked to him in broken rhapsodies. She called him quaint pet names of her own. Dearness, and daintiness, mopsiness, and preciousness, and dearest in the world. And who knew what besides? Only the angels who are admitted to the souls of children and the hearts of little dogs could have understood that interview. No member of the professor's household ever interfered with the attachment between the child and the dog, which was set apart as one of the higher facts in the family life. Indeed, it had its own page of sacred history, which read on this wise. When Ada was a walking baby, two and a half years before the time of which we tell, the terrier was in the first proud flush of enthusiasm which an intelligent dog feels in the mastery of little feats and tricks. Of these, he had a varied and interesting repertoire. His vocabulary, too, was large. At the date of our story, it had reached 130 words. It was juvenile and more limited at the time when the sacred page was written, but still beyond the average canine proficiency. Loveliness had always shown a genius for the English language. He could not speak it, but he tried harder than any dog I ever knew to do so, and he grew to understand with ease an incredibly large part of the usual conversation of the family. It could never be proved that he followed, or did not follow, the professor of psychology in a discussion on the critique of pure reason, but his mental grasp of ordinary topics was alert and logical. He sneezed when he was cold and wanted a window shut, and barked twice when his delicate china water cup was empty. When the fire department rang by, or a stove in the house was left on draft too long, and he wished to call attention to the circumstance, he barked four times. Besides the commonplace accomplishments of turning somersaults, being a dead dog, sitting up to beg for things, and shaking hands, Loveliness had some attainments peculiar to himself. One of these was, in itself, scientifically interesting. This luxurious, daintily fed little creature, who had never known an hour's want, nor any deprivation that he could remember, led by the blind instinct of starving, savage ancestors skulking in forests, where the claw and tooth of every living thing were against every other, conscientiously sought to bury, against future exigencies, any kind of food for which he had no appetite. The remnants of his dog biscuit, his saucer of weak tea, an unpalatable dinner alike received the treatment given to the bare bone of his forefathers when it was driven into the ground. Anything served the purpose of the earth, the rough wild earth of whose real nature the house pet knew so little, a newspaper, a glove, a handkerchief, a sheet of the professor's manuscript, a hearth brush, or a rug would answer. 
drag these laboriously and push them perseveringly to their places. Cover the saucer or the plate from sight with a solemn persistence that the starving, howling ancestor would have respected. Thus, loveliness recognized the laws of heredity. But the corners of rugs were, and remained, the favorite burying sod. On that black day when the baby girl had used her white apron by way of blowers before the reluctant nursery fire, the little dog was alone in the room with her. It had so happened. Suddenly, through the busy house, sounded four shrill staccato barks. In the vocabulary of loveliness, this meant, Fire! 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 Born with them came the terrible cries of the child. When the mother and the nursemaid got to the spot, the baby was ablaze from her white apron to her yellow hair. She was writhing on the floor. The terrier, his own silver locks scorching and his paws in the flame, was trying to cover his young mistress with the big Persian rug, in itself a load for a collie. He had so far succeeded that the progress of the flames had been checked. For years, the professor speculated on the problems raised by this tremendous incident. Whether the Yorkshire regarded the fire as a superfluity, like a dinner one does not want, but that was far-fetched. Whether he knew that wool puts out fire, but that was incredible. Whether this, that, or the other, no man could say, or ever has. Perhaps the intellect of the dog, roused to its utmost by the demand upon his heart, blindly leaped to its most difficult exertion. It was always hard to cover things with rugs. In this extremity one must do the hardest. Or did sheer love teach him to choose, in a moment that might have made a fool or a lunatic of a man, the only one or two of several processes which could by any means reach the emergency? At all events the dog saved the child, and she became henceforth the saint and idol of the family, and he its totem and its hero. The two stood together in one niche above the household altar. It was impossible to separate them. But after that terrible hour, little Ada was as she was, frail, uncertain of step, scarred on the pearl of her neck and the rose of her cheek, not with full command of her voice, more nervously deficient than organically defective, but a perfect being marred. Her father said, she goeth lame and lovely. On the afternoon when our story began, the child and the Yorkshire sat cuddled together in the broad window seat for a long time. Blessedness sat with them. Ada talked in low love tones, using a language as incomprehensible to other people as the tongue in which the dog replied to her. They carried on long conversations, broken only by caresses and by barks of bliss or jets of laughter. The child tired herself with laughing and loving, and the dog watched her. He did not sleep. He silently lapped the fingers of her little hand that lay like a cameo upon the silken cushion. Someone came in and said in a low voice, She is tired out. She must have her supper and be put to bed. Afterwards, it was remembered that she clung to loveliness and cried a little foolishly fretting that she did not want her supper, and demanding that the dog should go up to bed with her and be put at once into his basket by her side. This was gently refused. "'You shall see him in the morning,' they told her. Kathleen put the little dog down forcibly from the arms of the child, who wailed at the separation. She called back over the balusters, "'Loveliness! Good-bye, loveliness!' When we're grown up, we'll always be together, loveliness. The dog barked rebelliously for a few minutes, then sighed and accepted the situation. He ran back and picked up the pamphlet which Kathleen had dropped and carried it upstairs to the professor's study, where he laid it on the lowest shelf of the revolving bookcase. The professor glanced at the dog-eared pages and smiled. The pamphlet was one of the innumerable throng issued by some philanthropic society devoted to improving the condition of animals. When Kathleen came downstairs, she found the dog standing at the front door, patiently asking that it might be opened for him. She went down the steps, for it was the rule of the house never to allow the most helpless member of the family at liberty unguarded. 
the evening was soft and the maid stood looking idly about a man in a yellow jersey and with straight black eyebrows was on the other side of the street but he did not look over the suburban town was still and pleasant advancing spring was in the air no one was passing only a negro boy lolled on the old-fashioned fence and shouted hi yi yi look at dem crows carrying off a biled pertater and a piece of squashed pie kathleen for very vacuity of mind turned to look neither potatoes nor squash pie were to be seen careering through the skies nor in fact were there any crows i'll have yees arrested for sarse and slander cried kathleen vigorously but the negro boy had disappeared so had the man in the yellow jersey where's me dog muttered kathleen it was dipping dusk it was deepening to dark she called loveliness was an obedient little fellow always but he did not reply the maid called again she examined the front yard and the premises slowly for she was afraid to go in and tell with the imbecility of the timid and the erring she took too much time in a fruitless and unintelligent search before she went trembling into the house kathleen felt that this was the greatest emergency that had occurred since the baby was burned she went straight to the master's door god have mercy on me but i've lost the little dog sir the professor wheeled around in his study chair there was a nigger and a squashed crow but indeed i never left the little dog as you bid me sir i never left him for the space of me breath between me lips and when i draws it in the little dog warn nowhere oh, whatever'll she say whatever'll she do mother of god forgive me soul who will tell her who indeed the professor of psychology turned as pale as the paper on which he was about to write his next famous and inexplicable lecture he pushed by kathleen and sprang for his hat but the child's mother had already run out bareheaded into the street calling the dog as she ran nora the cook left the dinner to burn and followed kathleen softly shut the nursery door so she won't hear and sobbing crept downstairs the family gathered as if under the black wing of an unspeakable tragedy they scoured the premises in the street while the professor rang in the police call but loveliness was not to be found the carrier came by on his way home after his day's work was over great scott he cried i'd rather have lost a month's pay does she know the newsboy trotted up and stopped whistling holy gee he said what'll the little gal do the popular cabman came by he was driving the president who let down the window and asked what had happened the driver uttered a mild and academic oath me and my horse we're at your disposal as soon as me and the president have got to faculty meeting but the president of the university of st george put his long legs out of the carriage and bowed the professor into it the cab is at your service now he said anxiously and so am i they can get along without us for a while to-night anything that i can do to help you professor premise in this real calamity how does the child bear it poor little kid muttered the cabman and to think how i used to snap my whip at him in the window and how i used to bring him candy contrary to the postal laws sighed the carrier the cab driver and the postman spoke as if the dog and the child were both already dead the group broke slowly and sadly at last the mother and the maids crept tearfully into the house the professor the carrier the newsboy and the president threw themselves into the matter as if they had been hunting for a lost child the president deferred his engagement at the faculty meeting for two hours which gave about time for a faculty meeting to get under way the professor and the cab driver and the police ransacked the town till nearly dawn it began to rain and the night grew chilly the carrier went home looking like a man in the shade of a public calamity the newsboy ran around in the storm shadowing all the negro boys he met and whistling for loveliness in dark places 
where low-bred curs answered him, and yellow mongrels snarled at his soaked heels. But the professor was the worst of it, for when he came in, drenched and tired in the early morning, a little figure in a lace-trimmed nightgown stood at the head of the stairs waiting for him. The professor gave one glance at the child's face and instinctively covered his own. He could not bear to look at her. Papa, said Ada, limping down the stairs, where is loveliness? I can't find him. Oh, I cannot find him. And nobody will tell me where he's gone to. Papa, I expect you to tell me e truth. Where is my loveliness? Her mother could not comfort or control her. She clung to her father's heart the remainder of the night, moaning in intervals, then unnaturally and piteously still. The rain dashed on the windows, for the storm increased. The child shrank and shivered. He's never been out in the rain, Papa. He will be wet and frightened. Papa, who will give him his little back sit and cover him up warm? Papa, Papa, who will be kind to loveliness? In the broad daylight, Ada fell into a short sleep. She woke with a start and a cry and asked for the dog. He'll come home to breakfast, she said with quivering lips. Tell Nora to have some sugar on his mush when he comes home. But loveliness did not come home to breakfast. The child refused to eat her own. She hurried down and crept to the broad window seat to watch the street. When she saw the empty gray satin cushion, she flung herself face down with a heart-rending cry. Papa, 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 I never had affliction before. Oh, Papa, my heart will break itself apart. Papa, can't you know enough to comfort you, little girl? I can't live without my loveliness. Oh, Papa, Papa. This was in the decline of March. The winds went down and the rains came on. The snow slid from the streets of the university town and withdrew into dingy patches about the roots of trees and fences and in the shady sides of cold backyards. The mud yawned ankle-deep and dried and was not and was dust beneath the foot. Crocuses blazed in the gardens of the faculty, royal purple, gold, and wax-white lamps set in the young and vivid grass. The sun let down his mask and looked abroad, and it was April. The newsboy, the carrier, and the cab driver laughed for very joy of living. But when they passed the professor's house, they did not laugh. It came on to be the heart and glory of the spring, and the warm days melted into May. But the little dog had not been found. The professor had exhausted hope and ingenuity in the dreary quest. The state, one might say without exaggeration, had been dragged for that tiny dumb thing, seven pounds weight of life and tenderness. Money had been poured like love down the vain endeavor. Rewards of reckless proportion appealed from public places and from public columns to the blank eyes that could not or did not read, the great detective force, whose name is familiar from sea to sea, had supplemented the useless search of the local police and of the city press, and all had equally failed. The dog banditti had done their work too well. Loveliness had sunk out of sight like forgotten suffering in a scene of joy. In the window seat, propped with white pillows, lame and lovely, Ada sat. The empty, embroidered gray cushion lay beside her. Sometimes she patted the red puppy softly with one thin little hand. She allowed no one else to touch the cushion. "'Till loveliness comes home,' she said. In the window, silent, pale, and seeing everything, she watched. But loveliness did not come home. The pitiful thing was that the child herself was so changed. She had wasted to a little wraith. For some time she had not walked without her crutch. Now she scarcely walked at all. At the first she had sobbed a great deal in downright childish fashion. Then she wept silently. 
but now she did not cry any more she did but watch her sight had grown unnaturally keen like that of pilots she gazed out of great eyes bright and dry and solemn already she had taken on the look of children whose span of time is to be short she weakened visibly at first her father took her out with him in the cab so she should feel that she was conducting the search herself but she had grown too feeble for this exertion sometimes on such drives she saw cruel sights animals suffering at the black tempers of men or the diabolic jests of boys and she was hurried home shivering and sobbing when night came she would ask for the yorkshire's bed to be put beside her own and with trembling fingers would draw up the crimson blankets over the crimson mattress as if the dog had been between them then she would ask the question that haunted her most mamma who will put loveliness into a little back sit to sleep and cover him up papa papa will they be kind to loveliness stormy nights and days were always the hardest will loveliness be out and get wet will he shiver like ye black dog i saw to-day will he have warm milk for his supper is there anybody to rub him dry and cuddle my loveliness to divert the child from her grief proved impossible they took her somewhere in the old idle effort to change the place and help the pain but she mourned so because he might come home and nobody see him but me that they brought her back the president of the university who was a dogless and childless man presented the bereaved household with a mongrel white puppy purchased under the amiable impression that it was of a rare parisian breed the distinguished man cherished the ignorant hope of bestowing consolation but the invalid child with the sensitiveness of invalid children refused to look at the puppy who was returned to his donor and constituted himself henceforth the tyrant and terror of that scholastic household as the weather grew warmer little ada failed and sank it came on to be the bloom of the year and she no longer left the house the carrier and the cab driver lifted their hats in silence now when they passed the window where the little girl sat and the newsboy looked up with a sober face like that of a man the faculty and the neighbors did not ask how was the child but always have you heard from the dog the doctor began to call daily he did not shake his head no doctor does outside of an old-fashioned story and he smiled cheerfully enough inside the house but when he came out of it to his carriage he did not smile so the spring mellowed and it was the first of june one night the poor professor sat trying to put into shape an impossible thesis on an incomprehensible subject it was called the identity of identity and non-identity for commencement delivery in his department pulling aside some books of reference that he needed he dragged to view a pamphlet from the lowest shelf of the revolving bookcase then he saw the marks of the yorkshire's teeth and claws on the pamphlet corners and sadly smiling he opened and read the commencement thesis on the identity of identity and non-identity was not corrected that night the professor of psychology sat molded into his study chair rigid with iron lips and clenched hands and read the pamphlet through every word from beginning to end for the first time in his life this eminent man wise in the wisdom of the world of mind and half educated in the particular affairs of the world of matter studied for himself the authenticated records of the torments imposed upon dumb animals in the name of science as an instructed man of course this subject was not wholly unfamiliar to him but it was wholly foreign hitherto he had given it polite and indifferent attention and had gone its ways now he read like a man himself bound without anesthesia beneath the knife now he read for the child's sake with the child's mind with the child's nerves and with those of the little helpless thing for whom her life was wasting he tore from his shelves every volume every pamphlet that he owned upon the direful subject 
which that June night opened to his consciousness, and he read until the birds sang. With brain on fire, he crept in the brightness of the coming day to his wife's side. "'Tired out, dear?' she asked gently. Then he saw that she too had not slept. "'Ada has such dreams,' she explained. "'Cruel things, all the same kind.' "'About the dog?' "'Always about the dog. "'I have been sitting up with her. "'She is not as strong as... not quite.' "'The professor set his teeth when he heard the mother's moan. "'When she had sunk into the broken rest, "'he stole back to his study "'and locked out of sight the pamphlet "'which loveliness had chewed. "'So, with the profound and scientific treatises on the subject, "'arguing and illustrating this way and that, some of these had cuts and photogravures which would haunt the imagination for years. He crowded the whole out of reach. His own brain was reeling with horrors which it would have driven the woman or the child mad to read. Scenes too ghastly for a strong mind to dwell on, incidents too fearful for a weak one to conceive, flitted before the sleepless father. Now the professor began to do strange and secretive things. Unknown to his wife, unsuspected by his fading child, he began to cause the laboratories of the city and its environs to be searched. In the process, curious trades developed themselves to his astonished ignorance. The tricks of boys who supply the material of anguish, the trade of the janitor who sells it to the demonstrator, the trade of the brute who allures his superior, the dog, to the layers of medical students. Dark arts started to the foreground, like imps around Metastopheles concealed. From such repellent education, the professor came home and took his little girl into his arms and did not speak, but laid his cheek to hers and heard the piteous, familiar question, "'Papa, did you promise me they'd be kind to loveliness?' It was always a whispered question now, for Ada had entirely lost command of her voice, partly from weakness, partly from the old injury to the vocal organs, and this seemed, somehow, to make it the harder to answer her. So there fell a day when the child in the window, propped by more than the usual pillows, sat watching longer than usual, or more sadly, or more eagerly. Who can say what it was? Or did she look so much more translucent, more pathetic, than on another day? She leaned her cheek on one little wasted hand, her great eyes commanded the street. She had her pilot's look. Now and then, if a little dog passed, and if he were gray, she started and leaned forward, then sank back faintly. The sight of her would have touched a savage, and one beheld it. A man in a yellow jersey passed by upon the other side of the street and glanced over. His straight black brows contracted, and he looked at the child steadily. As he walked on, it might have been noticed that his brutal head hung to his breast. But he passed, and that cultivated street was clean of him. The carrier met him around the corner and glanced at him with coldness. "'What's de matter of de kid yonder in de winder?' asked the foreigner. "'Dying,' said the carrier shortly. "'Looks she had, what you call him, gallopin consumption.' observed the man with the eyebrows. Gallop and heartbreak, replied the carrier, pushing by. There's a devil laying round loose outside of the hall that stole her dog, and she a little sickly thing to start with. Him. There's fifty men in this town would lynch him inside of ten minutes if they got a clue to him. Him too. That afternoon, when the professor left the house, the newsboy ran up eagerly. "'There's a little nigger wants you, Professor, down the street. "'He's in with the dog robbers, that nigger is. "'Just you ask him when he seen Mop last time. "'Take him by the scruff of the neck and wallop like hell till he tells. "'Be sprown, I, Professor.' "'The Professor hurried down the street, "'fully prepared to obey these directions, "'and found the negro boy as he had been told. "'Come along further,' said the boy, looking around uneasily. He spoke a few words in a hoarse whisper. 
the blood leaped to the professor's wan cheeks and back again. "'I'll show ye for a V,' suggested the boy cunningly. "'But I won't take no noter hand. Make a cash, and I'll show yer. "'Ye ain't no time to be foolin,' added the gammon. "'It's sat for tomorrow, eleven o'clock. "'He's down for the biggest show of the term, he is. "'The students is all going to go, and the doctor's along of em. His own university! His own university! The professor repeated the three words as he dashed into the city with the academic cabman's fastest horse. For weeks his detectives had watched every laboratory within fifty miles. But his own college? With the density which sometimes submerges a superior intellect, it had never occurred to him that he might find his own dog in the medical school of his own institution. Stupidly, he sat gazing at the back of the gammon, who slunk beside the aversion of the driver on the box. The professor seemed to himself to be driving through the terms of a false syllogism. The cabman drew up in a filthy and savage neighborhood, in whose grim purlieus the St. George professors did not take their walks abroad. The negro boy tumbled off the box. The professor sat, trembling like a woman. The boy went into the tenement whistling. When he came out, he did not whistle. His evil little face had fallen. His arms were empty. "'The critter's dumb gone,' he said. "'Gone?' "'He's dumb goner to college. Dase took him, sir. Dumb dog to go so yarly.' The countenance of the professor blazed with the mingling fires of horror and of hope. The excited driver lashed the St. George horse to foam. To six minutes the cab drew up at the medical school. The passenger ran up the walk like a boy and dashed into the building. He had never entered it before. He was obliged to inquire his way like a rustic on a first trip to town. After some delay and difficulty he found the janitor, and with the assurance of position stated his case. But the janitor smiled. "'I will go now, at once, and remove the dog,' announced the professor. "'In which direction is it? My little girl, there is no time to lose. Which door did you say?' But now the janitor did not smile. "'Excuse me, sir,' he said frigidly. "'I have no orders to admit strangers.' He backed up against a closed door and stood there stolidly. The professor, burning with human rage, leaned over and shook the door. It was locked. "'Man of darkness!' cried the professor. "'You who perpetrate!' Then he collected himself. "'Pardon me,' he said, with his natural dignity. "'I forgot that you obey the orders of your chiefs and that you do not recognize me.' I am not accustomed to be refused admittance to the departments of my own university. I am Professor Premis of the Chair of Mental Philosophy, Professor Theophratus Premis. He felt for his cards, but he had used the last one in his wallet. You might be, and you might, replied the janitor grimly. I never heard tell of you that I know of. My orders are not to admit, and I do not admit." "'You are unlawfully detaining and torturing my dog,' gasped the professor. "'I demand my property at once.' "'We have such a lot of these cases,' answered the janitor wearily. "'We hain't got your dog. "'We don't take gentlemen's dogs nor ladies' pets, and we always etherize. "'We operate very tenderly. "'You hain't produced any evidence or authority, and I can't let you in without.' "'Be so good,' urged the professor, restraining himself by a violent effort, "'as to bear my name to some of the faculty. "'Say that I am without, and wish to see one of my colleagues on an urgent matter.' "'None of em's in just now, but the assistant demonstrator,' retorted the janitor without budging. "'He's experimenting on a—well, he's engaged in a very pretty operation just now,' and cannot be disturbed. No, sir, you had better not touch the door. I tell you, I do not admit nor permit. Stand back, sir. The professor stood back. 
he might have entered the lecture room by other doors but he did not know it and they were not visible from the spot where he stood he had happened on the laboratory door and that refused him he staggered out to his cab and sank down weakly drive me to my lawyer he cried do not lose a moment if you love her it was eleven o'clock of the following morning a dreamy june day afloat with color scent and warmth as gentle as the depths of tenderness in the human heart and as vigorous as its noblest aspirations the students of the famous medical school of the university of st george were crowding up the flagged walk and the old granite steps of the college the lecture room was filling the students chattered and joked profusely as medical students do on occasions least productive of amusement to the non-professional observer there chanced to be some sprays of lily of the valley in a tumbler set upon the window-sill of the adjoining philosophical laboratory and the flower seemed to stare at something which it saw within the room now and then through the door connecting with the lecture room a faint sound penetrated the laughter and conversation of the students a sound to hear and never to forget while remembrance rang through the brain but not to tell of the room filled the demonstrator appeared suddenly in his fresh white blouse the students began to grow quiet someone had already locked the door leading from the laboratory to the hallway the lily in the window looked and seemed in the low june wind to turn its face away gentlemen began the operator we have before us today a demonstration of unusual beauty and interest it is our intention to study here he minutely described the nature of their operation there will also be some collateral demonstrations of more than ordinary value the material has been carefully selected it is young and healthy observed the surgeon we have not put the subject under the usual anesthesia he motioned to his assistant who at the point went into the laboratory because of the importance of some preliminary experiments which were instituted yesterday and to the perfection of which consciousness is conditional gentlemen you see before you the assistant entered through the laboratory door at this moment bearing something which he held straight out before him the students on tiered and curving benches looked down from their amphitheatre lightly as they had been trained to look it is needless to say proceeded the lecturer that the subject will be mercifully disposed of as soon as the demonstration is completed and we shall operate with the greatest tenderness as we always do gentlemen i am reminded of a story the demonstrator indulged in a little persiflage at this point raising a laugh among the class he smiled himself he gestured with the scalpel which he had selected while he was talking he made three or four sinister cuts with it in the air preparatory cuts an awful rehearsal he held the instrument suspended thoughtfully the first incision he began follow me closely now you see gentlemen gentlemen really i cannot proceed in such a disturbance what is that noise with the suspended scalpel in his hand the demonstrator turned impatiently it's a row in the corridor said one of the students we hope you won't delay for that doctor it's nothing of any consequence please go ahead but the locked door of the laboratory shook violently and rattled in unseen hands voices clashed from the outside the disturbance increased open open the door heavy blows fell upon the panels in the name of humanity in the name of mercy open this door it must be some of those fanatics said the operator laying down his instrument where is the janitor call him to put a stop to this he took up the instrument with an impetuous motion then laid it irritably down again the attention of his audience was now concentrated upon the laboratory door for the confusion had redoubled at the same time feet were heard approaching the student's entrance to the lecture room one of the young men took it upon himself to lock that door also which was not the custom of the place but he found no key and two or three of his classmates joined him in standing against the door which they barricaded their blood was up they knew not why the fighting animal in them leaped at the mysterious intrusion there was every prospect of a scene unprecedented in the history of the lecture room 
the expected did not happen. It appeared that some unsuccessful effort was made to force this door, but it was not prolonged. Then the footsteps retreated down the stairs, and the demand at the laboratory entrance set in again, this time in a new voice. "'It is an officer of the court. There is a search warrant for stolen property. Open in the name of the law. Open this door in the name of the Commonwealth.' Now the door sank open, was burst open, or was unlocked. In the excitement, no one knew which or how, and the professor and the lawyer, the officer and the search warrant, fell in. The professor pushed ahead and strode to the operating table. There lie the tiny creature so daintily reared, so passionately beloved. He who had been sheltered in the heart of luxury, like the little daughter of the house herself. He who used never to know a pang that love or luxury could prevent or cure. He who had been the soul of tenderness, and had known only the soul of tenderness. There, stretched, bound, gagged, gasping, doomed to a doom which the readers of this page would forbid this pen to describe, lay the silver Yorkshire, kissing his vivisector's hand. In the past few months, loveliness had known to the uttermost the matchless misery of the lost dog, for he had been sold and restolen more than once. He had known the miseries of cold, of hunger, of neglect, of homelessness, and other torments, of which it is as well not to think, the sufferings which ignorance imposes upon animals. He was about to endure the worst torture of them all, that reserved by wisdom and power for the dumb, the undefended, and the small. The officer seized the scalpel which the demonstrator had laid aside and slashed through the straps that bound the victim down. Then the gag was removed, and the little creature, shorn, sunken, changed, almost unrecognizable, looked up into his master's face. Those cruel walls rang to such a cry of more than human anguish and ecstasy as they had never heard before, and never may again. The operator turned away, he stood in his butcher's blouse and stared through out of the laboratory window over the head of the lily, which regarded him fixedly. The students grew rapidly quiet. When the professor took loveliness into his arms and the Yorkshire, still crying like a human child that had been lost and saved, put up his weak paws around his master's neck and tried to kiss the tears that fell, unashamed, down the cheeks of that eminent man, the lecture room burst into a storm of applause, then fell suddenly still again, as if it felt embarrassed, both by its expression and by its silence, and knew not what to do. "'Has the knife touched him anywhere?' asked the professor, choking. "'No, thank God,' replied the demonstrator, turning around timidly. "'And I assure you, our regrets, such a mistake.' "'That will do, doctor,' said the professor. "'Gentlemen, let me pass, if you please. "'I have no time to lose. "'There is one waiting for this little creature who—' "'He did not finish his sentence, but went out from among them. "'As he passed with the shorn and quivering dog in his arms, "'the students rose to their feet. "'He stopped the cab a hundred feet away, "'went across a neighbor's lot, "'and got into the house by the back door.' with the Yorkshire hidden under his coat. The doctor's buggy stood at the curbstone in front. The little girl was so weak that morning, what might not have happened? The father felt, with a sudden sickness of heart, that time had hardly converged more closely with fate in the operating room than it was narrowing in his own home. The cook shrieked when she saw him come into the kitchen with the half-hidden burden in his arms, and Kathleen ran in, panting. "'Call the doctor,' he commanded hoarsely, "'and ask him what we shall do.' All the stories that he had ever read about joy that killed blazed through his brain. He dared neither advance nor retreat, but stood in the middle of the kitchen stupidly. Then he saw that the quick wit of Kathleen had got ahead of him, for she was on her knees arranging the crimson blankets in the empty basket. Between the three, they gently laid the emaciated and disfigured dog into his own bed. 
Nora cried into the milk she was warming for the little thing, and the doctor came in while Loveliness feebly drank. "'Wait a minute,' he said, turning on his heel. He went back to the room where the child lay among the white pillows, with her hand upon the empty gray satin cushion. Absently she stroked one of the red puppies whose gold eyes gazed forever at the saucer of green milk. She lay with her lashes on her cheeks. It was the first day that she had not watched the street. Her mother, sitting back at the door, was fanning her. "'Ada,' said the doctor cheerily, "'we've got something good to tell you. Your father has found—' "'There, there, my child. Yes, your father has found him. He looks a little queer and homesick. Guess he's missed you some. And you mustn't mind how he looks, for—you see, Ada, we think he has lived with— uh, with a barber, and got shaved for nothing, added the doctor stoutly. The doctor had told his share of professional fibs in his day, like the most of his race, but I hope he was forgiven all the others for this one's merciful and beautiful sake. Come, professor, he called courageously enough, but his own heart beat as hard as the father's and the mother's when the professor slowly mounted the stairs with the basket bed and the exhausted dog within it. Loveliness, cried the child. It was the first loud word that she had spoken for months. Then they lifted the dog and put him in her arms, and they turned away their faces, for the sight of that reunion was all the nerve could bear. So it was as it has been and ever will be since the beginning to the end of time. Joy, the angel of delight and danger, the most precious and the most perilous of messengers to the heart that loves, came to our two little friends and might have destroyed, but saved instead. The child was strong before the dog was, but both convalesced rapidly and sweetly enough. In a week, Ada threw away her little crutch. Her lost voice returned to stay. The pearl and the rose of her soft, invalid skin browned with the summer sun, Pearls of laughter and ecstatic barks resounded through the happy house. Little feet and little paws trotted together across the dew-touched lawn. Wonderful neck ribbons, a new color every day, tied by eager small fingers upon the silver-gray throat of the Yorkshire, flashed through the bending shrubbery in pursuit of a little glancing white figure in lawn dresses, with shade hat hanging down her back. The satin cushion with the embroidered puppies was carried out among the blushing Wygelia bushes, and the twain lived and loved and played from day start to twilight in the live midsummer air. Sometimes she was overheard conversing with the terrier, long, confidential talks with which no third person intermeddled. Dearness, daintiness, loveliness, did you have a little back sit with blankets while you were away? preciousness did they cut you meat and warm you soup for you and comfort you did they ever let you out to shiver in the wet and cold tell me dearest in the world tell me loveliness tell me all about it tell me about e barber who shaved your hair so close was he kind to you when commencement was over and the town quiet and a little dull something of a festive nature was thought good for ada and the doctor, who came only as a matter of occasional ceremony now, to see his patient running away from him, proposed a party, for he was not an imaginative man, and could only suggest the conventional. "'Something to take her mind off the dog for a little,' he said. "'We must avoid anything resembling a fixed idea.' "'Love is always a fixed idea,' replied the professor of psychology, smiling. "'But you may try, doctor.' I will ask loveliness, said the child quietly. She ran away with a Yorkshire, and they sat among the reddening Wygella bushes for some time conversing in low tones. Then they trotted back laughing and barking. Yes, Papa, we'll have a party, but it must be a loveliness party, Mama, and we've decided who to ask and all about it. If you would like to know, I'll whisper you, for it's a secret to loveliness in me until we think it over. Merrily, she whispered in her mother's bending ear a list of chosen guests. It ran on this wise. The family, the carrier, Kathleen and Nora, 
the newsboy, the cabman, the doctor, some of the neighbors' little dogs and girls, not boys, because they say sister boy and sick'em, the president's white puppy, the president, nobody else, not the barber. Here's the invitation, she added with dignity, and we'll have a picture of him printed on his puppy cushion at the top, Papa. She put into her father's hand a slip of paper, on which she had laboriously and irregularly printed in pencil the following legend. On Saturday afternoon, if not stormy, at two o'clock, loveliness at home. End of Loveliness, a story by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps.